Good morning. We are calling to order meeting number 278 of the Massachusetts Gaming Commission on Thursday, September 26, 2019, at 10 a.m. here at the Mass Mutual Center in Springfield. We'll begin with item two. Commissioner Stebbins, please, on the approval of the minutes. Sure. Good morning, Madam Chair. Uh, I'd move the approval of the minutes from the September 12, 2019 meeting is included in your packet, uh, subject to correction for any typographical errors or any other non-material matters. Do we have any um, edits or corrections? Um, I just had two. Uh, one was uh, in connection with the Regency discussion. Um, uh, there was a dis sure. There was a discussion um, in particular where I had summarized some of the other bases for the commission's decision back in 2016 the vote, the proximity to the school, that sort of things, which is not in the summary, um, which should probably go in at the top of page four. Um, and then moving on to the IEB's presentation about the switching jackpots. At the conclusion, I had specifically asked IEB to coordinate with Lottery about the 10 percenters and their approach to 10 percenters. So I think both of those I would just like added into the minutes. Okay. I have a couple of other comments myself. Um, page five, where it says the motion passed 4-1. It was actually 3-1. Mm -hmm. um, it's a typo, but it's an important one. And um, on page 11, I think the summary, uh, the Plain Ridge Park casino license renewal process, I think, captures um, that it was a summary, but um, if my fellow commissioners will not uh, object, I would point out uh, three things that were highlighted that I am also going to highlight today. Um, and that was uh, that we studied other jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. um, then um, we, um, we have uh, come with a presumption of relicensing, uh, that we're not doing any kind of um, de novo uh, solicitation. Uh, but that it's also, finally, uh, uh, an opportunity to review all the commitments that they have made um, as part of this um, relicensing. Any other edits or suggested changes? They're very comprehensive, so thank you to uh, Shara and our legal department. Do we have a second with those amend amendments? I second that. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. Who was not present? Uh, may the record reflect that Commissioner Cameron was not present, so it would be 4 0 with one abstention. Thank you. Moving on to our item number three, our administrative update. Ed? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Commissioners, um, so on item A, I actually don't have that much. Last uh, week, I, uh, last meeting, I'm sorry, two weeks ago, I told you about some open positions. Um, we are working to fill those and do background checks, so hiring is going along at the appropriate tempo. Um, I do, on item B, have some rather large shoes to fill. Mr. Curtis couldn't make it out here today, so I will be substituting for him. Um, on an amendment to MGM's gaming beverage license, um, and here with me to answer any questions you might have after I give a brief rundown are Seth Stratton, Vice President and Legal Counsel, and Anthony Caratazzolo, Vice President of Hospitality. Um, so, uh, and uh, Chair, I think you and I actually saw the proposed area last week when we were out here in Springfield. Uh, commissioners, you may know um, that uh, MGM has decided to use the former Starbucks space as a VIP lounge. And as part of that, they are asking today to have permission to um, serve alcohol beverages to their VIP customers. Um, as I understand it, they're not going to have a separate bar in that location. It will actually be bar service from a service bar that goes into that location. But it's closed off, and there'll be separate beverage service there. So that's the reason for the amendment to the gaming beverage license, identifying the VIP lounge as a separate service area, which seems appropriate to me. Because if 
if there were issues there, we then could take action on that portion of the license. And again, I'm not anticipating that, but I think that is part of the rationale. Um, so I don't know, Seth or Anthony, if there's anything you want to add to that. I think you fairly summarized it. Um, Ed, but uh, Anthony and I are happy to answer any questions. I, I just have one uh, out of curiosity. Um, is it, uh, um, would, would, would the area be restricted to only certain number of people? Um, do you have to present some kind of um, card or, or status rewards card to be able to get in that, Correct. that the, area? The, the door will be locked at all times, 24 hours a day. You, it's restricted access only to our high-end guests who will be issued a separate RFID card um, into the space. So okay. it, it's highly restricted. And um, are minors uh, allowed in that area if somebody comes with their family? No, they're uh, not. Just, okay. Thank you. And so the drinks will be brought in by uh, your uh, cocktail staff? Uh, Correct. We'll, staff. we'll have three VIP attendants that will be servicing the food and also servicing the alcohol service. During the week when there's when it's not attended, um, a cocktail server from the lobby bar will be serving the beverages. And the, out, the hours will be restricted to, they won't be serviced between two and four, correct? That is correct. And, and those VIP attendants who will be serving the alcohol will be licensed at the appropriate level and sufficiently trained. Uh, we, haven't, we haven't hired those folks or assigned them yet, correct? But if correct. they're not already, um, trained and licensed at the appropriate level, then we would ensure that they are um, from a TIPS and a, and a gaming license standpoint. So and this is something we would need a vote on. And this is a, um, a need that's been requested by your patrons, correct? That, that is correct. The, the, our, our, we did some surveys right in the beginning, and this came up quite a bit because our competitors in Connecticut offer these services. These services. So. Any further questions? You do need to vote on this. I do, please. Um, any further questions for Anthony or Seth? <coughs> Great. <clears throat> do I have a motion? Uh, Madam Chair, I move the commission approve the amendment to the gaming beverage license issued to Blue Tarp RE Development LLC, DBA, MGM, Springfield, as described in the memorandum from Bill Curtis, our licensing manager, dated September 30, oops, sorry, September 23rd, 2019, and the amended gaming beverage license application, both included in the September 26, 2019 commission packet. I second that. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 5-0. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioners. That's Thank all you. I have. Thank I will you. now be taking a Thank slightly you. back seat so Mr. Ziemba can take over. Great. Thank you, Executive Director. Um, item number four, Ombudsman Ziemba. And we're looking forward to the MGM's quarterly report. Thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioners. I'm joined here by Joe Delaney, Construction Project Oversight Manager. Uh, we have a number of items on today's agenda. First, MGM Springfield is here to present its quarterly report for the second quarter of this year, ending on June 30th. MGM Springfield will also provide the commission with the review of the one-year anniversary of its opening. Following MGM Springfield's presentation, we'll hear a brief status update of Springfield's economic development activities and successes from Tim Sheehan, Springfield's chief development officer. And then later on today, we will begin the commission's preparations for next year's community mitigation fund. Uh, now I turn back to MGM Springfield's quarterly report. Uh, in addition to a discussion of MGM Springfield's second quarter activities and upcoming plans, we have asked MGM Springfield to give the commission as much detail as it can regarding the status of its residential requirement. As you're aware, the commission has regularly reviewed the status of this commitment to provide 54 units of market rate housing within one half mile of the casino at its commission meetings. Earlier this year, the commission authorized an extension to comply with this residential requirement, 
provided that MGM Springfield shall continue to inform the Commission of any material event that would significantly alter the potential of MGM Springfield proceeding with the City's plan to rehabilitate 31 Elm Street in Springfield with the assistance provided by MGM Springfield. Further, the Commission required that staff shall remain in regular contact with MGM Springfield and the City of Springfield to monitor the progress of the 31 Elm Street project, its documentation and its schedule, and report back to the Commission at an appropriate time. I can report that staff has continued to monitor the progress of this project and that MGM has not reported any material event that would significantly impact its commitment to moving forward. With that, let me turn it over to Mike Mathis, CEO and President of MGM Springfield, to introduce his team and to begin the presentation. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome morning. to Springfield. Thank you, John. Uh, very excited to report uh, our Q2, which um, also um, involves some updates around our, uh, our anniversary, which is obviously a Q3 event. but. Difficult to be here today and not talk about some of the exciting things that happened uh, on our one-year mark. So um, I'll introduce the team as each of them comes up to present their, their individual parts. Um, first, I'm going to start with a, uh, a video that we, uh, we showed at our uh, one-year anniversary out in the plaza. It gives you a, a, a sense of some of the things that um, some of the images and events that happened throughout the first year. I think this has audio, right? I was on the ground when, uh, when it was just a, a, a back of an envelope and a, and a pencil scratch. So pretty amazing to see it come to life like this. You know, we had the audacity to, to think that we could take 14 and a half acres that was um, part of a blighted three blocks, damaged by the tornado, a bunch, a bunch of dilapidated buildings. And you know, we had the vision that this could be a, a destination resort. This is a city that leads the way in economic revitalization creating a model for others to follow, and we want to be a part of that. And as we have been a part of this history and the milestones that we've admired, we wanted to create a few new traditions for Springfield. wanted to offer a few words of congratulations to the MGM team and Team Springfield. I cannot believe a whole year has gone by. Four seasons of uh, great uh, offerings, uh, not only to the people of Springfield and this Commonwealth, but to so many that have come to really appreciate and see all the great opportunities at MGM Springfield. How you doing everybody? Ken Casey here, Murphy's Boxing, Dropkick Murphy's. I want to wish MGM Springfield a happy one year anniversary. Thanks for being so good to us. We'll be back September 20th. Dropkick Murphy's playing across the street at the Mass Mutual, downtown Springfield. We love you guys. We'll see you soon. 
Happy anniversary. Hey, I'm Jam Springfield. Aaron Lewis here. Congratulations on a first successful year and happy birthday. Happy anniversary, MGM Springfield. I played you. This is Sean. We're the boys from Men. Happy anniversary, MGM Springfield. We'll see all of you September 22nd. What's up, y'all? It's Low Cash here, and we are live at MGM Live. MGM Springfield, it's their one year anniversary. Congratulations. We've had a blast here all day. We started drinking early because it's your one year anniversary. Hey, Come on. Feeling strong. <laughs> this is amazing. Thank you, MGM Springfield, for such a great year. We're glad to be a part of it, and happy birthday. Hey, cheers. Come on. Cheers. To you. As you can see, we had a lot of fun with that, but we had a, a number of entertainers come through and as part of our wonderful um, campaign to celebrate uh, our first year. So um, kudos to the team for, for all that activation. Okay, great. So just a, a, few, a few highlights. Um, obviously, entertainment is a large part of our commitment to the city, and this is just a sample of um, both headliners as well as our Roar Comedy Show. It was our way to activate uh, the Armory Building, and then um, boxing. And we've partnered with Ken Casey and, and Murphy Boxing. He's, uh, he's been a great partner and is really part of bridging that gap between Western Mass and Eastern Mass, bringing, um, bringing a partner like that um, out from Boston. And we're going to do, continue to do more boxing, some of which highlights local talent, by the way. We've got a, we've got a great couple of boxers that are local talents, undefeated, that have joined the Murphy Boxing uh, promotional group. Mike, where, is, uh, where do you normally take uh, the, the boxing takes place? Yeah, I think uh, at this point we've done it uh, in two different locations, uh, one up in our ballroom, which seats about a thousand or so folks, and then uh, we then the second time we took it down to our plaza and did outdoor boxing, which um, for anybody that remembers the, the Atlantic City days or, or Las Vegas days, they used to do in this in the Caesars outdoor um, you know plaza, and, and really a special experience having outdoor boxing. So uh, very exciting. We're going to renew with him and, and do it again in 2020. Uh, again, this is uh, the images are from our outdoor plaza, and uh, really a, an important part of our activation, bringing the uh, community into our outdoor space and celebrating that beautiful backdrop that is the armory. So we're we're actually in in um, in pre planning to uh, start installing the uh, skating rink. So talk about the four seasons; it's quickly upon us. But I'm looking forward to that outdoor program as well. And we just conclude our MGM Live series, which is a series of outdoor concerts. Again, we're going to renew that for next year as well. It was extremely popular. Uh, you know, this is uh, the next image is just some of our other activations around the property and, and frankly, some of the new things. Um, we run a campaign called um, You Said It, We Did It. And as part of us telling our customers that we're hearing their feedback and that we're m uh, modifying our program to address their feedback, one of the things that uh, our customers wanted, for example, was more uh, breakfast options on the weekends, particularly. So we turned on our Calmari brunch, which has been incredibly popular and is something that we're going to continue to do. Uh, we, it, people wanted more, um, more bar space for video poker. We built the casino bar in the Mass Mutual corner. It's great space. We actually opened it for the, uh, for the first uh, Aerosmith show. And what it did for us is really take what felt like the back of the property and activate it and turn it into yet another front door for us. So uh, a lot of activation back there, and it's, and it's really um, proven to be very popular. Uh, we, we sold one of our $26,000 Indian sidecar cocktails. Uh, you can either think of it as an expensive cocktail that comes with a motorcycle. Uh, I think our ultimate customer thought of it as a motorcycle that came with a cocktail. But uh, that was in our Commonwealth, and one of our really great customers, we shipped it down to him, and um, he really he's an avid um, Indian motorcycle rider. So it was a lot of fun to be able to say we sold one of those. And then Food Truck Friday has been incredibly popular. Uh, we just concluded our last one of those, but... Uh, uh, it involves two or three of our own trucks, and then we invite trucks from the community. So a great way to celebrate. You know, we're hoping it turns into Ditch Fridays, and people end up staying there and, and really enjoying um, the outdoor space on a, on a lazy summer Friday. Uh, 
you know, this next image is about some of our activation in, in Boston. Um, really, you know, part of being part of the MGM Resorts family is having the ability to take on a huge partner like the Boston Red Sox. We are now uh, on the Green Monster, that iconic spot. It um, obviously provides us national exposure, not just um, exposure in Springfield. And what's really great about that activation is that not only are we able to bring customers out to um, our luxury suite, that are from Massachusetts to celebrate, but also encourages cross-marketing. So anytime we have a, uh, a, a visitor team that is based in one of our uh, sister properties, we're able to bring those great customers out here. They spend time in Springfield, and then we bring them to the game. So really importing play uh, and bringing new customers from outside the market is, is a big part of what we're trying to uh, continue to do, and that's what that partnership allows. Uh, the other piece of that partnership is we are uh, reclaiming uh, the Red Sox uh, off-season fan fest. Third week of January, it was with one of our competitors. They now have brought it to Springfield. Uh, 6,800, 7,000 rabid um, Red Sox fans are going to descend on downtown Springfield, and we can't wait to welcome them. And it's, it's more people than, than we can house in our own resort, so they're going to spill out into the downtown, into other venues, and i um, very excited to host them and see the impact that they'll have uh, on the city. And then to really have people see downtown Springfield that haven't been here um, ever or haven't been been here in a while. It's really a great opportunity. Uh, a couple other things that we've tried, uh, the image to the top right is uh, our stadium gaming. It's really the next evolution of gaming, and um, it really has been incredibly successful. Uh, we're not the first to do it in the industry, but we're certainly one of the first in this, in this, um, in this region. And one of the aspects of it, and you're in the, uh, your gaming commission staff is, have been great, because this is, is new technology, and made sure that it met all the um, strict standards of the regulations. But essentially what it is, is it's um, dealer assisted electronic gaming. You have live gaming up front, and you can think of it as a 24 seat a roulette table or a 24 seat um, blackjack table. The action is, is projected up on the screens, but individually you can make your bets on 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 the on the individual uh, kiosk. So what is what is very good for are people that are new to the to new to gaming and are a little intimidated by a live gaming environment. Um, they don't know how to do the bets necessarily. The computer will um, give you the automatic bets for you. Do the payouts. You're able to play multiple games. Um, it's been really well received. And one of the things we're able to do because the labor obviously is more efficient is we're able to give lower table limits um, at different periods of the day and that's something our customers have been asking for is lower table limits so that they some of the entry level players can can have time on the on the device does does the device I, what i like about the idea is that if i come with my wife or spouse or friends or whatever and not everybody wants to play blackjack. They can sit next to me while I'm playing blackjack and they play roulette or baccarat or anything else. So you're not moving back and forth between tables. I mean, is that part of the strategy? Yeah, that's exactly right. We, uh, you have the opportunity to play blackjack, baccarat, and roulette. On, the, on a single kiosk, and to your point, you could be playing next to somebody, whether it's part of your group or, or, or a stranger, playing two different games, all based on the live action that's up uh, up front. So, uh, we plan to expand that expand that product. It's been extremely popular. And then, uh, you know, our, our line run bus service has uh, been growing, has been very successful, and is something that we'll continue to uh, to operate. These are just a few images from our. our uh, our uh, grand opening celebration, we had the Patriots cheerleaders out, um, a giant cake, of course. Um, Commissioner Zuniga was with us. Uh, it was a really great day. And um, one of the images I really like is to the bottom right. Um, that gentleman's name between myself and Jim Murray, his name is Mike Davis. He's a um, table games floor supervisor. We were running a promotion the entire year for any of our employees that had perfect attendance were entered into a raffle to win a car. And Mike was the lucky winner. I think we had over Mary Kay 200 uh, individuals that were eligible, which is pretty remarkable um, uh, given the, the tough hours that a lot of these folks work. The best is we invited, um, we wanted it to be a surprise for Mike. He had just worked a um, Friday night into Saturday morning, 4 a.m. shift. Um, we told him that we needed him for volunteer service. <laughs> and to his credit, you know, it would have been awkward if he would have told us to pound sand. Um, but to his credit, he came out and um, was there to help, you know, uh, support the support the event, and then we called him up to the stage and um, and gave him a, a beautiful Hyundai car. So, really great, deserving um, member of the team. But so many of our folks are that 
or that quality. Can I tell one quick story about yeah. that uh, program? As part of the program, um, Mike invited me to announce the name of the of the um, employee that was a winner. He was going to whisper his name <laughs> in my ear, and I would announce it. I didn't know the name of the of the person. Uh, and when he said Mike Davis, for a minute I thought, for a second I thought you meant Mike Mathis. And I said, that couldn't be right. <laughs> I have had perfect attendance. Mike Davis. I, will, I was eligible. I, I knew you yeah. would be a uh, perfect record. attendant. Uh, right. <laughs> going to be young. No, that's great. Did you give uh, him a day off too? Uh, we did actually. We sent him home. <laughs> Good. Actually, we sent him home. They announced this. Uh, they also pay the taxes on the that's right. on that's the right. car. Yeah, we grossed uh, it up. So that he does wow. not have to pay those taxes. So yeah. It was really a well. Well done. And, he, and he's a downtown Springfield resident, which wow. made, it, made it all the better. Yeah. So, uh, Just some more images from, from the anniversary and, and just a lot of fun engagement. And uh, a lot of the community came out to celebrate with us, which was really, um, really quite touching. Uh, uh, this is uh, some, some images from the uh, Aerosmith uh, uh, concert. We had four shows uh, in downtown Springfield, all sold out. So, you know, over 20,000 folks came down downtown. Many of them hadn't been here for quite some time. I think Aerosmith hadn't played downtown Springfield for 30 years. Um, I got a chance to meet the band and meet Steve Tyler, and so gracious, so excited. And he talked about all the, all the things that we were doing downtown. Um, at 71, 72 years old, incredibly vibrant, was running around the stage. Um, if you look closely, you might see me in the pit there. I'm not sure what night they took that photo, but he was circling around us, buzzing around, and just a ton of energy, and it was exciting to have him here. And, and many, of the, many of the fans that saw that show said it was as good as any show that they had ever seen of his, of theirs. So... Uh, very exciting. Uh, with that, I'm going to uh, cross over into any questions about in, any of the material I just presented. No. On the show, was it sold out? How did you do on numbers? Uh, did it drive a lot of business to you? How, how would you rate the, in, the impact of Aerosmith? Sure, I'm, I'm glad you paused me because um, I did want to give one special um, statistic from the uh, from the weekend. But um, the show is incredibly successful. Um, you know what we look at with with entertainment is a number of metrics. Um, certainly, gaming revenue, um, but we look at overall lift to the resort. We look at our hotel occupancy. Uh, we look at our food and beverage revenue. Uh, we also look at our unrated play, which is you know um, the play that comes in from the uh, you know the the infrequent gaming customer that's there just to enjoy something that's non gaming. And by all measures, those statistics were through the roof. Um, and I'm, again, I'm glad you, you, you paused me, Chairwoman, because one of the special um, one of the one of the special results from that weekend is Saturday night, August 24th, uh, 2019, in the Mass Mutual Center was a record night at the Mass Mutual Center. They did for the first time over a million dollars of ticketed revenue. Um, I think the average ticket was $191. So set a record. We look back at the at the history of that venue, and of the top five. Um, arena events in the history of Mass Mutual Center. Um, four of them were, were Aerosmith and one of them was um, the Share Show. So we literally broke every record in the book based on the entertainment we brought downtown. So um, very proud of it. We want to build on that, but it's, it, it proved to be very successful and we're in the early stages of figuring out in 2020 how to repeat a lot of that success. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, on the Gaming revenue side, uh, this is a snapshot of the quarter. As you can see, we're, um, we're hovering right around um, the 20 million mark, uh, low 20 million mark uh, on monthly gaming revenue, and of course the gaming taxes that produces. Uh, we certainly believe there's upside to those numbers, and we're excited to, um, to continue to grow. We have uh, thousands of new customers that join our database every day. We're now activating a lot of our sister property, uh, including Yonkers, for example, and some of that um, activation is, is starting to catch hold, and we're bringing those customers uh, up to Massachusetts. 
as well, as well as our other properties. I mentioned the Red Sox is just a small example of where we're able to bring customers from Detroit and from New York. Uh, the Patriots, for example, we just had a lot of our great New York customers come in for the Jets games. So we continue to uh, cross market. We, uh, we believe some of the changes that I just showed you on the floor are going to provide um, great lift, and it's already proven to provide great lift. And um, although it's more of a Q3 story, um, the numbers are, are public each month that, you, uh, that we publish them is with uh, a very formidable competitor in the market, and that's Encore. And I went and visited their site and um, didn't want to like it, but loved everything they did. And um, <laughs> you should be very proud to have yet another great licensee in the market. But notwithstanding that wonderful facility, we're still holding our own here in Springfield, um, equal to or not greater month over month since they've been in the market. And I think, you know, despite the saturation sort of concerns, it does show that um, there is a unique customer for MGM, for Western Mass, there's a there's a great customer out in Eastern Mass, and that uh, facilities like MGM, facilities like Encore can really grow the market. So um, they're a formal competitor, and we're looking to continue to grow our business, notwithstanding having them in the market. And most importantly to me, we have many wonderful uh, Boston customers, and as we suspected, some of them were going to uh, spend some of their uh, some of their gaming spend in Boston. But uh, they've come out to see us again. They've gone to see that facility, and they remain loyal to to us. So uh, we can share customers, we can grow new customers, and um, I'm very optimistic about the future of of the gaming market in the Commonwealth and and here in, in Springfield as well. Uh, this is a little snapshot of our lottery uh, business, and uh, obviously um, it's showing some nice growth. April and May hovered around the 100,000 mark. June saw a significant bump. Um, I, I uh, wish I could tell you I know why it jumped that much. Um, one of the things we are doing is we're pushing more and more lottery tickets as part of our promotional um, gift giving to our customers. And I do think, in addition to our own sales, that that's causing a little bit more activity on the kiosks themselves. So a lottery continues to be a very popular product, and uh, it, sp it speaks to the quality of the lottery program, um, and we're, we're leveraging it more and more in our, our own promotional activities. <laughs> And we'll do we'll do more of it. Uh, this is a view of a, a few of the highlights of our jackpots. Uh, we had some great jackpot winners, and um, it, it was what's great about a lot of these customers is it spans uh, locals as well as um, folks from um, out of out of town, and it spans you know some of our uh, our top customers we call our noir customers as well as our entry level customers. So it's it's really um, it's, it's a really robust jackpot program, and and we continue to to improve upon that and make sure that we're telling the story that there, there's a lot of great winners that are coming to the property. Uh, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to uh, our, our newest team member, uh, Daniel Miller. He was uh, in charge of our risk management program. He is now our director of compliance, and we're lucky to have him, and he's going to review our uh, compliance numbers. If I could just interrupt on back on the lottery. Sure. I, I mean, that's a very important slide, uh, Mike. You know, we have a, a commitment by statute to make sure that the lottery is is not in any way cannibalized. And so, to your credit, you've really shown great growth. And I'm, I'm imagining that when the you know my my uh, former colleague Mike Sweeney makes his reports to the lottery commission, that he's reporting that you've, he's got a great partner in you, um, as with the other our, our other licensees. So we're really pleased with that. If you figure out the magic, well, I'm sure you'll make sure to uh, report it to us. But absolutely, I'll I'll, d I'll dig into the numbers. I was pleasantly surprised to see how much <laughs> right. it jumped. And you know, they've gone over a billion, and it's not lost on me that the revenues that are coming from the casino have helped make that jump. Absolutely. Oh, and it goes to local aid, of course, so thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. And, and I, we've got a great relationship with Executive yes. Director Sweeney. He's been a great partner um, himself from, I think, Lawrence. Yeah. And he talked about some of the similarities of some of the ops, you know, challenges that Springfield has, and very excited to continue to work with him and his team. Yeah. Thank you. And with that, I'll hand it off to Daniel. Good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Uh, Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Working? Yep. Okay. Um, as he said, I'm Daniel Miller. I was the risk manager for MGM Springfield, now the compliance director, and, and I have uh, a career with MGM overall. As of Sunday, I'll have been with the company for five years. Uh, I was with risk management 
back in Las Vegas. Um, although my introduction to you is going to be with a subject that I know is sometimes relatively taboo, underage uh, people on the floor, I think the numbers actually in, in the table do represent good things for us, that uh, our company is very diligent and continue on our, our uh, project to prevent this from happening. Um, so the, the, if we go from left to right, uh, the miners intercepted on the gaming area itself as a whole. Uh, you can see those numbers increase as you go down, but again, it is testament to the fact that we're, we're finding them very quickly, we're getting them off the floor very quickly, um, and those kind of tie in with the idea that April, then May and June is when school's out, college is out, so an actual visitation itself is up as well. Um, so although the numbers themselves are ri originally 158, 179 seem high, the percentage against um, the actual visitation is, is very, very low. Moving over uh, to, to minors interceptic gaming, um, that includes both tables and slots, um, and predominantly it's slots um, uh, because of being able to sort of get between them before being intercepted potentially. Um, but again, those numbers, when you look at the actual percentages, 0 0.002. Um, I, I think Mike in the last one said that we're aiming towards zero and we're getting very, very close uh, with those numbers. Um, and then finally with the idea of the consumption of the alcohol, same again, um, to have three decimal points after and then find a number means we're, we're really tying this down and getting as close as we can to, uh, to, to zero. So can I ask you, in terms of the, the stat for June? Yes. The gaming revenue was down in June, but that stat goes up. Do you have an understanding as to whether it went up because people didn't understand it's 21 versus 18, or was it something else that was driving that number to go up in June? I don't know if it's directly related to that particular question, whether it was 18 or, or 21. Um, and I personally can't answer that question. Um, but I think visitation as a whole, we had just under half a million people in June. So e even though the gaming revenue itself went down, the number of people on property for other reasons, entertainment, food, uh, et cetera, yeah. mm -hmm. um, was up. So still present, pre preventing them from getting on the floor itself. Yeah, and I'll just add to that. I think sometimes the gaming revenue numbers can be a bit misleading because, uh, for example, we've had a little bit of a, a hold um, issue over the over the summer. So just because the revenue um, may, be, may be off month over month doesn't mean that the volume's been off. So uh, some of that's just been bad luck in terms of our hold against some of our bigger customers. But um, to Daniel's point, I think one of the things you'll see in the summer is as it gets warmer, we start to get more fans families, outdoor activation, a lot of our concerts, et cetera. Um, so some of that is, um, is I think, just more family programming. You might recall, uh, and hopefully we get ahead of it, but right around the Christmas time we had a spike, and that's because of all the we were victims of all the family programming we did. And most of these stats are about people entering the floor, not necessarily gaming. So mm -hmm. just intercepting them, it's just we're just more conscious that there's younger people on the floor. Um, and one of the things I want to point out too is is the improvement. I, you know, we picked this image of our new kiosk. Um, you, you can see if it, it screams security, it screams 21 plus. And what we're trying to do is create more and more of a virtual checkpoint. Um, your your team has been incredibly uh, patient and understanding that uh, we've got this great design, um, and that what comes with it is is making sure that we we're able to tell customers that you know there is a hard border here. And I think uh, th that type of enhanced uh, kiosk that we've done at the three corners of our property, you know, goes a long way to do that. Um, so we will continue to stay on top of these numbers, but um, I'm looking at our, our, some of our guest comments and, and from the underage folks, if you're, like, as I mentioned, if you're a baby faced 40 year old, you are going to get, you know, harassed on our floor and um, their understanding about it. But it's, I can see from the comments that our team is super focused on it because I'm, I'm getting that feedback from our customers. When did you activate the, the revised podium, out of curiosity. I think it was in the last um, month, it was about the last 30 days. Okay. It, it had been in production over the last uh, two months before that. Um, we've also installed a Veridox system, which allows us to check. Um, you know, we're seeing more and more incidents of fake IDs. Um, so it allows us to, to verify through the machine anything that we, we question, whether the person's of age or if it's an out-of-state license that we're less familiar with, we're able to run it through the machine. So it, it's a, it's, it remains a major focus of ours, and my personal commitment and that of the team is we meet weekly to go over the reports. We just had ours, right, Daniel? Correct, yes. Um, so that we're all making sure that we're, we're focused on it. And one of the things we're, we're most proud of is um, 
you know, uh, s- since our last table game incident, which we have zero tolerance for, because there you have an employee that uh, should be um, interceding. Um, we've we've run three three plus months without any table game incidents. So the the incidents you see here, or you're going to see at least in the in the third quarter, are going to be slot machine incidents. And for us, it's all about the amount of time that we get to that customer because someone can sneak on the floor and get on a machine. It's our obligation to make sure we 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 get to them um, as quickly as we can. And those stats are really remarkable how quickly we're getting to these folks. But uh, to be served alcohol. Someone missed an ID check, right? Someone should have ID'd that individual, or did someone of age buy the alcohol for the minor? It's hard to tell. Yeah, as you can see, they're they're really de minimis numbers. Right. A, a single incident is one too many, but it's it's a combination of potentially someone missed an ID, someone. Um, Someone on a shift change, sometimes we see, may have uh, thought the person was overage and then uh, subsequently um, the next shift served them because they already had a drink and you know, it was one of those. Um, occasionally you get, a, you get a stamp for someone, you know, our, our officers, um, we've had a couple of instances where an officer read an ID and just, you know, saw the, saw the, the fact that it was, a, it was a 2000 or 1998 Right, which gives you the 21, and just missed the date that they had just were under their birthday. So, you know, with as many customers as we put through, there there is a little bit of you know human error involved, and we try to balance that with, given how much of a priority this is. But I, I'd submit that the the one, two, and three incidents are are, are fairly de minimis considering the volume of people we're putting through, but think, still serious. I think you were touching on this, and I know it's unfair because this is here. This is not covering this time period, but I suspect you're pretty informed on these stats. When we do get our the next quarterly report, are you trending in the right direction still, or is it continuing to be a, a, cha- a challenge? Will we see numbers going in the right direction or in a different direction? And yeah, do you remember what, where we're at, Daniel? I don't know exact numbers for this quarter, but yes, we are trending in the right direction. Um, and the little point that you made as well, there's been a little bit of surge of, of some very good fake IDs that to the degree um, e- even fooled uh, the state troopers before it ran through a Veridoc system. So the IDs mm. themselves, um, just specific situations on their own. So those are ones on their own that happened. Um, and so now, having the Veridoc system that will hopefully tie that down as well. Um, so it's an improved uh, ID verification system? Yes, than it was before. Okay. Previously, it was the human that just looking at it, making sure that it looked good and All that right. the dates were correct. Um, now we will you know, run it to see, does the system prove it is correct and, and a, an official document? So. I asked only because the summer months probably are a bigger challenge for this than than uh, the school year, so thank you. Yeah, and I think when you look at this, it's always a combination of, you know, intercepts may be up, but where are the incidents of actual um, gaming or, or, and so I think uh, I think you always have to be, you know, it's one of those stats where the, the more enforcement there is, it may look like there's more of a problem, but really as a result of just more enforcement. And then to your point, the summer months are gonna con- continue to create more visitation from that underage customer. But we'll 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 stay transparent with your team and continue to update you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Daniel. You, you'll notice one of the great things about Daniel, in addition to his competence and expertise, is his English accent has a very calming effect on uh, on your staff, and uh, something we we continue to leverage in our discussions with them. Good Thank strategic. You, <laughs> good strategic hire there. That's Mike. right. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we're going to move on to our spend update uh, with Ryan Gary, our Director of Finance Operations. Ryan's been with us throughout the entire project, helped us with our early procurement plan, and it's great that he's been um, elevated to head of finance and continues to monitor our, our spend efforts. Thanks, Mike. Good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Good morning. Good to see you again. So um, today I'm going to go over a, an overview of our diversity spend as I normally do. Um, as you are all aware, MGM has continued uh, to commit to a robust uh, supplier diversity program. Um, we commit to prioritizing uh, you know, local and diverse uh, spend for anything, any goods and services that we need to procure. Um, so this slide represents um, 
that performance over Q2. A couple things to note uh, before you look at the numbers. Uh, overall biddable spend for Q2 is slightly down. Um, but that being said, um, you know, one of the highlights we have is, a, is an uptick in, in women-owned spend. Um, we still do have a lot of work to do in minority-owned businesses. Uh, we, we continue to support and sponsor the uh, GNE MSDC. Um, we actually just hosted their annual expo at the property uh, this month. And um, you know, working with Jill's team um, and with our local certification partners, we are continuing to uh, really try and identify uh, more minority-owned businesses. Um, and uh, although you know, we have a lot of work to do, uh, we are really proud with, of the work we've done thus far. Um, and especially in the veteran-owned category, we continue to exceed. Um, we do, um, we do want to continue to expand the number of businesses, veteran-owned businesses we have. Um, but that being said, we are still able to exceed that goal uh, quarter over quarter. Um, <clears throat> another, I think, note, I, I believe I mentioned this last time, we're still working on it, but um, we do have some significant spend that is currently not counted as diverse spend, but we are spending with diverse suppliers. They're just not certified yet. So uh, we have about 150K this quarter in uh, woman-owned business spend that uh, we are working directly with the supplier on getting that certification done. So that would account for another full percentage point had we uh, been able to count that uh, this quarter. Um, so that business is actually connected directly to our corporate supplier diversity team to try and get that done. We're supporting them in any way we can. Uh, we've even offered to you know, help them um, with, the, with the fee uh, to get it done. Um, addition, additionally to that, uh, for minority-owned businesses, we have a minority-owned business that we are currently doing business with. Um, for Q2, we spent about 150000 uh, as well with them. That would account for um, about two percentage points. So we'll be working with that supplier as well. So as we, as we pull these numbers and we continue to analyze the non-diverse spend, um, that's really what, where we're trying to target. Uh, obviously, we want to convert spend that is non-diverse, um, but also identify suppliers that are diverse that just haven't gone through the certification process. Um, so that's a continued effort, and um, I am, I'm hoping to be able to count that spend moving forward. Um, as, a, as a resort, I'll just add one more thing, or as a company, excuse me. Um, we, are, we are committed to a comprehensive supplier diversity program. You know, our MGM Resorts International considers that a business imperative um, because there's a lot of you know, measurable benefits, not only for our company, but for our suppliers um, in doing so. Um, so for today's presentation, um, and because of uh, the work that I think we've done that in minority-owned businesses uh, specifically, um, I'd like to let you guys hear firsthand from one of our minority-owned businesses. Um, with me today is Tiffany Cutting. Uh, with She's a VP of Business Development with CND Electronics. Um, she's going to speak a little bit about uh, her, her journey and, uh, with us. Um, she began with us during the uh, construction phase, and has continued uh, to, uh, that, that relationship has continued to evolve uh, through operations. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Tiffany. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Commissioner, Chair, and Commissioners. Good Thank morning. you for having me here today, um, and to Mike and Ryan. Uh, so, CND Electronics, uh, we are located in Holyoke, so we're just about not five, seven miles um, down the road. And MGM has really been an integral part of growing our local business. Um, our core business had been in aerospace and defense for over 20 years. And we work with a lot of um, defense contractors supporting electrical products and materials to them. But it wasn't necessarily um, making local impact. We were working um, across the country and worldwide. Um, but MGM coming to town gave us the opportunity um, to invest more locally, to work locally, to um, actually bring in a few more employees to our team um, by supporting them from not only the construction phase, but now on the operational side. So C&D Electronics now supports um, uh, MGM Springfield uh, with a Granger partnership. So Granger has a uh, 
a distributor alliance partnership program. And MGM and Granger worked together and vetted out small businesses in the local area that had um, a background or experience in distribution. And so although um, MRO type supplies weren't something that we had done before working with aerospace and defense and the most stringent certifications you could ever imagine getting um, along with the, the game non-gaming vendor certifications um, we were vetted and competed for business and that was all thanks to MGM Springfield like Ryan was saying helping in any way they can to support the local community knowing that c and Electronics was a distributor and had these core competencies but how can they help us create more jobs how can they help us grow our business and so in turn not only are we have we grown to support MGM Springfield but we are doing business with Encore as well um, we have expanded the Granger relationship into our aerospace and defense side supplying those so it's been a really um, wonderful experience working with MGM and uh, out of the majority of the large businesses we work with I have never um, seen a higher commitment to their outreach for supplier diversity and their commitment and their cross-checking, um, their notarized statements, everything, you know, I, I work in it every single day and the way that they expect you to measure and the way that they measure, it's, it's really um, kudos t to them because you don't, you, you see more of a smoke and mirror show a lot of the time with people's commitment, but they are super committed. Their supplier diversity um, support from Vegas was just here. Obviously they said we're members of the GNEM SDC. We have been for as long as it's existed. And um, you know, she came and she spoke and they're really just super engaged and super excited about helping the community every day. So, and I see it every day because we're right here. Um, can I ask you a question? I, I, uh, Absolutely. I'd, I'd love to um, just make sure I understand. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, in the in the case that you described uh, from Granger, yep. the Distributor Alliance Partnership Program, sure. uh, were you not a distributor of Granger before? Correct. And as part of all this um, outreach and help from MGM, you now distribute Granger Granger parts. Not just to MGM, but also others. That is Did correct. Did I get that all, all right? Yeah. So that that was that was orchestrated um, with the help of of MGM. We would not be a Distributor Alliance partner had they not helped support us um, through that process. Mm -hmm. And there's Mike. I take it there's other opportunities that you look at in under this kind of uh, program for other um, commodities that you might be purchasing to look at. Um, uh, companies that may have the same kind of program to go through uh, vendors like uh, Miss Cutting. Uh, correct. Yeah. Any anytime we can we can find uh, a national relationship that can be serviced locally, uh, we want to make those connections. Um, it really it helps with capacity building, and as Tiffany mentioned, there's a variety of other ancillary opportunities that uh, the business would you know ha have the opportunity to expand into. Yeah, no, there's really a real ripple effect that goes the other way to, I guess, other customers right. um, that you also have. That's a great picture. I didn't see. <laughs> <laughs> um, and actually, also to note, I, I should have mentioned, is that now I was down in Maryland at MGM National Harbor Monday and Tuesday because as of June 1st, c and Electronics now helps support a portion of, of that business as well. So it's not just the success of other businesses in aerospace and defense or you know competitors to MGM, but also within MGM um, were, were offered opportunities and we, we now have another opportunity down in, in Maryland. So it's been very exciting for us. Right. So have you hired new people because of these relationships? Yes. And they, this, mm -hmm. So you've really, your company has grown because of this opportunity. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's, and that's a key thing for us is, I think, being able to uh, provide local opportunities and grow, you know, bringing, we have two new people um, on board because of this, the, this relationship and because of the support that MGM has given us to help grow um, grow locally in the community. And just to clarify, mm -hmm. you became certified as an MBWBE when? 
I want to say two. Well, we've been my so um, the c company's always been an MBE uh, okay. since like my dad started the business in 1982. Um, so I think the maybe women came in 2013 or 15 ish. I want to say right around the time of um, when MGM actually came to town. Uh, but we've okay. always been a we've always been a minority uh, company. My father started the business in 1982. And were you always certified? Because I, I had a similar um, question. I'm, I'm I'm wondering, were you always uh, certified since that time? Have you had had the MBE certification? Yes. yes. Oh yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. No. Right. Not yeah. just being one and being certified are, are oh, unfortunately no, different things. So um, because of our. Um, business with the government. We do a ton of work with um, the DOD and other con defense contractors. Okay. So they require you to be certified with the GNMSDC. So we've been, and, and even greater than that, it's like the, na you know, the national, the NMSDC. So uh, C&D Electronics has been certified by the NMSDC for, I mean, over well over 20, 25 years. <clears throat> and, and, and just to clarify too, I, and, and maybe you address this, do you work closely with the um, OSD? Uh, we do, yes. Yeah, yeah, so they're helpful because, you know, you really are an example of, of why certification it really does create opportunity. And I know that there's been a lot of work done to make it more seamless. So uh, we encourage you to continue working with OSD because I think you're creating, they get certified, the uh, the work will follow, you know, as as it has with your with your company. It's a great example, and great that your dad made sure to bring it in, bring you into play to get that WBE. So. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Thank, thanks, Stephanie. Thanks. Thank yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Good story. You really good story. Any further questions on on this piece? Thank you. Okay. All right, next I'll briefly touch on the, uh, the local spend update. So um, spend overall, um, again, is, is slightly down quarter over quarter. And that, again, that's indicative of um, our continual efforts to you know, manage expenses coming out of opening in our first you know, quarter of operation uh, or two quarters of operation. Um, a couple of highlights that we do have is um, Definitely the Springfield category. Uh, you can see a, a good uptick in uh, spend in Springfield um, and in Western Mass in general. So um, a couple of metrics. Of our 398 uh, suppliers, um, 158 of those are within Massachusetts, while another 115 are, are specifically in Western Massachusetts. So that's uh, 40 and 30% of our supply base, um, respectively. Um, so we're very proud about that. Um, you know, over 50% of our, of our spend is, is in the, the Commonwealth. Just one question. Um, some of these categories could be a sub-category of the other. You, know, you could be local and, um, I'm sorry, Commonwealth and Springfield. Yep. Are the figures here? Uh, they're not cumulative. So those segments stand alone. Yep. So, okay. Good question. Yep. Um, one other update. Uh, Madam Chair, I think you you had asked the last meeting for some more detail regarding local or excuse me non local spend. So um, just generally, um, I didn't I didn't add it to the presentation today. But um, so there's a, a deeper understanding as to what goes into that uh, non local number. Um, there's a lot of um, non biddable type expenses uh, for us. So mm -hmm. things like uh, employee health insurance, um, some of our gaming expenses. Um, marketing expenses, so uh, I'm sure you guys have most likely seen our new um, Always Reason campaign. Um, so um, those are those are corporate agreements, corporate um, things that we don't bid out, um, and then entertainment expense. So um, the artist fee for Share, for example, or for Aerosmith, those that's where that that spend comes from predominantly. So there's not a lot of um, large buckets of of spend in there that that would be biddable. Um, the few that there are, we, we continually work on, as I said, to try and, and prioritize those for, for local and diverse businesses. Thanks for that update. Mm -hmm. uh, Aerosmith are from Hanover, so I don't know how um, 
<laughs> that doesn't count as local. Yeah. <laughs> you get registered. Um, so our, my last slide here is just a, a snapshot of our, our outreach that we did in, in Q2. Again, we try and do at least one event a month, if not more. Um, uh, one thing to note here is, you know, just the, the geography we covered. So um, we, we, we have a, you know, big focus, obviously, in Western Massachusetts, but we are still going out, making our way out to Boston um, when we can to, to attend events out there, um, especially uh, to support uh, minority businesses and, and find new minority businesses and build that supply chain. Any questions? Yeah, Ryan. Um, comment and a question, or a couple of comments and a question. First of all, you know, I uh, I continue to be impressed by the great job that you and Eddie and your whole team do. Thank uh, you. You're aggressively reaching out, trying to find connections. Um, and I was glad to hear you talk about the certification piece because we just went through our regulatory certification. Right update, which says unless you're certified by one of these agencies, you don't count, or we want you to count, but you've got to go out and get the certification. Um, obviously, any feedback that you get from folks that you have to work with, you know, that would be helpful to Jill and our licensing team, you know, please feel free to share that. Certainly, certainly. Um, so far, n not a lot of feedback, and I think it's predominantly uh, just because this really isn't going to impact us. Uh, it's only going to impact one supplier, uh, one uh, woman-owned business, local okay. woman-owned business, okay. and we're working with her to um, to get the the new certification. So, and and it's free. So, I mean, there's there's really no there's not a lot of roadblocks there, um, and and in terms of an impact, there's it's it's minimal. So we're going to be um, fully prepared to um, you know comply with the new the new reg. Okay. Um, I just got made aware of uh, uh, Center for Women and Enterprise, which is one of our you know, recognized certification agencies, is having a big summit or forum down in Framingham next week. Next I'm week, not yep. sure if that's on your guys' calendar. but It, it sure is, yes. That's great. That's great. Um, yeah, you know, the only thing, obviously, and you highlighted it, was, um, you know, working hard to get the WBE and the MBE numbers up, so... I'll offer up Jill and her team to do whatever they can to help you out with that. Thank you, and we're, we're always happy to leverage them. They're, they're great partners. Do you have anything either after June or coming up for the Worcester area? Uh, as far as outreach, um, I don't believe so, um, but I'll have, to, I'll have to see what what the team has on the calendar. I don't know okay. off the top of my head. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, we remain um, active members of the chamber, so um, and we want to stay connected to Worcester. As you know, that's that's an area that we think we can penetrate um, further on the on the customer side. Uh, we're we are we're going to be founding partners of the Worcester um, Sox team uh, and what they're doing in the stadium. So um, I just made a note, but we'll make sure that we stay engaged with their business community. Okay. Great. Thank you, commissioners. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Thank Stephanie. You. Thank you. Uh, with that, I'm going to ask uh, Mary Kate Murrin to come up and give an update on employment. Good morning, Madam Chair, Commissioners. Good Welcome morning. back to Springfield. I think it's been way too long. Um, <laughs> I have the privilege of uh, updating you with the employment numbers for Q2. And let me just get this slide. Um, we have a little bit of a video I'd like to show you first, and then I'll jump into the presentation. I had always wanted to be part of the entertainment industry, but in this in, in this industry, in this area, there just wasn't a lot of opportunities. I was looking at either having to move to New York City or Boston or even LA, and then I heard rumors about MGM Springfield coming to my community, and I knew I had to be a part of it because I knew it would be an incredible opportunity for not only myself, but for the city. I chose a career at MGM Springfield because of the people. Uh, everybody here has the same goal, has wants to succeed the same way, and it's kind of cool to know that everybody wants to do the same thing as you. Uh, it's a really great place here, and just being around the environment is a great place to work. 
mainly for a change in scenery since I did come from Mississippi where everything's basically just swamp and everyone's set in like very traditional ways. I'd like to experiment with different traditions and different um, I guess taste buds and experience different things so I can broaden my own horizons. Working at MGM Springfield made a positive impact on my life uh, for my family as well. Family, we're, they're nothing more but happy uh, for me over here. I, I'm like, I like to see the community. Uh, the community sees me from my outside point and it makes me feel good. So I feel like that positive impact, it just feels all good together. So It's definitely made me have a lot more experience and a lot more culture in what I'm doing. So I've gotten a lot more confidence in what I'm creating for people. Working for MGM Springfield has changed my life completely. Um, what MGM has offered me is more than just a job, but it's a career path with a company in, in, in an industry that I can grow with and just excel in my area here in Massachusetts. And something that I never thought I would say is that I'm now a homeowner in Springfield and without MGM I don't think that would have ever been something that would have happened. Um, just a, a, a few notes. Um, every individual and every employee you saw there has already been promoted. Um, and Amanda Gagnon, I, I think you'll recognize her. She was one of the original five uh, who were part of the campaign back in the in way back in around 2012. So, really a privilege to have her. And I think she's been promoted a couple of times and now reports directly uh, to Tally Spira in, ed in entertainment. And she's very proud of the house. So it's just, it shows to our commitment that we've been saying to you and all for years of really keeping the, the great talent here in Springfield, keeping them in Western Mass. And we're really proud to have those, those three employees. So just wanted to, to share that little video before we get into the presentation. You know, and Mary Kay, if I can, one of the one of the other individuals you saw is Louis Rivera, a front desk manager. His um, father is a shift manager in um, table games as well, so it's a bit of a family affair. But uh, what's special about Louis is he started as a security officer, and we highlight him at our veterans. Um, Hometown Heroes, a breakfast that which we hosted uh, about six months ago. Uh, Lewis um, delivered when he was a security officer life-saving CPR to an individual, and he stayed very close to that customer. That customer is local and has come back and visited Lewis and visited us. Um, and then he got promoted uh, into the hotel department where he's he's really shined. So um, I am confident Lewis um, will, will continue to get promoted through the ranks because he's one of those special people that delivers great customer service and. Um, Really, really special to have them, and and there's many, many more. We could we could have a two-hour long video of the great employees that we've had that have grown throughout this um, this property in the last year. Great, so, thank you. Did thank he you. have that training, or was that part of your training? It, he came, he had um, but yes. training, but we also provide that, and That's with our excellent. security officers, are part of the academy that they go through. Excellent, thank you. So I wanted to bring to your attention slide 29 uh, to speak to the progress in our, our hiring goals. Uh, this is just a graphic, and the next slide will go into a little bit more detail. But from a high level, as you, as you recall, our host community agreement, uh, best effort goals for Springfield residents, 35%. Uh, we are currently at 41% for uh, during the end of the second quarter. Women uh, goal, if you recall, 50%, 44.5, and we'll go into a little bit more depth on that in the next slide, commissioners. Minorities, 50%, we're at 53.6%, and then at veteran, our uh, HCA goal was 2%. If you recall, we had um, a lot of cross collaborations with the veterans in the area. We committed to four, um, and now we're at six. So I just wanted to remind the commissioners of that. Very, um, very encouraged by that. The next slide on 30 really will go into detail of the employees on the top bar. You'll see the full-time versus the part-time breakout. Um, we had, and you can see within below in the other chart, it is not a, not a HCA goal, but we have really talked about how important it was being here in Western Mass that we were going to concentrate with that pipeline with our Mass, uh, Western Mass counties of Hamden, Berkshire, Franklin, and Hampshire. And you can see that 76% um, of our entire uh, population pool for employees is full-time 
very, very close to some of the conversations we've had for that 80-20 split. Um, I do want to bring up is that a lot of our employees are asking for part-time work. I've had conversations uh, with Jill and her team. It continue, will continue to watch this. It is most important that we hear our employees, as Mike has mentioned earlier, and to be able to give them what their family and what they need individually. So that is something that the employment team continues to look at as we look at filling our positions, which we'll go into a, another slide and let you know where we are um, with positions that are open and what we're doing with the pipeline. Mary Kate, yes, can, I, can I go back um, just to the slide about uh, the categories? Uh, I think it's great that you're uh, exceeding your Springfield resident um, goal or um, HCA. Uh, I'm just curious how, when do you um, uh, ascertain their residency? Um, I, I don't know that this will be an issue. I hope it's not. Mm -hmm. But if somebody gets a job as a resident and then moves away. I guess it, it works the other way as well. Mm -hmm. um, is there, what, what in your process um, can you tell us, at least in keeping track going forward, to see if there is a trend? Sure, so we do pull this data from our workday system. Um, and that, as you recall, is also the system in which a, uh, can, a candidate applies. It's a piece of the talent acquisition. Once they become an active employee, we pull what the employee puts into Workday. And that is we are very diligent in communicating with our employees to update those addresses, mm -hmm. really from a tax perspective every year so we can get that information out. Okay. We do have uh, commissioner people moving in, moving out, and changing addresses. It's not something that we've done a very, very deep dive to offer audit, um, but we do stay in touch with our employees to make sure that uh, information is the most up-to-date that they provide to us. Thank you. And that, um, excuse me, and that report is pulled for the, the quarter ending for this report. Right, so as we continue to see these reports in the future, you know, mm -hmm. this number will be as up-to-date as you can have it in your records. That's correct. Not, not necessarily a date of hire, if you will. That's right. It really would be good to know if... Um <laughs> local residents are choosing to stay in the city. Um, you know, that was an issue in Atlantic City where many, many people got jobs and left the city. But it doesn't look like you're seeing that so far. We haven't seen that. And I think the last meeting we did discuss of all the wonderful um, additional development from a housing perspective that is in happening in Springfield. Um, and as people do get promoted and move on and start to form families, there is this occasional, I want more room, I want more family space, I want to go into a different school system. So I think it is important that we continue to work cross collaboratively collaboratively with the mayor um, and uh, Mr. Kennedy to ensure that the economic development does happen in Springfield to provide the housing. But there is going to be that as we people progress and become and move <coughs> up to be directors and so on, they will move on. Um, but we can definitely look at that, Commissioner, for you and try to gather those numbers for you. Thank you. With respect to the request for more part-time opportunities, if you um, quite properly address those with your employees in order to meet their family needs, does that mean that we'll see uh, increased part-time? In other words, a reduction to a part-time position, does that create an opportunity for a second employee or would it simply be a reduction from full-time to part-time? It would really um, depend on the business needs and, and given that we are still in the process of stabilizing, our intent is to hire as many people to keep the, the business going. Um, we really look at and have had really individual conversations with our employees and they come, they speak to their manager first, Madam Chair, and then will come to us. Um, we try first to see what we can do and give them support outside of the of work first. Is there a way we can put them in char in touch with additional daycare providers? So if that becomes a challenge, if that's what's brought to us, we'll work with our partners out um, outside the property first. An education uh, opportunity that someone might want to go. Are we able to maybe switch a schedule and keep them full time? So until we really exhausted all of our support systems for 
for an employee, um, we don't start talking about lowering because we want to make sure that we want someone to have education, um, of course, and be also be full time. But if the need is there part time, the intent is not to lower the headcount, but to give the opportunity for the employee to work to their needs. And then we would need to backfill um, to cover the hours that might be missing if they were to drop from from full time to part time. Can if, you, if I answered your question? Yeah, you did. Okay. Can Can you remind me of your last quarterly report numbers with respect to full employees, uh, the, the the total, than the full time and the part time? Do you have those? Yes, um, we were slightly higher. I believe we are at seventy seven point two percent. Um, Madam Chair, if my memory serves the, me, <clears throat> the total, for the full for have, the full time. Do you have the total number of employees? Yes, in? it's in it's in this report, ma'am. Oh, sorry, is, I missed uh, it. There's a quarterly breakdown. Yes, it's twenty three oh three, ma'am. So it was twenty. Sorry about that, Mike. If I missed twenty three oh three, and now we're at two thousand fifty four, and then it was it went from. Maybe it's right here. Maybe it's just a slight percentage. I see. Um, it's not included, and I will make sure that we include that for you, ma'am, moving forward. Um, but I, it, my recollection, I think it's in the 77.2%. 77. 77. So for full time. Right. So, not a, so about a 10% a drop. Correct. Okay. Well, <clears throat> I'm all for making family adjustments, but I'm also... Oh, no, I don't hiring. think it's a 10% drop, right? You went from we went 77, from 77.2. Oh, 1%, so sorry. Yeah. It's one, yes. You're 1%. I wasn't it's a math ten, major. No, like, sorry. Right. The 10%, so, yeah. ma'am, is the overall. If it went the in overall. our favor, I would have let the mistake go by, but... Um. <laughs> <laughs> We're streaming. Here we are. Okay, thanks. So um, you can see we are most proud, as you know. Um, we always talked about this onion during the campaign phase and keeping things in Springfield. Uh, very, very proud of the team, the talent acquisition team, and also all of our workforce partners, Holyoke Community College. We have STIC and all of the partners and even the gaming school really concentrating on the Springfield resident. Um, so I'm happy to, to dive in uh, to the numbers a little bit more, answer any questions you might have from any changes from over the, the first quarter of the year. And my apologies for missing that. Thanks, Major. Um, I know this is uh, a matter of the industry, just, uh, uh, but there's, um, how's your turnover? Um, mm -hmm. Just how's, how's that uh, evolving? So I know I a few meetings ago before opening, I wanted to be under or at 30%. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, we are finding ourselves more at the 40%. Um, and there's a couple of those slides as we go into, but let me just answer that question. We currently have 42 requisite requisitions open that accounts for about 125 to 130 full-time, excuse me, positions within the property. We are hiring monthly approximately 100 people. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we are losing about that same amount. Um, and uh, right before the meeting, I spoke to Jill to really talk about continued efforts from a workforce development perspective, getting people ready for positions, not more, not the tactical and technical, not the nice skills that we continue to need from chefs, but really interviewing, filling out applications, ESL. Uh, happy to report we have kickstart the uh, internal ESL program for our employees as per requirement. So that has been something good, but we really need uh, additional support from a workforce development perspective on ESL, um, English as a second language, interviewing skills, getting people a little bit more ready from a customer service perspective. It is true that if you come in with that great attitude, we will train you up. What is happening right now is that we're not seeing, we'll have people in our requisitions and we'll interview, we'll have 40 people, we put out calls, we're not getting calls back. Um, by the time we're getting people through drug background and licensing, and the good news is we have about 125 individuals in those three categories right now. Once they clear, they'll be hired. People are dropping out. So we're really trying to dig in of why that is happening, and I think if there is an opportunity for us to really kind of tweak that 
um, and find out what that linchpin is, sir, I think we might be able to make some additional strides by keeping people in the process. Well, we're all ears to the extent mm -hmm. that we have any in the licensing system, mm -hmm. for example, but I know that's mm -hmm. not the only step. Mm -hmm. And I know um, that Commissioner Stebbins already volunteered Jill, so I will take you up on that, Jill. Um, <laughs> also I, do that, from, I do that a lot. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, so uh, we did talk about the workforce and the mitigation funds, and I think there's some opportunities not only for us as an employer, but maybe some additional employers and some of the community-based organizations in the area. Yeah. No, it is, it is uh, timely. We will be discussing the mitigation uh, guidelines um, mm -hmm. later today. And, and one of the things that I thought as I was reading the packet is really, um, as we are more on a steady state, um, understanding that there's a fair, fair amount of uh, turnover mm -hmm. endemic to the industry, mm -hmm. how much of these um, workforce development monies um, are, are needed. And mm -hmm. it sounds like... Uh, they are. <laughs> they are needed. And I think from an employer perspective, we've always said, you know, the, when the doors opened a year ago and even to this day, workforce development does not stop. We, we are going to be here for a very long time. We have a commitment um, to the state and the city and, and to the really even more importantly to the residents of this area. We have to do everything in our power and we're trying to keep our, you know, really our our uh, finger on the dial of what is that linchpin. You know, as unemployment goes down, which is a win uh, for the Commonwealth, the area, um, in the entire um, entire region, you know, the pool goes down. So we really have to really, we start then recruiting from outside areas or basically stealing from other employees. We are going to continue to do that. I want to be candid because we want the best employees as part of MGM Springfield, but we have to really kind of look at what that pool looks like and keep our finger on the dial there, sir. Mary-Kate, um, the, the turnover itself what are the exit interviews telling you? Is it a readiness for employment or the schedule is just um, not fitting with some people? There, there's a, a couple of silos. I think there's one more of that um, kind of involuntary. Unfortunately, employees are not showing up to work. Um, so we have not ready for this. Um, I, I think they're maybe not ready for 24-7, so there is, there is that anecdotal. Um, the volume seems to be so, a little bit higher than some people are accustomed to. Um, we are open 24-7 on a casino floor, but restaurant and the hospitality is very similar to what is already in Springfield in the area. Um, but there is also this perception is I've made my money for the weekend, and I don't want to, if you're full-time, you've worked Friday, Saturday, Sunday, now you don't want to come back Monday, Tuesday. So then they're calling out. Last weekend alone, um, food and beverage had 50 call-outs. That is a lot. Um, and though it was wonderful weather, so, um, and that's a, that's a challenge for us. So we continue to coach and education up our employees, I think it really comes to, we've had conversations with Mike and the executive team, what can we do to better mentor our individuals? So we are going to launch a new program, really concentrating on certain areas and certain uh, individuals within the property, having lunch with Mike, um, spending time with him to talk about how he progressed through uh, the hospitality and his world here, having conversations if a Jorge Perez, our regional president, comes in town, or even our chair, uh, Jim Murren. So there's going to be some opportunities that we're going to launch internally to try to really keep people more in the fold. Um, it's attendance. Um, we do have some challenges, unfortunately, with theft. Um, they're moving out to better and bigger things. We've lost 125 table game dealers to Encore. So we're doing uh, additional recruitment, which will go into a little bit more depth. It's really a whole gamut of, uh, unfortunately, um, uh, things that are impacting. There, there's family crisis too. So we will continue to work with our employees through our um, employee assistance program, even when they're not with us. So um, that's the commitment that we've made to uh, the commission and the state when we first came here too. Thank you. 
I'll just add to that because I know Mary Kate takes the turnover uh, percentage personally. I do as well because I like to think we provide the best employment opportunity, certainly in the region. Uh, you know, one of the things you see and that we're seeing in a more mature operation is um, a lot of a lot of our opportunities because of seniority and shift bids are overnight opportunities. And when we have applicants and we ask them if they would be willing to work any shift, a lot of them say yes, knowing that that's important to the application process, but hoping they don't get the overnight. And when they ultimately are given the overnight, you know, they'll give it a try and, and, then, and then decide that they're going to leave their position. So some of that is driving some of the involuntary, uh, some of the voluntary and voluntary resignations. Um, I think we, I looked at the Encore impact. Um, at, in addition to the 125 dealers, we also lost management. So we believe the number is closer to 200 uh, of our table games. Um, um, FTEs uh, left the operation because of, uh, of Encore. You know, we felt that particularly in, in um, May and June, um, as they got closer to their opening, uh, I don't certainly don't fault them. They had great trained employees that were already licensed, licensed being key to some of the pre-opening um, timeline, and they got more aggressive with offering our folks opportunities. So some of this I feel like is a one-time hit because of Encore that we're trying to recover from, and we are. We're bringing more people through the school and, and um, some of our other competitors that, are, that have lost business and are shedding some uh, jobs. But it's really a, a number of factors. And one of the things that's more of public policy issues, Mary Kay and I have had the conversation, we have a lot of folks that are going to part-time because full-time will cause them to lose their public assistance. And they actually get people in this trap of not wanting to work because they would be net upside down losing um, the public assistance that's available. And that's something that we probably all should figure out how to tackle. And it's not a new issue, but it's something we feel all the time. And it's, um, it's, um, it's an unfortunate situation sort of being punished in that sense for, for working. I mean, I think we've talked about that too, about a tiered um, benefit system, right? And there were conversations a year or two ago, um, but that, that takes a heavy lift um, from Boston, so you know we would be willing to be working with you and to volunteer Springfield and maybe Western Mass for any type of pilot program if some of our representatives are listening. It's it's really really needed from an employee employer perspective. So. Um, just to, to move on uh, with our continued recruitment efforts, you can see as we continue to partner with UMass Amherst, the universities um, and colleges and uh, community colleges is in the area, um, you can see we are trying for work for readiness with doing mock interviews uh, for, with Dress for Success um, and some of, you can see some of the career fairs and workshops that we do and continue to work with ROCA. So the, the same things we did during our ramp up, we continue to do. Uh, we believe it's important to continue to model uh, what the surrounding community looks like. Um, so our customers are um, welcomed by everyone. Uh, so that is slide um, 31. And if you transition into, I just wanted, you see some of these employee stories that we really have already talked about. Sarah Jones on the left is our exec, executive uh, pastry chef. And I can tell you from experience, I have a muffin top myself because of the way she is able to bake. Um, so I think a, a wellness program might, it might be much needed, yeah. at least for myself. Um, and maybe some others might, might say that. So this was recently ran in the Republican. It was also on Mass Live um, as we really talked about women in unconventional roles. Um, as you can see, we have one of our uh, canine officers with her dog. They are inseparable, um, and they start to mirror each other, which is pretty amazing because they've been together just for so long. Um, and you continue through the slides. Janae Mays is a, a locksmith, and from her and from I and from Jason Rosewell's uh, perspective, we would need two or three or four people to replace her. Um, if she was ever to leave. So we would just wanted to share some of these additional special stories with you um, that have been in the news in the last few weeks and months. Just one highlight, which I did mention earlier, Madam Chair and Commissioners, on page 36, you can see our open requisitions. 
Um, there are 42 on that page, and they account for approximately 125 headcount. Um, and as stated earlier, we are constantly recruiting um, before. And I, you know, as I think back to, to pre-opening and in, in, in the incredible mass hiring events, and if you remember the one we had here, um, Jill and I had talked about having, and Mike Mathis wanted us to do one of these open. Um, and I remember going back and forth and Mike and saying, you know, I have a little OCD and control issues, so I wanted people in the system first. And he's like, we have to try it. So we did. We, we shipped in over 100 of our colleagues from uh, surrounding uh, properties. And if you remember Mass Mutual Center, I think we had a line of about 700 people outside when we opened the doors at 9. We had to close it at 4 o'clock because we couldn't get people through the system. Um, but I think we had close to 2,700 individuals come through that um, hiring event. Um, I did speak to Jason Randall, our Director of Human Resources, and we, we're going to do something similar. It's going to be a hiring event. It won't be to that scale, but we're really going to focus in on our open recs, and if you really take a deep dive into them, uh, many are food and beverage in that silo and in that hospitality area. So more uh, information to come on that. Um, I think that that type of excitement restarts, I think, with our individuals who might be looking for a position. I think we need to recreate that excitement that we had 14 or 16 months ago. So uh, that's going to come very shortly, and we'll make sure that we keep you up to date on that opportunity and would welcome uh, for you to welcome you back to that excitement for Springfield with another hiring event. Mary Kay, what seemed to be the, the most difficult positions you're struggling to find people for? Um, we continue to need cooks. Um, it's, a, it's a very hard and rigorous, and I think our Vice President Anthony would tell you it's a very rigorous, rigorous position. Um, we continue to work with Holyoke Community College and the Culinary School to turn out cooks um, more quickly. Um, that's a big one. Frontline position, uh, utility porter, uh, stewarding, any of those really frontline uh, commissioner frontline positions continue, unfortunately, to have the higher attrition rate. And as Mike mentioned, it's definitely grave. Um, when Typically, when you come in after the bid uh, process, individuals who've been here longer want the th more of the traditional hours, kind of that you know, beginning day shift and swing is okay, right. but gets right. you to 11. Um, overnight or sunrise really becomes that one that the new employees come into, to Mike's point, and then staying long enough, they're able to bid in. So we continue to look at that, and it would be a nice breakdown, and I'll provide that next quarter, is what's the attrition by shift? So if I'm able to rate, kind of pull that information for you, it'd be a nice um, kind of a little nugget for us to all look at and see where that is and see if we can break it down by division. It'd be something nice to dig into. So I appreciate the, the feedback. If I can just go back to the number, and thank you for your uh, patience with me as I struggle with my site here. <laughs> I just want to make sure that, so you're at 2,000, 54 now, and the opportunities, if you, if you could fill them all tomorrow, Mary-Kate, what would the number be? So, yes, I have um, approximately 120 individuals in drug background and licensing. So all three. So they have been offered a position. So that would be, so 2,054 plus 120. That's correct. And that number would hold if we had no attrition. And we no had no headcount loss. And so the on page 32, our page 32, opportunities, those are not, you have not identified candidates for those. Those are open requisitions, and those are additional positions and opportunities. So to and, your oh, point, Madam Chair, if we so were to yeah. add our current number, what's in the pipeline, and add our numbers, of the open requisitions with the approximate headcount and not lose anyone, we would be closer to almost 2,350 or 2,400. Well, that's an important fact. It right. Is. Yeah. And so, so it's about, uh, yeah, so these opportunities reflect another 100 or so. That's correct, ma'am. Thank you for that clarification. I was putting them together. I thought Whoa. the open and um, pipeline 
were the same. Yes, yeah, yeah. so my apologies for no, no, not being okay. clear. I'm, I'm glad so uh, the, you clarified it. So the number, um, if, if we can help op get these opportunities filled, mm -hmm. this is uh, a real opportunity for Massachusetts, you'll be, your goal would be actually higher than the number we saw at your last quarterly report. Right, as but long as there was no attrition. Without it, we understand right. that yeah. assumption. Yes. But, but full, to your point, full yep. employment would look Yes, would, would be a bigger number than last quarter. Like, okay. Correct. And, you know, one of the st one of the stats that doesn't come through here too is um, is the overtime opportunities. Which you know, when we're understaffed, you know, it's a little bit of quality over quantity. We have a lot of great employees that look forward to the overtime hours, and that's always the flip side. Um, I'm always happy to see those folks really take advantage of those while we're in this stage of trying to recover from the losses of folks that we had to encore, for example. Or um, and and your staff has been great, but you know, I think we all recognize there's a little bit of a slowdown in licensing processing time because you're trying to get encore open and that's a little bit of the of the delay in trying to turn the drug and background into start dates um, your staff has recovered from that but we certainly felt that in, in Q2 so uh, so the employment stories is always a little complex but to your point we need more employees and we, we continue to go out in the market and try to get them and the the success of the economy frankly is, is something that's hurting those efforts and that's a good problem to have for all of us I think the opportunity for the mentoring that you mentioned is is very critical and to give the stories of those who have started in a position and made their way through um, into full full careers. I know, Bruce, you always stress that in terms of the movement from um, entryway. And I think you led with a statistic about those who were hired early, that they've all had Yes, it was the three individuals on the Except. video. The three. Um, they've right. all been promoted. So there's opportunity mm -hmm. for promotion, and so it's a career decision. Correct. Uh, and, and that comes with maybe the overtime. Uh, so I'm sure that message will come through in your mentoring uh, as you go through it. Yeah, that's, that's, part of, piece. that's part of our new hiring rotation. We, we continue to bring new classes of people in. I tell them my story. I tell them the story of Bill Hornbuckle, uh, the, the president of a Fortune 500 company. Yeah. And he started at the ground level. Um, he famously tells the story. He was changing light bulbs on the flamingo sign. He would, he would cross out the light bulbs and facilities, would change them out overnight. And he's now um, the number two at a Fortune 500 company. And it's a pure meritocracy. And that's what I tell every one of our employees. They can do anything in this um, organization as long as they work hard and, and treat our customers and each other with respect. Yeah, as uh, a, an example for a woman, Karen Kaplan at Hill Holiday started as receptionist. There's many, yeah. many uh, opportunities to, to share those stories for growth. So thank you. I'm glad we got that number clarified. Yeah, thanks for thanks. clarifying that. Okay, appreciate it. I, just one uh, other item before you guys go. We've obviously done some changes to our uh, licensing and registration form, trying to dig down and help mm -hmm. applicants understand some of the security questions or the criminal background questions, mm -hmm. which can kick somebody out further down the line after you've kind of gone through the process. So, um, you know, the conversations that we can have with your team, the conversations we hope you can have with your employees, the conversations maybe we should revisit with some of the community-based organizations you're working with mm -hmm. might be helpful. Um, I would also just put a shout out to one of your team members who's the receptionist in 95 State Street. Uh, Miley, I'm yes. Drawing a blank on her name. Miley. But she is uh, fantastic, you know, puts a smile on a grumpy gaming regulator's face <laughs> when we go into the building. So uh, even though she's not front of house on yeah. the floor, there's still that, um, you know, that training mindset which resonates with people around the property. So. Thank you for the feedback. We appreciate That's it. That's great. And uh, where are some of uh, uh, Bruce, you were, uh, Commissioner Stevens, you were at the uh, Wahlburgers groundbreaking. You know that's a that's a uh, facility that um, should bring about 100 employees to uh, to the campus. So there is an upward trajectory um, that that's uh, occurring on the employment mm -hmm. side, especially as we ramp the business up. So um, we all want the business um, to be more, more robust and the employment opportunities to be more and more robust, and we're working every day to make sure that happens. These uh, nice stories highlighting some women in uh, non-traditional jobs, but you, it continues to be a challenge for you to meet your hiring goal when it comes to women? Um, 
Yes, I think um, with respect, you know, having a 50-50 is always hard, right? Because just one person would skew that. Um, we do have roles that we are really diving in from a, you know, um, operating engineer traditionally tend to be men. So uh, Jason Rosewell, our VP of facilities, having conversations with the unions, you know, if there's not a lot of work, is that, will they be willing to, to bring women to us. So he's been he heading up that type of effort. This building also um, historically has been um, male dominated with the ushers, tech changeover and some of those positions. But as you see, we're cracking that, cracking that window and cracking that ceiling that will continue to get women um, into non-traditional um, non roles. But it goes the other way too, right? And so um, we would love to see some men in just roles that might be just women, like in spa and salon. And so, um, you know, we're looking at it both ways, Commissioner, but I appreciate that feedback. And it's a constant, a constant fight that we are uh, taking on. Great. Thanks, Great. thanks Mary Kate. Great. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Great discussion. Uh, so at this time, uh, Love to bring up Drew Killen. He's a new member of the team. It'll be a new face to you, but uh, a hugely important role. He's our vice president of marketing, uh, having come from Las Vegas. He's part of the MGM family, has relocated with his family here, and is uh, in charge of really activating the casino floor with promotions and continue to dig into the database and, and grow our customer base. So uh, without further ado, uh, Drew Killen. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, it's an honor to be here today. I really appreciate you having me. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Marking entertainment and events. Um, as Mike mentioned, we continue to offer dynamic promotions and activities to our loyalty program. Um, the April promotions, we started with ATV, uh, and then we moved right up into two motorcycles, and then right into June, we had the million, MGM Millions. <clears throat> It's really just a snapshot of the quarter, but um, ramping up our promotion seems to be a, a, a theme for us. It's getting more exciting every time, every month. I think we're getting better. And um, we continue to see a great number of visitors coming to the property, um, and as well as joining our loyalty program. So I look forward to uh, crowning more winners next quarter, and I think we're, we're doing better every month. I'll just say Drew's already had immediate impact. We're digging into the database. Uh, we're we're looking at um, through surveys um, what is our what is our customer looking for in terms of promotional activity. Um, you know, cars have been very successful. We're we're rolling out more cars uh, as well, and um, and some exciting moves are on the floor. As you go onto the MGM floor, you'll see uh, a ton of activity. One of the things we're doing is re reducing the number of, of machines to give a more more comfortable experience and the reduction also um, allows us to put more creative products out there as we call them the carousels or the big screens um, breaking up the big slot banks and and creating more of an interesting experience and and um, Drew's helped us um, you know spearhead that effort so uh, a lot of exciting promotional activity coming on the, the remainder of this year and, and largely led by Drew Great. So if uh, if you don't have any further questions, let me just, uh, I think I'm going to talk a little bit about the community engagement. Uh, so just, just a, a highlight, obviously a big part of MGM and, and certainly what I would think you would expect from your licensee is our engagement in the community. And here's just a, a few examples. Uh, we did a bowling program, um, Bowl for Kids. Um, and um, as well as a, a Springfield Dragon boat race, we're taking advantage of the Connecticut River and participating in their annual uh, river boat um, race. And then we participate in the Northampton Pride Festival. So really an example, you know, these community events are always a win-win. Not only is it something good for the community in terms of support, but it's a great opportunity for team building for our, for our folks. And they love to get out. And, and what we've learned with, with um, you know, the, the new um, millennial employee is that so much of their job experience is engagement and feeling proud of the place that they work for. So we try to take as advantage of as many of these type of engagement opportunities as we can. Here's just a couple of examples. Uh, our meeting group business, which is which is growing and I'm excited about, and I talked to, to you earlier about unrated business. Unrated is an important part of 
of our business model and frankly something that Springfield um, you know, um, would suffered from because of some of his historical issues with, with lack of activation of Main Street and and lack of programming and, and Mass Mutual Center, all of which we're helping to grow. But um, I think of this as lanyards. When you go to Las Vegas, much of Las Vegas su- success is that is that midweek convention guest who has a lanyard is in for uh, a meeting group and spends a few dollars on the casino floor. spends certainly spends a lot of money in the restaurants, and we're starting to find our niche there. Um, we got a great uh, uh, sales team that's driving um, incentive-based business. Um, we've got a, a, a franchise dealer program, and we're finding um, auto dealers from across the country that have identified Springfield as a great value place to bring their annual meetings, their quarterly meetings. We're starting to see renewals of those uh, of those groups. Um, we've got uh, some of the biggest social programs, certainly um, Judy Matt's um, Bright Nights Gala um, is, I think, was shown in the in the bottom left, and other other big uh, social events. So it's bringing people to the to the casino, to the resort that wouldn't be there for gaming, but you know certainly would spend some money on the casino floor um, and and support all the non gaming venues. So it's a it's a program that's really starting to take hold, and I'm excited about the trajectory of our meeting group business. If no other questions, I'm going to roll over to entertainment. Uh, so I'm going to introduce now. Uh, Talia Spera, uh, she's our director of entertainment, and she single-handedly is responsible for bringing Aerosmith uh, to downtown, uh, four sold-out shows, and all the other great programming, uh, MGM Live Series, um, tireless effort. She's Amanda's boss, and um, is helping to really create some great uh, great careers in entertainment. So one of the funnest and, frankly, um, toughest jobs on the property is, is Talia's. Mike, good morning, commissioners. Can good, you morning. Okay. good morning. Good yep. morning. Alrighty. So um, today we'll share with you a little bit about what we've been doing on the plaza and the armory specific to Q2. Um, so we had about 121 total activations in Q2, April through June, um, and that's large and small events. That's across all of the venues that we program, Mass Mutual Center, Symphony Hall, um, Plaza Armory, and the ballroom space. And so highlight just a couple, uh, MGM Live, which is our summer concert series. We had 31 shows, um, six of which were ticketed, 25 of which were free and open to the public. Uh, we had about 12 um, morning workouts with yoga in our Da Vinci Park. We had 37 comedy shows, and we had 13 food truck Fridays during that time, um, just to highlight a couple of the events that we did. And then moving on to our entertainment and nightlife portion, um, a couple images here. Of course, um, we did welcome share in April, a very successful event, a sold out arena here at Mass Mutual Center, and the second highest grossing uh, entertainment <coughs> show the Mass Mutual Center um, has seen in its history. So very proud to have welcomed her. You saw a little snippet of her saying happy anniversary on our video. Um, so she's uh, an artist um, that really shows sort of the brand power and leverage that we can pull from Vegas to pull artists over here to um, to Western Massachusetts. So, And then, of course, we had Rob Gronkowski from the Patriots come celebrate his birthday with us, Terry Fader, Air Supply, um, and Murphy's Boxing Partnership that Mike touched on. Uh, and then our upcoming entertainment calendar is through the end of the year. Um, I won't go line by line, but just a couple highlights that we're really excited about. Um, in October, we're going to welcome Smokey Robinson to Symphony Hall. We do have Family Feud Live um, with celebrity guests coming in October as well to the Symphony Hall. We have um, Slayer and Primus coming to the Mass Mutual Center in November. We're right under 5,000 tickets sold for that, so another sort of hero event that we're looking forward to for the downtown. Uh, we've got Michael Carbonaro live coming to Symphony Hall in November as well. And then um, some really great holiday programming, Brian Setzer Orchestra, if you've ever seen that show, it's a real treat. Um, they will be coming to Symphony Hall. And then, of course, we will have um, the opening of our ice rink and the ch- um, holiday tree lighting as well towards the end of November um, that is in support of Parade of Big Balloons that we see downtown. Um, so I think those are sort of my biggest highlights. Are there any questions on the programming coming up? I, I had a quick question, and 
uh, Mike, you've touched touched on it. Is you're, you're finding the opportunities to bring in patrons, players from New York, Detroit. You know, connecting them to a Sox game or what have you. Um, you know, can you give me an idea of you know how well you're also trying to get them to go out into the region, you know, especially as fall approaches or ski season or something like that. You know, what work you continue to do to you know you're great about go out and explore the area. Um, how does that tie into some of the marketing and events and promotions that, that you've not only done, but you got lined up for kind of the rest of the year? Yeah, it's a great question and something we continue to, um, to work on. I think, uh, you know, a few examples are um, we've got a, a leaf peeping um, sort of program that we're trying to, you know, things that are uniquely uh, New England that we can offer a customer in another market that justifies a flight to come see us and then an extended stay. So uh, that a skiing program is, is, is right on. We've talked about um, incorporating our, you know, our steakhouse and our spa spa into a, a package so that if someone enjoys a weekend, they can come back for a spa treatment and have a great steak dinner. And our host would, would try to try to um, host that program. So, uh, you know, golf is a big is a big part of the program seasonally. Uh, we've got a, a, a great partnership with uh, Great Horse out in Hamden, um, really a world-class facility, and building tournaments around that so that one of the fun uh, promotions that uh, when you are part of an MGM is is rivalries between different um, sister properties. So, you know, an MGM Grand Detroit um, uh, group of customers competing with the MGM Springfield, and we would provide a prize pool. And then we would, you know, some of this is import, but also some of this is export. So we would send our customers down to Detroit for the same thing, and we're, we're already developing a, a golf program with, with with that sister property. So uh, continue to look at different opportunities. Um, we we want to activate the uh, Connecticut River. Um, one of our uh, one of our ma uh, one of our executive team members, Jason Rucker, um, who's head up head up of uh, security. He was working our um, our Fourth of July program. Looked down on the Connecticut River because we hosted it from our, our uh, garage rooftop and saw you know people that had taken out personal boats to watch the fireworks and came up with the idea of doing something um, customer based with with a boat out on the on the river and that's something that would be a special. Um, uh, opportunity that we think we could import some business for. So, you know, we're always open to new ideas to to get people to come here, stay longer, and really drive that cross cross property activation. So, uh, more to come on that. But the sports partnerships are, are obviously really compelling, and those are probably our main focus um, out of the gate. Okay. And and just to add to that, um, an example like Aerosmith, where we had twenty thousand visitors. Um, just a quick snapshot of where those visitors, we had visitors from over 41 states come for that show. Um, and we worked extensively with the BID, um, the Business Improvement District downtown and the GSCVB on, you know, what are the, what are the restaurant offerings outside of MGM? Because even uh, we couldn't host everybody that was in town ourselves. Um, so continue to work with uh, the community groups on advertising what else is available downtown while they're here for their stay. Um, we can do more on that front, and we definitely will. Now that we've steadied our operation a little bit, the next strategic point is looking at things like that. So. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, Talia. Uh, so I'm going to close it up by talking about economic development. Um, hopefully I've got this. I took a picture this morning that I hope made it. Ah, fantastic. So uh, I know you're coming from the, the Pike side. This is on the Long Meadow line, so you may not have seen this, but um, for the record, it was, it was um, stalled traffic, so I was not moving when I took this photo. <laughs> uh, but uh, these were, you know, as any, anybody who's in, uh, hopefully not stealing too much of Tim Sheehan's um, thunder here, but any community looking for economic development wants to see crane swinging. And I thought this was um, a really great opportunity to highlight what is happening outside our four corners. Uh, we, were, uh, we had just celebrated the Wahlburgers grand opening a week ago with the chairwoman and, and uh, Commissioner Stebbins. Across the street, I highlighted to the group that was assembled that uh, we're within a month of a 12,000 square foot flagship CVS um, that's going to open. And not only is that a significant business, but it's significant because it supports market rate housing. Um, because what we've seen is that the, the brave young professionals that are moving downtown, we really need to support them so that they stay downtown and have all those services that they need. And this will be a pharmacy and obviously groceries and things like that. Um, anecdotally, one of, one of 
one of our young professionals I st stopped me in the hall the other day and I was catching up with different thing things that she was her, how her summer was going and she was complaining that for the third year in a row um, the landlord had hiked her um, monthly rent um, by a hundred dollars and um, I told her that's actually a good thing um, she didn't appreciate that but that it really <laughs> showed that um, there is demand for market rate housing and those are the kinds of um, um, you know, those are the kinds of elements that drive additional investment. And I have heard from other uh, commercial business owners who are interested in our statistics because they're seeing rents grow up and they're looking to invest capital to turn some of these vacant buildings into market rate housing. So what we had all hoped for is happening. Is it may not be happening as quickly as we all would like, but there is ancillary development um, going on uh, throughout the downtown. And uh, this is just a small example. These two cranes, I believe, are building the um, a 130 room hotel on the riverfront, the old York uh, Street Jail, and it's going to be a skydiving and rock climbing complex. Mm -hmm. So one more great amenity that that frankly builds mm -hmm. builds critical mass, so that when we have customers come to us, they they can go explore and find other things to do in the downtown that drives a longer stay, which you know benefits us all. So um, I just wanted to I wanted to show those cranes. I was I was really proud driving in that that we were a part of that, that story. Uh, and a couple of updates, uh, residential development, I think um, uh, Ombudsman Ziamba gave, gave an update. Uh, we continue to make progress there. Uh, I think the most tangible step is uh, Mass Housing, who is helping us to manage this project and bring the different parties together, both public dollars and private dollars, has distributed a, um, a um, inter inter party agreement that all the parties are, are looking at to mark up. They would be essentially the project manager of the 31 Elm Street project. So we're still firming up a few sources and uses of the funds, but uh, a meaningful step to have an agreement that we can all react to and start working on and, and driving. So once that agreement is signed, I, I don't want to give you a projection on when that would happen, um, but it's something that we continue to work on month to month. Um, I think that'll drive deadlines um, and the initial sort of groundbreaking and feasibility and you know sort of pre-development work. So um, I'm hoping this time um, at our, as of our next update that we can give you a really meaningful update on where that agreement stands and and um, some of the early you know milestone hard hard construction pre-opening work that we would have planned as part of that. So it's a meaningful project that w w frankly none of us are willing to give up on because it means that much for the downtown. I mentioned Wahlburgers. Uh, we had, a, had our groundbreaking. Um, we're looking for an early summer opening. Hopefully we can beat that. We've said July is the outside date, but uh, that is underway. Um, the Armory, we continue to look at um, potential future programming, but uh, frankly, it, it really works really well as a flex space. And that's something I said early on is one of the benefits of slowing down on that development is it gives us a chance to try different things in there and give different types of customers um, opportunity to view that beautiful building. So we have a comedy show um, series. We do banquets in there as well. Um, it's, a, um, it's a green room for a lot of the acts that go out onto the, uh, out onto the plaza. So I, I think as many people as we can put in there until we figure out what is its um, future use is, is a benefit to, to anybody that comes through the facility. The VIP lounge, um, we plan to open um, shortly, and it will kick off really our reinvestment in our VIP customer. It's something they've asked for. It was, frankly, a miss on our part, and um, excited to make that offering. You see the rendering to the left. It's going to be a beautiful space in keeping with, our, with the whole aesthetic of the property. Um, and then I, I'll just close with uh, sports wagering. Um, it, it's, it's critically important, and I want to keep it on the radar. Uh, you know, we've seen in some of our other markets, our sister properties, uh, tremendous. Um, our Mississippi properties, for example, are starting to have record numbers attributable to sports betting, and it's not in the sports betting um, revenue itself. It's the lift it gives to the entire property and the restaurants and the bars. People are coming longer. Um, they're bringing you know customers that wouldn't normally be a gaming customer, but they're a sports betting customer, and um, it's it's something that's important to the Commonwealth, particularly for Springfield, who's on the border of a 
surrounding state who's aggressively looking at sports betting, um, especially with geofencing and the opportunity you have to sports bet outside of brick and mortar. Uh, if if Connecticut is able to get there before us, you know we will have customers that will go across the state line and uh, consume that product and spend dollars in a surrounding state. And obviously, part of the part of the history of gaming in Massachusetts is um, in some ways we're 20 years behind uh, our competitors, and I hate to see it happen in in Massachusetts. So I, I'll continue to. Um, push on behalf of the Commonwealth and our property and the city of Springfield um, because of the opportunities it provides for employment and for a better customer experience. Um, we recently did a survey of our customers, our MLife customers, asked them a bunch of questions, but one of the things we inserted there was a sports betting question. A third of our customers want sports betting as a product. 80% of those customers, about 25% of the entire pool, um, are passionate enough about it that they say it, it would drive a decision whether to go to us or go to a competitor if they were, were to provide it and we didn't. So it's, um, it's really important to our customers in terms of the overall experience, and especially in a, in, a, in a jurisdiction like the Commonwealth that has such a rich sports history and great franchises, um, it's, 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 a, it's a service and a product that our customers that we're not meeting. And um, I, I'm hoping that we can continue to, to push that, um, you know, that initiative forward. Uh, I know there are other issues that the legislature is grappling with, but it's an important one for the success of, um, of this industry. So um, with that, I'll open up to any questions. I know we've, we've run long, but I um, appreci appreciate the opportunity to be back in front of you. I hope you're as proud of what we're doing here as we are. We have uh, millions of customers that have come through. We have thousands of employees that we've launched in careers. They're, they're buying their first homes. They're, putting, they're buying their first cars. They're putting their kids through school. And um, they're improving themselves with, um, with the industry that we've all helped launch here in the Commonwealth. I, I just, thanks, Mike. I just want to take a moment um, on that last slide, you know, the residential development update. I know, I know John reminded us that uh, as a commission, anything that would pop up in the course of, you know, the time we've been, we've all been working and waiting on this, you know, anything that would come up that would say, this is a no-go, has not seemed to come up, which is good news. That's right. Um, Obviously, though, you know, it continues to, to be a project, and it's not an easy project. I think we all acknowledge that. Um, uh, but it is something that a lot of folks want to get done. I, I know there's, I thought I saw somebody from Wind Development. I certainly saw somebody from the building trades here all committed to the project. The chair and I heard the other day the mayor is committed to the project. When we said, what keeps you up at night? He actually said 31 out and making sure that got done. And I'm not... Also, not trying to steal some of Tim's thunder because I know he'll want to talk about that as well. Um, you know, we want to see this commitment completed. It was a big reason that you know the city of Springfield selected you. It was one of the you know one of the key caveats when we did your application review. Um, and we know you want to get this commitment done and move on uh, right. and not have this hanging out there. Um, so all the parties still seem committed. Uh, you know, hopefully the, the passing around of the MOA won't take that long uh, because where action is needed, it's also on saving that building. Uh, the chair and I had the chance to walk around the property the other day. There are still windows that are broken. Uh, we're not too far away from another winter, which is only going to add to the condition, you know, the worsening of the condition of the building as well as, you know, the overall cost for its redevelopment. So. Uh, Keeping focused on it from all parties is, I think, a priority in making sure that, you know, this commitment gets done and, uh, you know, the project can move forward. Because I think it also speaks to what people see when they come to downtown Springfield. You know, they, they see your building. Right next to it is this big hulking mass at night that is sitting dark. Um, but it's good to hear that, you know, the mayor and the city are still committed to it. It's great to hear the feedback from Mass Housing. I would assume that if Wynn is here, they're still committed to the project and the building trades as well. But, you know, as fast as we can wrap this up, uh, we not only want to see you again complete that commitment, but saving the building is, is a, timely, uh, a, a timely piece of the equation as well. 
Uh, I echo the, uh, all of those sentiments, and, and to be clear, it's more than just checking the box for us. Uh, that's an important commitment mm -hmm. that we made, but it, it's really a double whammy to take a building that's an eyesore and to turn it into a vibrant market rate housing, um, a building with ground level uh, retail restaurants that could then usher in the next wave of development on Court Square. I mean, Court Square is one of the most beautiful squares, um, frankly, in New England. And it's we we got to activate it. So uh, we're committed to it. We have dollars set aside for it, and we have backup options. But you know those are those are in distant second place to what we could collectively do with 31 Elm. So we'll, we'll continue to push as hard as we can. It's complex, it involves many parties. Um, so you know some of the great um, projects you know take time, and th that's what this one feels like. But it it feels like it's on the right trajectory. And we'll let you know if, if we run into something that feels like um, a deal breaker and, and we've got to, you know, go to another direction. But I don't think anybody is just going to let that happen. That's my sense. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. <clears throat> so, if we, if we, I, we, we now um, have the benefit of an update directly from the city of Springfield, which we're looking forward to. I'm just going to also mention to Janice um, in the back in terms of our timekeeping. We're thinking that it might be a natural break after um, <clears throat> Springfield's presentation from Mr. Sheehan uh, to have lunch rather than a break. Is that an, a good idea, or should we just break, Janice? Okay, well, that's it's about. No. We, we have guests. After I know that. we do. Um, I'm just trying to monitor yes. our timing. Okay, thank you, Tim. Thank you. It was nice to have the opportunity to meet with you, along with Commissioner Stebbins, and congratulations. It's not such a new position, but relatively new position. Relatively so thank new. Yes, uh, obviously I. <clears throat> have a great deal of history with the city of Springfield. I worked for the city of Springfield for a number of years. Um, I, I've also worked with Commissioner Stebbins, and I've also worked with John. Um, so it's kind of, uh, of it, uh, there's familiar faces, and uh, at some points it's old home week, and at some points there there's a lot of new activity that's happening in the city, which is great. So I thank you for the opportunity to allow me to introduce myself to the commission. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to be uh, fairly uh, casual with my presentation to you the, uh, this morning. Um, I think one of the issues that when you look at the MGM casino, just from its design, it made a statement that it was not just going to be a gaming center that was located in Western Mass. Um, it, it really uh, put forward um, the opportunity to look at using the casino as an ability to really elevate um, and contribute to the whole redevelopment effort um, of downtown Springfield. And it certainly, as you all know, has become a, a hub um, of quality food, modern entertainment, and retail venues, and it's been absolutely spectacular. Uh, and then you add the icing to the cake on that, which is the entertainment that has come with it as well. Um, all of those experiential activities uh, that are found in the casino are just hugely enhanced by the larger performance spaces and the venues uh, of Symphony Hall and the Mass Mutual Center. Um, so between the casino itself and the top tier performances being booked at those larger halls, um, the number of people that are coming into the, uh, and enjoying all of the attributes that downtown Springfield has, uh, has grown exponentially. Um, as evidenced of the, that point, uh, the city's local option revenues uh, have, been, have gone up over 22%, uh, totaling nearly $700,000 for the first full year of the casino operations. Can I have that number again, please? Sure. It's up over 22% totaling an increase of more than $700,000. Okay. 
So is there more to do? Of course there is, and there always will be. Um, but the underlying question in my mind, uh, and I think from the city's perspective, has been answered that over the first year of operations with regards to the casino's ability to be a substantial catalyst uh, in the ongoing revitalization of Springfield Central Business <laughs> District, it in fact has been, um, and it's been a, a great addition for us. Um, and now our job going forward uh, is to leverage that investment um, that MGM has made in Springfield to bring even more people into the downtown, uh, increase the pace of economic development activity throughout the central business district, and positively ad address, which all of you have heard, the persistent perceptions of Springfield as being something less than it actually is, and uh, it being, uh, there being a perception of it being unsafe. Um, we continue to address uh, these objectives collectively, uh, and all of our interests are aligned on those. Um, the city fully understands, however, that um, <sighs> what we need to do is actually work in bringing new development forward that isn't necessarily directly related to MGM. Um, and um, <clears throat> The city's economic development approach going forward uh, post-casino construction is built around diversifying the land uses and the ownership interests in the central business district uh, and around the casino in a manner that advances that leveraging objective. Um, because if the architectural objectives of the casino development are to be fully realized in my mind, um, the key the area around the casino must be equally engaging as the casino itself. Um, so, you know, if, if you're looking at a successful urban environment, it requires equivalence throughout. Um, you can't have one side of the street looking absolutely wonderful while the other side of the street uh, is, is more depressed. Um, and if our expectation is that we want the casino to be fluid in terms of allowing people to come in and go out, they have to have something to go out to. <clears throat> so that's what Springfield must ad address in cooperation with the development community that's seeking to benefit from the underlying area market value um, that the casino has established within the downtown market. Um, we've heard a lot about the 31 Elm Street project. Uh, I can tell you that we're exceedingly close on that um, to the point that in a discussion yesterday, um, it was decided that uh, in terms of the planning work that needs to be done in anticipation of the work that the city has to do within the building, that we would actually launch that work and start going forward on it. So we're, we're pretty bullish that we're at the end on this. <clears throat> but, you know, as you know, the underlying financial needs uh, of a massively complex historic redevelopment effort, it's required a matrix of uh, patient public-private partnerships, and uh, all of that takes time. Um, but again, I, I believe we, we are... Um, uh, quickly advancing to the, the end, at least with regards to um, the capital stack to begin the project. <clears throat> and as you know, uh, as Bruce said, uh, the mayor and the entire city development team are very anxious uh, to advance that critical component because we believe that it, it, it's so essential to establishing the positive connections between the casino and Symphony Hall. Um, if you take that walk right now, um, it, 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 especially if you're going to a night performance at, at Symphony Hall, um, it's concerning. Um, and we need to do better in terms of in, ensuring that, you know, that development comes online and it makes that connection a very positive experience for any visitor to the casino. Um, and... <clears throat> um, we need to ensure as well that all of the public infrastructure and the public park um, that's related uh, to that experience are in tip-top shape. Um, so 
coming back to the issue of you know equalizing the the uh, aesthetics of the area around the casino, the city's been actively working with a consortium of private investors in an effort to purchase and favorably repos reposition parcels of private property in and around the casino that currently are not realizing their highest and best use, um, nor are they contributing in a positive way to the underlying uh, pedestrian environment of South Main Street. Um, and, and I think that that's important. And the, the investor pool that we're, we're having conversations with are, is very locally based um, and it, it's a sustainable um, uh, investor pool. And we're very happy that you know, they have uh, expressed an interest uh, in, in stepping up and uh, making a commitment to uh, uh, repositioning many of those properties. Um, <clears throat> other than that, uh, Mike touched on the issue of housing. Um, the city continues to see private investment being made in the existing multifamily uh, housing inventory, uh, most notably related complete rehab of 10 Chestnut Street, which is large tower on the corner of Chestnut uh, and State. Um, <clears throat> and the Silver Brick Group's uh, acquisition and rehab of 22 Chestnut Street um, and the uh, units at Maine and Taylor. Uh, it should also be noted that there was an extraordinary rehab undertaken by First Resource Companies and G Gordon Pulsifer uh, in the redevelopment of the Hollywood section, which is just uh, a little bit south of the casino on South Main. Um, that d redevelopment has been unbelievable. Um, Gordon and his company actually took what was a massive blight on the city and transformed it into a thriving neighborhood village. Uh, I would encourage uh, the commissioners, when you have an opportunity to be out in Springfield, to actually go down to that area and take a look at, at what work has been done. It, it is simply astounding. Um, and it, it, it again gets you to a point that there's more cohesiveness along the Main Street corridor uh, as you come south of the, the casino. Um, but a significant investment is being made in urban multifamily rehab uh, throughout the downtown. And we're also seeing private sector interest in the new market rate multifamily residential development. <coughs> the um, Davenport Company is advancing the first newly constructed units in the downtown in more than a couple of decades. Um, the city recently updated its market analysis regarding downtown multifamily housing. The report suggests that there's a strengthening of the market over the period in time, the last time we had that done was about two years ago. Um, the city development uh, team intends to uh, further test that market viability going forward and to also explore the local and state incentives that may be required to actually stimulate that market sector uh, going forward. Because as many of you would know, um, the multifamily residential development has dominated urban development across the country since the end of the recession. And Springfield is a, a little bit behind um, in getting its market to a level that um, it's ready to take advantage of that. Um, for an urban environment, in my perspective, uh, to be truly successful, um, you, you need to have a, a housing market and a population that is economically contributing to and expanding the commercial base within the downtown. Um, it's one thing to rely on the visitor population, but in order to sustain the commercial activity that's actually happening in the downtown on an ongoing basis, uh, especially on the, the weeknights, you need to have an activated uh, uh, population within the downtown. Um, and uh, the mayor is, is very aggressive on uh, reestablishing market rate uh, housing within the downtown um, and uh, advancing discussions as to what the city needs to put forward in order to make that development uh, uh, objective happen. <clears throat> Finally, the city's uh, 
development team, in my mind, needs to consider testing uses that may seem a little bit outside of the box. Um, we have, uh, in, especially in the area in and around the casino, uh, we have market viability that we otherwise probably wouldn't have had from the just the regional market because we're importing a, a population <coughs> that's not counted in our demographic numbers uh, when you just look at the region in general. Um, so in my mind, I, I, I think, you know, even the, there's so many co uh, comments that go on that, you know, retail's dead, retail's never coming back. Um, I just came from a community uh, down in Norwalk, Connecticut, that they're building the only urban mall uh, in as new construction in the United States, and it's 750,000 gross leasable square feet um, of retail. Uh, and... Um, it's in the heart of the urban environment. I'm clearly not saying that, you know, that's the type of, or scale of development that we should be looking at. But I, I do think that there is a demand uh, relative to retail that might be going unmet. And I think we need to drill down to try and figure out at what, um, uh, what is the niche of that particular market? What's the scale of it that we can support? Um, and I think there's been proven evidence that uh, um, both retail and gaming um, go well together uh, within the marketplace. And uh, but I, I also think you know there's support issues that you know we could be providing as well in terms of um, uh, more just workspace. Um, ideas that you know provide the visitor to the, the, the casino the opportunity to, to check in and do you know a, a couple of hours worth of work uh, while they're here um, and um, I, I think we need to to also you know drill down on what the region wants out of its you know primary city uh, in Western Mass uh, in the downtown and try and figure out, you know, what the, the market realities are associated with that and how both the casino and the city can help to realize those. So I'm happy to take any questions that you might have, um, but it's been great to get to know, uh, or at least introduce myself to you and uh, meet you. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Thank you. That was really informative. Good luck with your new position. Thank you. And I think... Um, you talked about a lot of the things you wanted to do, but then you said, look, I think we have a good investor pool to get this to, to happen. So that was encouraging, because typically that's the hard part, right? That is usually the hard part, is finding the, 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 the folks that are willing to invest and in providing the resources uh, uh, to actually acquire. But as I said, the... The pool that we're looking at, uh, or we're discussing this with, I mean, they're they're very local and they're very committed. So that that's also encouraging. That's great. Uh, we will be hearing about uh, in the research in the real estate report later on today um, some of what you what I think you're alluding to. Uh, I'm glad to hear that the city is aggressive relative to that investment in in and around the casino. Mm -hmm. um, some of the things that I took away from that report is that there appears to be some increase in asking rents right around, but not necessarily a decrease in vacancy rates. So clearly there's an opportunity there that I believe the city has a big role in trying to address, and I, I, um, I wish you to uh, you can the, continue to do that. The well-managed units that are in the downtown now, um, it, it, the top tier are going about $1,700 a month. Um, and it, it, it kind of ranges between 15 and 17. Um, so, I mean, the, the, for, for Springfield, those are, are, and when you look at, you know, what the average uh, asking price is for a home in Springfield, those are, those are pretty big numbers in terms of rental numbers. Yeah. Additional questions? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice meeting you all. Appreciate this update. You too. And I'm going to just ask my official timekeeper, do you have 
is this the right time for, we need a break at the very least. Is this the right time for break or lunch? Five minutes. Five minutes. Five minutes. Take a 35-minute break. Break till one. Our, uh, yes. If that works for Can you team. guys stay here for at least another 35 minutes to begin with the next piece? And we can break for lunch. Yeah, How are Break for lunch. Yeah, we'll start with item number five um, with respect to our research, and we appreciate your patience. Uh, this is a very rich conversation we're having here in Springfield. So we look forward to your presentation. We'll reconvene at, uh, at 1 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. Um, item number five, given the of today's agenda, will be our or evidence report. Um, Ziamba's report, as well as our next. October 7th. October 7th. Thank you for um, waiting for um, us to have some lunch. Please proceed and, and for the record, please introduce and uh, so. Sorry. <laughs> right. we're, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> The other one. Is it working? Um, before we get started, I want to add fantastic point GM gave Awareness Week. Um, as you know, a group of um, I had a, a um, lines and Martin Warner of the Mass Council and did a going to a lot of I wanted to let you know that uh, and, and in part with him they um, interactions with the one in our um, sort of activity game since we do is um, uh, C2 uh, that is intended to how the game actually work. Uh, one of the more popular activities during the week. I did most of their time have all of those details. Here as well, in Harvard. So, um, yeah, they do great work. Um, we have the item construction report, as well as report focusing on the surroundings. Uh, again, reference some great presentations that we had today from MGM and from. 
very nice detail on what the economic effect of regime in Springfield has created. Uh, uh, is, is very good, and I believe for the commission. Um, I also believe that it's, that it's that we have um, uh, objective. To, to to fill in the details and stakeholders of what the the true economic what the true social impacts of of casino gambling are in Massachusetts that's exactly the intent of section 71 of chapter 23k of the statute um, when it when it was laid out to the commission that um, we needed to um, take a very close look um, and employ a robust research program uh, to look at look at the effects of casino gambling in Massachusetts. Um, I won't go into great detail about what the statute says, but it covers a number of, of different, very specific social, um, a very a number of very specific economic um, impacts that that we may may observe. Um, two of those are being presented to you today. What are the economic impacts of of um, building a casino in Springfield, not just the, the dollars and cents of what the casino costs, but what are the, the additional direct and indirect um, costs that, it, that are, and induced costs that are created. Um, what is the impact on the real estate market um, in Springfield? And let's bring some, um, some additional data to, to fill in the picture. Um, we have today, we have Mark Melnick, we have um, Henry Rinsky, we have Rod Matamidi, and of course, Dr. Rachel Volberg, uh, to present these two reports uh, for you. Um, I will turn it over now to um, Dr. Mark Melnick, who will provide a, a, a bit of an introduction to highlight some of the economic work before he turns that over to um, Henry Rinsky to talk about uh, the real estate work. So, thank you. Uh, great. Thanks for the introduction. Introduction, Mark, and uh, good afternoon, uh, Madam Chairperson, Commissioners. Uh, I'm the Director of Economic and Public Policy Research at the UMass Donahue Institute. Uh, for You guys are all aware uh, of our relationship in the project, but I did want to take a step back a little bit and talk about the, econo the economics team and the research agenda within uh, what we're doing and how the pieces that Henry <clears throat> and Rod will be presenting today fit into the larger objectives of what we're trying to do as part of the economics and fiscal research team built out of the Sigma project. Uh, as you're aware, uh, the social and e economic impacts of gaming in Massachusetts program has been going on for several years. And it's a partnership that we've been, uh, that us at the Donahue Institute have been working uh, under the direction of folks at the uh, School of Public Health at UMass Amherst, led by Rachel. Uh, to, uh, again, objectively and academically study the uh, actual impacts as we see them in uh, casino gaming uh, in the state in this really unique opportunity that's presented to us in the sense of there's a new, the new industry is introduced into the economy. This is rare that something like this would ever happen. Uh, and to be able to pause while you're in this process and see ongoing what are the impacts of that casino being introduced into uh, your economy, uh, all politics aside of what different opinions might be of the casino industry in general, but it's a very unique thing to say, here's an industry that did not exist here before, and now it is here. What does it mean, both in terms of what it does to communities and public health, but then what it also does to other elements of the economy at large? Uh, so it's a very unique opportunity for us to be a part of something that, that's that holistic uh, with its approach to take a high-level overview of the impacts of gaming what it means in terms of job creation and taxes, uh, examine what some of those effects might be in the community, uh, and then some of the individual effects as they relate to employment. So it's interesting to see in ways which a lot of these things will dovetail and, and, and touch each other, because a lot of the things that we heard in the earlier presentations are, are very relatable to the things, obviously, that what we are doing. But in our, from our reach, is trying to look at the, a very holistic view of what this means to the residents of the Commonwealth and what it means to uh, uh, the host and surrounding communities. So, <clears throat> I 
And while we're featuring today in this presentation uh, two particular parts of work, uh, I should uh, note that there's a, a large team of folks who do different things on, related to the social and economic impacts of gaming. Uh, on the economic side alone, there's eight researchers, most of which are uh, housed at the Donahue Institute, but partnerships with folks like Henry and, uh, and Mark Nichols at the University of Nevada, Nevada, Reno, give us a very broad reach in looking at all the different things that impact economic and fiscal. Uh, just in terms of an overview, what we're trying to do is measure and determine the economic and fiscal impacts of casino facilities at the local, regional, and state level. We're le leveraging both a combination of secondary data all the census products that are available to folks, uh, American Community Survey, Bureau of Labor Statistics data, those kinds of things, uh, as well as primary data collection. And one of the unique things about, again, the, the mandate out of the research agenda is our ability to work directly with the vendors, uh, excuse me, work directly with the licensees to collect data on site, uh, to get data directly from the casinos, uh, but then also to do surveys with new employees or intercept uh, with patrons to uh, answer questions that secondary data wouldn't allow us to do. Um, but look at things like business dynamics, labor market conditions, government spending, things in the real estate and so on. Our analytical framework has evolved over time. <clears throat> we think of our work kind of fitting into three buckets. Uh, one, looking at economic and community impacts uh, and what it means specifically to the host and surrounding communities and the Commonwealth at large. Um, we look at casino impacts uh, and what are the, the impacts that are directly related to activities at the casino and the related spinoff effects of those. Uh, and then we uh, have this bucket that we haven't done yet, which we are calling special topics right now. But as the project evolves over time, we anticipate being able to take deeper dives into different topical areas that as we are in a fully operational casino market, uh, other kinds of questions will, will uncover themselves as things that we may want to study further, and I'll touch on that in a second. So in terms of the economic and community impacts, this has been manifested mainly in our things like the host community profiles and the um, uh, uh, community comparison analysis, but looking at, again, how characteristics in communities are changing on the ground, be it local business indicators, residential indicators, uh, labor force indicators, real estate, those kinds of things. But what are the characteristics of community and how are they changing over time? On the casino impact, oh, sorry, wrong button. On casino impacts, uh, what we're looking at are the different characteristics, again, that are directly related to the casinos and the related spinoff effects. So characteristics of the casino workforce, who, uh, and, and part of that is our new employee survey where we're actually interviewing people at, at when they're hired to understand where did you come from and what were you doing before this, why did you want to work here, those kinds of things. Um, but then also the operating and construction impact. So being able to say here is what the direct impact of the investment related to the casino and their operations are, but then what's the spinoff effect? So we're able to tell a full picture of what is happening in the economy. And again, one of the, the major driving forces for why we wanted casinos in Massachusetts, in part, was the employment opportunities and uh, the concern that, hey, we got a lot of mass residents who are leaving the state anyway to go gamble in Connecticut. Well, is that, are we recapturing people? And those are the kinds of things that we're studying in that part. Uh, and then also a, a deeper analysis on things like the lottery, which came up during the first half of the day, but tracking over time what is actually happening to lottery sales, not just in point location, but also in the host and surrounding communities and lottery revenues overall. I mentioned special topics just a moment. But, Go ahead. Yeah, let me just interrupt you um, and do it briefly. When you talk about government and fiscal impacts, you know, gross gaming, host running community payments, um, you know, Tim Sheehan mentioned it, you know, that they are seeing a bump in their local options taxes going right. up. And that's something I'm going to be interested in looking right. at to say, you know, what has the entertainment, the hosp you know, the hotel, uh, the restaurants done right. to neighboring and surrounding communities? Because at the outset of this, that was everybody's big concern. I'm going to lose all my patrons to right. the new restaurant at MGM. Right. Um, I don't get the sense that's happening, but... That right. seems to me to be a good indicator where that may show up. Right, and that's definitely an area where, um, excuse me, just a few weeks ago we were having another brainstorming session about how to deal with the, the government spending piece because some of it is money that goes into an op general operating funds for the cities, and those are a little stickier to try to understand. But there are other elements of trying to understand, okay, how have uh, revenues for locations changed and how much can we attribute that to the casinos? I think it will require some case studies specifically with the municipalities, but... Uh, those data are available, and we have some thoughts about how we 
push that ahead, especially now in the post operating phase that we're that we're currently newly in now as of June, where everything's now uh, happening. Um, on special topics, um, what's happened over the course of our several years on this project is a lot of interesting questions have come up over time. And what we'd like to do in a, in a post-operating phase is really <clears throat> dive in deeper with some of these uh, particular topics. For example, what is the impact on tourism and live entertainment? Uh, over the years, we've really been focused specifically on the ramp up, first getting a baseline and then what the ramp up of uh, building the casinos would be. But then when you're in an operating phase, you know, what are the other things that are, are businesses that are interacting with each other? So again, things like tourism uh, impact, impacts on small businesses, workforce development, one that we keep talking a lot about internally, things like job quality. Uh, so what kinds of jobs are we talking about here? Do they have benefits? What are the wages like? Um, so we've, we've talked internally a bunch about new employee survey. What, what, what about a current employee survey or an exiting employee survey? Uh, but these are some of the things that we want to continue to think about as we track over time how the industry has changed and what the impacts may be. <clears throat> Did you um, just say ex um, exiting employees? Well, I'm saying like theoretically, like what, what, what could new topic areas yes, be, you yes. know, and, and um, thank you. Yeah. And, and so we, we've had this portfolio of work we've been doing for years, but then there's like, okay, how do you push the boundaries of that in order to inform things in a public policy context in an important way? Mm -hmm. uh, so related to that is these phases of economic work, I've, I, which I've kind of flirted with these topics already in this conversation is like, you know, we, this all started as a baseline study. You know, we don't have casino, we don't have casinos yet. We have, we're going to have award licenses. What do the communities look like? And we're obviously past that. Development and construction is the phase that we're just, uh, that we're just recently completed. Uh, and Rod will do kind of the last, it will show one of those pieces of work that we've done looking at the impacts of construction. But now we're truly transitioning into a fully operational phase. Uh, and that would be the casino market going forward. Um, our ultimate goal is to be able to tell stories, and we're moving to this part of measuring impacts geographically, both in terms of where the, where the casino is in location, but then the host and surrounding communities, and then ultimately being able to compare across each other, both to talk about an impact on the state overall, but then also how the different casinos may be different than each other. Uh, you know, uh, Mike Mathis earlier, uh, in, during this meeting made a note about how there's different clientele for Springfield versus Encore, right? So being able to tell some of that story in terms of economic impact as well. Uh, economic impact will look different for these places. So I think that's an interesting next phase of work as we move ahead. Um, so in terms of the different pieces of work in the economic and fiscal and what we've done in the community, today's presentation focuses on the real estate and construction impacts, but with things that we've done over time Patron surveys, uh, you know, uh, which are point, uh, intercepts of people who are at the uh, at the casino and understanding uh, what act, it, what activity uh, what um, excuse me uh, picking off people, understanding their spending pattern inside the casino. People aren't really great at telling the truth about how much they may have lost, but uh, we have ways of getting around that. Um, but but then trying to understand like what would you have done otherwise? How much are these people being recaptured? How much is this new money in the economy? Um, and that's an important story to tell. The operating impacts, which, is, which ties into that. The construction impact, which Rod will talk about. Lottery impacts. You know, the survey with new employees. And then looking at these elements of, of real estate trends. Um, so with that, uh, I'm going to turn the show over to Henry. Uh, but I'm happy to an answer any questions that you guys may have as we, as we move ahead. Thank you, Mark. It's the green, green is ahead. There's only two choices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Hello. Okay. I wanted to see how loud I was. <laughs> um, thank you all for having me again. It's always a pleasure to present before the commission. Um, my name is Henry Rinsky, as others have told you. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Landscape, Architecture, and Regional Planning at UMass Amherst. Um, my specialization is state and local economic development. Today I'm going to kind of report a summary of what we found in the, the really covering primarily the construction phase, as, as Mark was saying, but the real estate impacts of the casino, um, MGM Springfield Casino. Um, and part of the reason why, you know, this study really covers the construction phase is that, you know, it, it starts with, you know, kind of an examining trends from about 2014 through 2018. Um, there's a lot of differences in this study compared to the baseline report in that we've introduced a lot of new data. 
um, a lot of new data sources, as well as, you know, kind of increased our ability to track things much more quickly. But we are still, because we're very dependent upon secondary data, there's still, you know, um, somewhat of a lag in our ability to, to, to measure things, you know, so, but a year lag in, in secondary data is actually not that bad in the big scheme of things. But just keep that in mind that a lot of, like, for instance, our um, colleague from the city of Springfield that was talking earlier was talking about conversations that they're currently having with developers. This kind of thing would not show up in our data yet, right? I just want to make sure you're completely aware of the time frame that our study really covers. Um, you know, we're, you know, this study is really not getting into post opening um, types of impacts with the exception of there's a couple measures that dip into the post opening time period, but even then they would be not really enough of a trend. Um, you know, our study covers residential and it covers commercial industrial. I think the bulk of what I'll be talking about today is residential, but you know, you have the report and you'll see that it's really divided into those two pieces. Um, and it, with the addition of the analysis of secondary data, you know, we do do some primary data collection primarily in the, um, through stakeholder interviews as opposed to surveys. So, so um, you'll see us at, at times I'll be talking about secondary data and at other times I'll be talking about you know, what is really anecdotal data that we've gleaned from talking to people. And because, you know, when, when uh, the evaluation structure was set up in advance of the actual licensing of the casinos, um, gives us a really unique opportunity to do something that we can never really do in planning or economic development studies, which is kind of look and draw baselines before and then see what happens as they happen and then kind of continue tracking after. So we leverage that. We leverage our ability to study things before and after and look at trends over time. And we also try to do a comparison between areas where we think that the impacts, if there are any, are going to be the most salient and areas that are generally similar markets but, um, but uh, will not be as affected directly. And so for us, because it's hard to find similar markets that aren't, you know, we're really talking about looking at the impacts on, in this case, Springfield and its, immediate, and its surrounding communities, and then kind of contrasting that with what's going on in the larger region, as well as what's going on statewide. At least somewhat try to give us an indicator of what the conditions might have been, you know, but for the MGM. I um, already talked about timing lags and key data sources, kind of the bane of our existence as academics. Um, and, you know, coupled with the fact that, you know, we're talking about, you know, the casinos opening is still relatively recent. Um, and just, it's important to keep in mind that nothing happens in a vacuum and we don't have the luxury of being able to conduct, you know, laboratory experiments where we can really isolate, you know, the casino from the broader economic and real estate market. And there's been a lot going on in the broader real estate market um, you know, since the Great Recession, which is really the context of what's going on here. You know, Greater Springfield's real estate market has been getting better. It's been strengthening. You see that in the number of sales that are occurring. You see that in the prices of homes. You see that in the rental values. Not all of these increases can be attributed to the casino, though. And so what we try to do is contrast what's going on in Springfield, the greater Springfield area, and then outline areas, you know, and again, if we see those same trends going, going on in all these different areas, then it kind of suggests to us that at least we, we can't purely attribute it to the casino. And as, as, you know, academic, I'm very cautious in attributing causality. It's something that you will not really ever hear me do. Um, cause the, the standard of evidence that we require for that is very, very high. But having said that, um, that the context is also that, you know, as a real estate market picks up and you see rising rents, rising prices, you know, um, that kind of growth also creates a lot of challenges. As you all know, and some of the discussion that we had earlier is that, you know, rents might be great, you know, rising real estate values might be great from the perspective of, 
you know, um, the economic developer might not be so great from the perspective of the person in the um, rental unit in the city that, you know, is trying to figure out how to pay their rent. And we're cognizant of that. And that's part of the reason why we tried to, to, to broaden our strategy, include a few more inner informants um, in, into, the, into the research design. Um, and, and continually, as, as Mark was alluding to earlier, trying to think of ways where we can get at some of these other real estate impacts that are a little bit harder to detect just by looking at the, the data. Um, so that's a continued thing that we work on. Um, so, again, to kind of set context, uh, you know, we're really looking before and after the licensing of the casino. And one of the things we do is just kind of look at broad regional trends and where things like home sales are happening to the extent that we can find the data. And these maps just really, they, they really just kind of show for single family homes, you know, where are single ham family homes being sold? And that's a measure of kind of the volume of activity in a market. Uh, up market, there's a lot more transactions. Uh, a recessed market, Usually things slow down a bit. Um, but one of the other things that we're seeing is that generally speaking, you know, the areas that were hot markets for sales kind of pre-awarding the license still remain to be the hot areas. And this is for home sales, right? So we haven't seen like a massive shift, but that would be hard to detect, um, you know, at this kind of level of aggregation anyways. Similar Do things you know going on for casino sales oh, and similar things. Excuse oh, me, I'm sorry. I just, um, this is just a question. Yeah. In terms of the sales, do you know the average um, time it takes to sell a single family home um, in the course? Did you look at that? I haven't looked at it in conjunction with this study. Yeah, I'm getting at. I, I know that it's been going down. Yeah, well, I, I really shouldn't comment on that <laughs> because I haven't looked at it in conjunction specifically with this study, but I have been listening to a lot of different kind of, you know, other experts talking about the local real estate market, not specifically Springfield. And there has been a lot of discussion about how it's becoming much, much more of a seller's market in Western Massachusetts and the Pioneer Valley in particular, not to mention, you know, the, you know, East, which is crazy. Um, so the, the time has been going down region wide, <clears throat> um, but I'm not, I can't remember off the top of my head exactly what that would be. So you don't think that, that the property sit for a year? You know, I, I, I'm just trying to figure out the time frame. Uh, yeah. Um, I think right now it's probably less than that, but yeah. I don't know exactly how much. I, I really wish I could recall that right it's off the okay. top. Ra Rachel, you. did you want to add to that? Yeah, I, my house is actually on the market. So <laughs> this would be you, anecdotal. So I can tell you the anecdotal evidence that I have <laughs> is that the average... Uh, for a sing average time for a single family home on the market in the Pioneer Valley is 68 days. 68 days. Yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that's really helpful. Thank you. Right. Yeah, and yeah, she right. painted her house entirely paisley, so it's kind of a <laughs> strange market niche. Um, <laughs> and redid the gardens. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Thank you. So these just maps just kind of give you, it's really kind of an overview of the geography of home sales in the, the lower Pioneer Valley. Um, so now getting to the actual residential impacts. Um, the first metric that we're looking at relates to the number of single family home sales. And what here what we're really doing is showing on the, and I'm gonna talk about you know, my left. <laughs> The, um, the number of sales for the, the regional entities, like the city of Springfield, the surrounding communities, and the, the remainder of the Hamden and Hampshire County. And then on the right axis, you'll notice that we plot separately the state of Massachusetts. Okay, so just I want to make sure that everybody's following the, the, how the graph is set up. Mm -hmm. um, there's a few things that we see here. Generally speaking, we see very similar trends in the volume of sales activity. So getting past the number of sales, which is going to vary because these are different size markets, what we're concerned about is the trend, right? So we have seen a pickup in single-family home sales for Springfield. Springfield would be the larger dash line towards the bottom, right? It's definitely picked up, and the pickup is actually very closely related to the timing of the awarding of the license, However, you see this 
same phenomena going on in like outlier areas of Hamden and Hampshire County, where it's much less doubtful that their real estate markets would be directly impacted by the announcement of Springfield getting a casino, especially in the single family homes market, right? Um, condominiums are another one that we look at. Um, here, we don't see really anything going on. The condominium market in Springfield isn't even you know, keeping up with the rest of the region. But you also keep in mind that the condominium market within Springfield is actually pretty small, mm -hmm. um, especially compared to the rest of the region. And you know, remember, in Hampshire County, there's a lot of colleges and a lot of faculty I know live in condos, you know, mm -hmm. um, things like that, probably even some, a number of students. So we have a pretty robust condo market. But it's less of an issue in Springfield. But where Springfield really um, kind of dominates the regional housing market is in multifamily buildings. So, you know, here, you know, we're talking about apartment, you know, apartment housing, but we're not talking about the rents that are paid by the, um, the tenants, but we're talking about the actual sales of the buildings themselves. So, again, watch out for the small numbers. But here we see, you know, Springfield really departing from what we're seeing in the rest of the region. And so while I am not the type of person that quickly attributes causality, there's definitely something going on here. <laughs> um, you know, that, that, that the timing of the license award is very consistent with the increase in the sales and the steady increase in the sales of multifamily homes. My big caveat with this one, though, is it's, you know, these are relatively small numbers of sales by by real estate market standards, yeah. Doctor, uh, um, and each one of those sales, however small is the total, accounts for one yep. multifamily, uh, so, you know, there's multiple it would be a units. Building. Multiple units within each one of those sales yeah. because it's a building. Yeah, so so even if, the, um, even if one building had more units than another building, it would count as one. Okay. Yeah. Um, so this is real numbers, 150, right? Is that... Yep, and this data we get from the multiple listing service. Right. And so what that does is it's basically the posting of things that are for sale, right, on the, on the market. So not the renters, but this building is for sale. Right, and, yeah. and so to... Or this building sold is actually another thing that the multiple listing service... So to Commissioner Zunica's uh, point, we don't know how many units, it's just built. Not from this data. <clears throat> um, is there are some other data. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. I thought you were done answering. Sorry. Go ahead. No, I, She's going to ask you the question you're about to answer. So. Okay. Ask me yeah, the question. Let, let's see. Let's do try it. To answer you it. answer, and then I'll see if it's a question. <laughs> <laughs> um, does the MLS capture things that were maybe not arm's length transactions, so private sales that aren't going to go into MLS? Not to my knowledge, but Becky's taking notes. We'll definitely look into that. Okay. I don't... My... Not the version of the MLS that I had access to, um, but... I'm just thinking about the project yeah, that they have described earlier south of here. Were a lot of those done non-arms length such that they're not going to hit MLS or your stats? Right, right. Um, it's definitely more than worth looking into. So hopefully I'll be in a better, better position to tell you whether or not we can get that kind of data before next time or even before the next you know, sequence of reports that we do. Um, I think that would be a great complementary okay. data point. Yeah. Hen Henry, is there yeah. any chance on the, the increase in multifamily home sales, and obviously Springfield has a different trajectory, is it possible if you went through the surrounding communities and looked at actual multifamily housing stock, whether that trend, if you took out the communities that have very limited multifamily housing stock, whether you'd see a same trend. I mean, I'm thinking East Long Meadow, Hamden, not a lot of two families, Long Meadow, but if you compared it with kind of light communities, whether that might be a similar trend. Yeah, I mean, you know, the multifamily market is dominated by the type of communities that you're interested in. I mean, we could certainly put Chicopee and Holyoke which have generally similar type housing stock as Springfield, you know. Um, we could kind of look at them somewhat separately, but I'll tell you that 
the surrounding communities that you see up there, any multifamily housing that exists is probably in similar communities uh, that what you're interested in. I, we didn't take those out when we put the data together, right. so it would be kind of interesting to look at, but just from what I know is that, you know, Long Meadow doesn't have a lot of multifamily housing. Right. West Springfield has some, but not hardly as much, but Chicopee has a lot, Holyoke has a lot. Right. Um, and, and so, you know, their market has been rising, you know, as you're seeing here, but there's, there's kind of this uh, much more, it's like the steepness of the slope of that line. Um, but I, you know, again, I think we're taking notes, so. <laughs> um, so now on to sales and, and um, that, so, sorry, sales prices. So mm -hmm. kind of, you know, are, are people asking and the selling price? Right. Right, so these would actually be the, the, the price sold, not the price asked. Sorry. Um, we're not seeing a lot going on in single family. Um, prices are rising, you know, kind of slow but steady in Springfield and maybe at a slightly higher pace than kind of, um, you know, the, the surrounding communities, but not, not completely, it, it's, it's not a, huge departure. There's a very similar trend kind of going on regionally in the, the, the incremental increase in housing prices. So it'd be really hard to attribute that to, you know, to the, the announcement of the award. Um, and these, condo, are median, oh, sorry. these are median sales prices, not the average. Yep. And usually we use the median because it helps protect things from like the, Benches. you know, they sold the castle, which well, really, yeah, skew you know, the it. downtown Abbey House had Abbey House sold and <laughs> yeah. messed up the whole market, you know. Great. Yeah. Um, not that I'm plugging downtown. <laughs> <laughs> Just what came in my brain. Um, so we're not seeing a lot with single family. Um, we're not seeing a lot with condominium as far as prices. And, you know, but, you know, what are we seeing with the sales price of multifamily? And again, we're seeing, you know, kind of an increase. This one is a, is a little bit more difficult, though, because the increase actually preceded, the trend precedes, the, um, the start of the trend really precedes the casino. And it's, what we're seeing is kind of a continuation of that trend. So it's a little bit more ambiguous. But it came, that trend upwards came after the award? The trend begins closer to 2012 for the city of Springfield. When, and when did you make the trend? Oh, that's the actual that's award. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, that would coincide with, you know, the fact that we came out that's of, right. you know, a very depressed housing market, especially for, you know, the type of investor properties that, that multifamily homes really, really are, right? Um, and so, you know, 2012, we're recovering from that, and so the... the you know, we start to see it. So, so um, while while we do see an increase in the volume of sales, it, we haven't seen it really reflect as much on the price of the sales for the multifamily unit, or at least not to the extent where it's clearly distinguishable. Okay. So, Eastern Mass, the prices have gone up considerably. Western Mass, at a much slower rate, prices are rising. Yep. Okay. Yep. And consistent with the economic recovery that has been pretty universal. Henry, on, the, on that graph, the, the Hamden uh, and Hampshire counties, right before, <laughs> right before <laughs> and after yes. the license is awarded, has an interesting bump yeah, yeah. back and forth. Is that, what do you make of that? I don't know what that's from, to be perfectly honest with okay. you all. But that would be, you know, the rest of Hampshire and Hamden counties, um, that's... That's pretty far out, you know, as far as you're really talking about, you know, like Amherst and South Hadley and, and the areas that, yeah. that get outside of Holyoke. There could be, um, you know, a few high value sales that, that affected that because we're still talking relatively small numbers. Well, it comes um, back right up. Uh, it comes back uh, down. It comes anyway, right back down. Uh, it could be just, it, it, sales it, it's it's it might be a data Correct. anomaly, but the, the, you know, the... the yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. To Henry's point, though, if you're talking about a small number of transactions and two of which are way high on the right Skew. side of the scale, medians are protected from skewing, but they're still right. the middlemost score in a range of scores. If there's only 
13, right? right? Oh, then then it's like, skewer. then you could still see, because what happens is 14 is the weirdo, right? 13 and 15 look like the same number, right. and then the, and then the trend line as you move yeah. forward still looks kind of similar. So I, I would I would guess it's something like that. Yeah, and I try to focus on more the general thing, yes. and but when we do see spikes like that, when we have the ability to dig down, we usually try to figure out what's going on. Um, we have, a, you know, that, that's a little bit easier to do when you're the one that's putting the data together than than you know when you're looking at secondary data, but. So unlike the earlier one on sales, it just looks as though the <clears throat> market here just reflects the overall trend. That yes. You might be able to draw a conclusion on the other one with respect to sales that it was perhaps connected. Yeah, because the timing is it's, much more consistent, right? That the <clears throat> announcement of the award and that's not always a perfect indicator because there was a lot of people that probably would have thought, oh yeah, Springfield will, will get the Western Massachusetts license. But you know, here, you know, you're talking about major investments, and sorry, that single family I wanted, oops, oh no, multifamily. But, but you know, again, it's, it's, it's pretty dramatic and it very much coincides with um, you know, the <coughs> announcement of the ward and we're not seeing it in other areas. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's much more strongly suggestive. And the other thing is that it coincides <coughs> with what our, um, our anecdotal conversations with you know, uh, people that, that have a much more kind of intimate knowledge of the local real estate market kind of told us uh, as what was going on, which I'll get to in a minute. That maybe, and that's you're you're going to address that. But I wondered if prices, the sale prices, could be lagging behind sales. In other words, speculators could be saying, "Well, the prices are lagging, but I think that this is an opportunity because the, you know, I see the the price of this building below what I think its ultimate market uh, yeah. potential would be. That's what speculation is. Yeah. But eventually, if there's enough right. demand. Well, they will go up. You'll see, yeah. Right? Yeah. So, but that's, that's my interpretation, okay. you know, again. Um, so rentals. So rentals are actually, you know, um, the, you know a, t a, a topic that's a little bit more kind of getting to, you know, um, you know what people, you know, in the, the residents of Springfield actually kind of experience and face. Um, Especially because this market, there's not a lot of, I mean, Springfield is the city of homes, but most of the single family housing units are really concentrated in other areas of Springfield, not just in the immediate jurisdiction of the casino, but there is a good multifamily housing and rental market in the downtown part of Springfield. So, we, um, so what do we see? Um, we see rents rising, yeah. right? But... We also see that same trend in a lot of other areas of the region. Um, so that doesn't mean that somebody's rent, you know, in the immediate area, it, we can't definitively say that th their, their rent didn't rise, had nothing to do with the casino, but there are broader real estate trends that explain rising rents that really are independent of the casino. Um, you know, and again, we're mainly looking at the, um, the, the pre, you know, the pre-opening kind of time period. We have a little bit of data on this post-opening, but not enough that I really want to interpret it because I want to wait until I start seeing a trend to know whether something's really going on. Um, so, you know, so we do see rents rising in Springfield, you know, which is consistent with the anecdotal data that we had collected. But again, you know, we see that in, you know, Chicopee, Holyoke, Longmeadow, further areas in the rental market um, as well. And so now getting into, you know, a lot of the discussions that, uh, that we had with folks, you know, about the market really kind of focused on this rising rent issue. And there's been a lot of people that have kind of, the, the anecdotal data largely is consistent with the, what the secondary data is telling us, um, that there's some, you know, we've seen upward pressure on the housing market, but it's hard for, you know, you know, the housing director to say whether or not even that's a tribute to the casino, but 
they also know that there's a lot of development projects that are kind of going on and in the works, right? And so on the one hand, you know, they may be related to the casino, but it also makes it difficult to attribute it purely to the casino, I think is my interpretation of that quote, right? Um, in 2013, you know, this is just kind of a document of the, the rate of rental increase that a lot of people have seen. Um, in the second quotation, you know, bed, two to three bedrooms went for under 1,000. Now they're looking at, you know, 1,400. One thing that I'll say about our data, and I should have mentioned this before, that our rental data comes from um, Zillow, and Zillow tracks rental prices of listed properties. So if you're a resident that's in a rental unit, um, your price might be different than what a new unit that's not, not a new, it's not new in the sense that it's recently built, but something that's on the market, right? You, you could be locked into a rental rate for a while just because you're a good tenant and your landlord doesn't want to raise your rate, even though a new, that, that same unit that goes onto the market, they might, the asking rent might be higher. But Zillow only looks at asking rents. So we think that it's a little bit biased on the upside as far as like the actual dollar values. Um, Unless there was a lot of turnover, right? Unless there was a lot of turnover, yeah. And then they would get, they would get closer together, but I still think it would be you biased. You think it's a bias, okay. That's, that's a great observation. Um, and and this, this last one that I have on there, because, I, because it really kind of coincides with what we're seeing in the difference between the single family home and the rental markets, is that we're not seeing a lot going on in single family home price-wise, um, you know, but, the rentals will be more sensitive. There was a lot of discussion about the prospect of speculation, especially in the multifamily market, which kind of, it kind of coincides with what we're seeing in the sales, that during this award period, there was a lot of outside investors coming into the region, buying multifamily housing, and raising rents. Um, you know, and you know, the feeling is that that speculation is related to the casino, and, and this comes out in a few of the different um, quotations that we put on there from different people. Um, then a related issue to all of this that we don't have any secondary data on, but we thought that it was worth kind of mentioning it because it's really on the minds of a lot of people, are things like, you know, the displacement um, from housing units and the prospect of evictions and our, you know, our anecdotal discussions Know, with people suggest that evictions are on the rise. And again, I stress we did not have access to actual data on this. Um, you know, the world can look very different from different perspectives. <laughs> but, but there is at least some anecdotal evidence that they see kind of evictions rising, at least by looking at housing court records. And, um, and there's certainly a lot of concern among public representatives of, of that issue. So that's about what we are able to say at this current point about evictions. Um, the, the lag in that data is really fast. I'm going to go through and, commercial and, impacts and a little bit more have quickly. To know, oh, you have, have a question? You have to know whether the eviction, what the causation of the evictions were, but they're suggesting that it is gentrification. I but think that that's, that would, it, they, it doesn't say, but that would be my assumption. Maybe, I don't know if. Is that fair? Could, is, <laughs> Dr. Volbuk was actually involved in a lot of these interviews, and maybe she has a little bit of insight. And I understand you yeah. don't have enough data, but yeah, the uh, so the the comments from both um, Liz Busey uh, from uh, Arise for Social Justice and from uh, Catherine Ratte, who's the principal planner for the uh, Planning Commission, um, their assumption is that this is a um, a, a speculative um, effort to um, basically move people out of downtown who have been there for a long time and then, you know, sort of upgrade the properties and then rent them out at market rates. There was, there was quite a bit of discussion in both of those uh, interviews that we did um, and, and in the others as well about, you know, this feeling that, um, you know, the city of Springfield understandably wants to um, have, you know, market rate um, housing downtown to revitalize the area. Um, but the challenge for the city, I think, is that in the, 
in the process of, um, you know, encouraging economic development, um, there is this sense that people are being pushed out who have been downtown for a long time, but who can no longer afford those rents. And if I can offer something here, I think that's one of the really powerful things about the totality of this research going forward is to continue to track this. There is a um, temperature within real estate markets in Massachusetts, particularly urban ones, that there is a deep feeling that this is happening. Now, whether or not it actually is statistically is another question, you know, but I think because you're seeing a state where housing prices are so high and because uh, unemployment rates are so low and there's been a lot of attraction to urban environments that <clears throat> people who are native to that community are already, are, are the pumps primed already feeling like are, are the wolves at the door for my community? We've seen it in other places, right? So I think it's an important thing to get that sense of talking to folks, you, using the secondary data to see the trends, but then talking to folks and supplementing it, which is a part of our work, but to continue to track it. Because it's interesting to read these quotes, and then our group also worked on the Greater Boston Housing Report Card with the Boston Foundation, and the degree to which those same conversations you're hearing with folks in Roxbury, right? right, right sure. uh, in very different real estate markets, but then they are urban areas that, you know, are, are have these elements of up and comingness and this fear of gentrification, right? So, um, so I think in a ways we're speculating about the about the, about the speculation, but uh, <laughs> but but at the same time, I think it's an important part of uh, what what the power of a of a multi year research study brings to you because it allows you to cre to create data over time that you couldn't otherwise do. Right. And, and oh, go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I just want to sort of um, add to that that. Um, you know, there's, um, there's an opportunity here if this is an early warning sign. Um, and, and it, you know, it, it, what I think of key informant interviews as is really the canary in the coal mine. If you'll pardon the analogy, it's, it's really like, oh, did that bird stop chirping? <laughs> Should I be concerned? Um, it's, uh, it, it, it indicates the possibility of an issue that the city of Springfield and I think the state of, of Massachusetts might have an opportunity here to sort of begin discussions before there's a really huge problem to sort of say, well, what do we as a commonwealth want to do about this issue if it is up and coming? I interrupted, but thank you. That, I'm that's really here to answer your questions. So thank you. It's not an interruption. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, don't, don't feel bad about stopping me. All right. Where was I? Oh, yeah. Oh, so, so yeah, I mean, so there's at least, you know, some, some discussion about, you know, the evidence of eviction. You know, I, again, you know, I'm a very cautious researcher. You know, I know as a methodologist that you have to be also, you know, that while anecdotal data can can indicate things before you notice them in the data that ultimately the two things, you know, can work complementary to one another because, you know, as I think Mark was alluding to, one person's perspective on like, hey, the casino opened up and then my rent went up, it must be the relation, it must be the casino. When the actuality is that they don't know the world outside of the casino from the 1,000 foot level that the data allows you to see um, that rents have gone up a lot of places. So um, commercial impacts were really not, well, we're seeing something, but it's, it's hard to say, I think, at this point, um, what, what's related to the casino. So this is basically showed, showing kind of the change in commercial rentable bu building area. Um, and everything's indexed, so it's really kind of just showing the trends on these three different areas that we're comparing. Now, the interesting thing about this is that the trend's been an upward trend you know, since basically the recession, which isn't that surprising, that there's been more RBA, as we would say, kind of, you know, being put on the market. And because, you know, commercial real estate, you know, tends to be, again, you know, uh, you know office buildings and things like that, you know, so it's kind of lumpy, the, the trends, you have to be very careful. If, if you look at the, you know, the line that we have for the MGM Springfield opened, that jump, that's the MGM Springfield. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Your report showed that. So now that that's opened, right, 
it'll be interesting to see what that trend will be like after. But you can't really count the opening. It's like, oh yeah, there's a lot more RBA on the market. It was because of the casino, right? So we have to wait a little while. But the trend is at least positive, you know. Um, I wondered when I read your full report if there was a way to extract that and to know. I'll have to ask my colleague Tom, who did a lot of the data drudgery on yeah. the commercial side. Um, Cause I, I think don't, that off the top of my head, I don't think or, so. Or, sure. Yeah. Maybe. Or I wondered if, you know, it was really the bulk, yeah. it probably was the bulk of the, the um, yeah. construction. Yeah. So but that will, that will be largely a one-time deal. Yeah. Too. Yes. I understand. Yeah. That. Um, Here's industrial, right? So, so honestly speaking, as an economic development person, I'm not really expecting industrial to be all that directly related to the casino. At least directly related. If the overall, you know, over a long arc of time, if economic conditions improve in Springfield and improve in the region, which, you know, the casino might be part of that, then you might see more, you know, industrial activity going on. But it's, it's too removed of an actual use from my taste, to, to see a, a lot of like conceptual correlation between these things. But you do see a bump. That bump is largely from um, the, the rail uh, factory oh. that opened up in Springfield at that same time. Those two major employers, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so again, it's another reason why you have to be very careful um, you know, kind of looking at these bumps and looking at the timing events and, you know, just purely attributing things because there's other things going on. Um, so, commercial vacancy rates. This is, um, you know, again, we kind of see this, this, you know, they're dropping, which is a good sign for recovery, but it's pretty consistent. Um, it seems like a lot of the secondary kind of outside of the casino activity might be coming online. Uh, in conjunction more with the, the post-construction period. So we'll continue monitoring this one, um, you know, and the trends. So the, the trends are favorable, um, but, but, you know, generally consistent with what we're seeing elsewhere. So it's hard to make a very firm association. Um, office lease, lease rates, really pretty stable. Um, Non-office commercial lease rates, um, <laughs> this, this one's a little bit jumpy, but, you know, we, we're kind of seeing, you know, a match between Springfield and the surrounding communities, um, you know, in, in terms of the timing of this in, in 2018. So, anyway, this activity, I, I think most of the comments really are kind of, you know, and this is to kind of be expected at the time that we are doing interviews is really at the very, very beginning of the operations. And so people are starting to notice, like, you know, the construction is done, the streetscaping is in, they're noticing more pedestrian activity in and around the casino. There's a little bit of discussion about how far that activity is spread from casino and somewhat of a general uncertainty of whether or not it's spilling over into a lot of businesses that are outside of the immediate kind of casino in the district. But again, I think one person said, but we'll wait and see what happens in the summer. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. um, you know, so our anecdotal information is that, you know, that there's more foot traffic in and around the area on, you know, the, the you know, some noticeable improvements in the streetscaping, some noticeable improvements in, you know, pedestrian volume, nothing, um, you, you know, that, that, you know, nothing, not a, not a huge tremendous difference with the exception of particular events, um, like, you know, I've talked to people that say, like, well, you know, the food truck Fridays, there's a lot of people, you know, kind of walking around downtown, and it definitely seems like there's more lines um, at some of the restaurants at lunchtime than there ever used to be before, you know, at some of the, 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 the ancillary businesses. I'm not, I'm not as concerned about the ones within the casino. I'm, in, I'm more concerned about what's going on in the area around as a planner. You know, like, does it spark economic development beyond that particular place? Is it a spread effect or a backwash effect would, mm -hmm. would be what I would be concerned about. Um, and so, you know, it's still very, very early to tell, but there's definitely, you know, a lot of people think that it feels like more lively downtown, at least immediately around the casino. <clears throat> That's my 
summation of you know what these different you know kind of quotes really tell me. Um, and I, as always, I took up probably more time than I um, wanted to or needed to, but I'll be happy to answer any other questions before I turn over to Rob. Are there any more slides, Henry? Yeah. Um, well, <laughs> related to, to quality yeah. of life, um, you know, which is part of my interpretation of kind of the vibrancy of the streetscape and, and the area. Henry, I would just yeah. suggest in, in, in the folks, those canaries in the coal mine that Rachel mentioned, I like stakeholder interviews better. Um, you know, going beyond some of the folks that you've listed who are primarily focused on the housing side and think about think about a Tim Sheehan who obviously has had um, some of the commercial development experience or the chamber just to kind of broaden that mix of voices that you're talking to, especially on the commercial Yeah, and if I could offer side. as part of the uh, research uh, agenda that we propose going forward, uh, there would be a robust st stakeholder engagement exercise that coupled with the real estate. Because again, the data lags in real estate relative to what the feelings on the ground are could be a little bit different. And for us, it's kind of bringing those two things together as context. So part of the, the crowd that we're, we're talking about talking with are developer types and those kinds of things to, to get that sense from them. That's great. Yeah. There was a couple of uh, slides on the conclusions. Do you feel you already touched um, on them? Um, the, the conclusion is kind of, you know, my, my recap, if, if you want me to really go over it, you know. Um, right now, we can't really say that it's had, you know, what I would describe it as a limited direct impact on the residential real estate market in Springfield and the surrounding communities, but we don't really have post-opening data to look at. So we're really just talking about, you know, the kind of thing, you know, you know, the the period between the award and the opening, which is more of the domain of speculators than the domain of the kind of long-term economic development that comes from investments in an area that then transforms it more incrementally and over a longer time period. That's the kind of thing that we really want to pay attention to going forward. You know, are there increasingly businesses opening and are they spreading further from the casino, do we continue to see a sustained increase in the amount of foot traffic going on? You know, our rents, you know, you know, God forbid the real estate market slows down, but it will eventually, you know. So what happens in that kind of a market, you know, um, as you go forward, you know, um, the things change. And I think, I think Mark did an excellent job kind of pointing this out at the beginning that we're really moving into an entirely new phase. A lot of the big economic impacts I don't really expect during the, um, you know, the award phase, the construction, construction phase, other than, you know, the, what he'll be talking about. It, it's it's more of the, the, the spillover development that comes from transforming an area which even in the, I mean, this is a large employer in, in, in you know, a, a confined area. So there is a potential that there's noticeable impacts in the short run, but it's really more of the ones that come from the, the community transformation uh, are more of the things that to me kind of are the, really the hallmark of development, you know, so. Successful, <clears throat> Successful development or, right. you know. Um, so, so, you know, moving forward we have, you know, there's a lot of interesting things to look at. Let me just put it that way. Um, and um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Um, the last slide is, oh, sorry. I keep thinking that's the last slide. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the commercial spinoff development range is relatively limited. The spinoff commercial development, we've heard discussions earlier today about some new things going in, see whether or not that kind of continues and spreads into things that are much clearly unrelated to the casino. Um, and to me, the geographic spread is also very interesting. And so this is what I thought my last slide was, which is our acknowledgement of all of our, the people that, um, that, that took time to talk to us, and we're very thankful for their insights. Um, okay, so I guess I'll turn it over unless there's another question. Well, or I just more want to say I, I, I read yeah. the full report and appreciated the PowerPoint, but I thought the full report was very accessible, and, and I, th I think it's very interesting, but I understand. Stay tuned. Oh, yeah, well, because I wrote it, and then 
somebody else rewrote it and made it more accessible. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the Don Hewitt. It was all known. The report, the full report, was very, everything was very accessible. So thank you. Well done. Well, thank You're you. Well I done. appreciate that. Very well. Yeah. Can I just say, I, um, I came to a uh, meeting in May where you have, uh, for members of the community, you had the preliminary uh, presentation a version of these, but it was really preliminary findings. Uh, but some members in the community were really interested, and there, what you alluded to and spoke to directly uh, in some cases, the feeling or the fear uh, by homeowners that the rents are increasing, and it's all and it's probably due to the casino because of their proximity in terms of time, is really out there, and that's a local concern that is important for us to continue to think about, and, and um, it's clear that you are and to continue to look at with data to corroborate or not. Yeah. But you're, haven't you found that in a lot of your um, stakeholder interviews that people really are positive about the, the benefits of the casino? Um, my, maybe I'll turn that over to you. I'll, 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 yeah. She raised her hand. Oh, Dr. Meth. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Rachel and I conducted and they spanned a lot more than just real right. estate, mind you. Yeah. I think it depends on the, the person's position as to what they're saying their interest. So, right. Um, you know, when we spoke to folks that were, you know, more about the housing and economic justice, right, they were a little bit more critical in terms of economic development and gentrification and what can we do, you know, so economic development doesn't necessarily have to go hand in hand with displacement. What can, what can we do to make sure that this is done justly? Um, mm -hmm. uh, from... The, the municipal perspective. They were also concerned with that, but a little bit more just generally, a little more positive. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think it depends on where the stakeholders yeah. sat. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty universal truism, to be quite honest. You know, as a former economic development official, before I returned back to ac academia, you know, our expression was always that you shoot at anything that flies and you kind of claim anything that falls. Um, <laughs> you know, so, so, uh, you know, if you see a new building going up, yes, it's related to this thing that we wanted to happen, you know, and then there's a, a, a counter to that, too, you know. I, um, uh, about a year ago, I was on a, um, just a couple of months after this had opened, and I, I had my niece on a college tour at Springfield College, and they were, they were, they were very, uh, obviously they're trying to impress parents and prospective students, but they were touting all the benefits of, we have more interns, walk, you know, uh, internships for our students now because of this. You know, go down. Uh, we want you to go to the city and see what the casino has done. The streets have been repaved, the other restaurants. So I was kind of amused at how they were um, touting the benefits to parents and prospective students, you know. So I guess the city is has been in a place where, you know, this is something new and, and it is bringing... Um, bringing some positives anyway. So I, I just wondered if you were f hearing that, but it is where you sit, right? There were, there were some, some of the interviews, and I'm not sure if they actually made their reports, um, but there was definitely like a lot of people that mentioned, you know, kind of a positive buzz is mm -hmm. maybe the best way to describe mm -hmm. it, that it's like, well, I'm not really sure, but it feels like Springfield's kind of on the rise, you know, and, and I think Mark alluded to, but we are also entering a period where um, more broadly, you know, urbanism is, you know, seen as generally favorable by larger populations, especially younger people, mm -hmm. you know, whereas past generations, you know, it's like, oh, you know, you make it by getting out of the city. Right. Um, you know, so, so there's, there's a number of different trends that might be confluencing and the casino, you know, and the streetscaping that's related to the casino and the related developments that the city is putting forward, you know, that these, these things do accumulate and create, you know, um, I think a generally a, a, you know, a favorable, you know, that, oh, this, you know, that mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're moving on and moving out and we're up and coming, you know, kind of things. So that, that did, I think, come across in a few of the interviews, if, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mark, will you be introducing our next speaker? I, I'll let, uh, go ahead. Henry, okay. Oh, we have, Rod? Oh, do I, wait, do I have to click through all the, 
He's gonna go oh straight. Oh my gosh. Oh, what happened? This is the real estate? Hold on. Yeah. <laughs> it's not slides, it's a PDF packet. Yeah, it's, oh, it's okay. the commissioner's okay. packet. All right, we shall, <laughs> okay. we shall arrive shortly. Speed early. through. <laughs> okay. Do you want to introduce yourself, yes, though? I will. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I am Rod Motamity. I am a uh, senior research manager at the UMass Donahue Institute. Uh, my background is in economic impact modeling, uh, and that's what we're going to be talking about. Uh, what I'm going to be talking about mostly here today is the economic impacts of the construction of MGM Springfield. Mm -hmm. um, given that I know everyone's favorite thing to do after a Carby lunch is to look at charts and graphs, and anticipating that, I have tw about a dozen more of them for you. <laughs> Get ready to sleep. Get ready. But they're colorful. Uh, um, so first, uh, a little background on the property. Um, the construction period was roughly from March 2015 through August 2018. Uh, that construction period is going to differ from the payment schedule that we're going to look at because the payment started a little bit after the construction began and they continued a uh, pass when uh, the property opened. There was also some construction, some punch list items that continued after a uh, property opening date, but those are pretty small. Uh, this is the Commonwealth's first integrated resort casino. Um, subsequently, Encore has opened, um, but uh, we were pretty eager to look at the construction impacts uh, of this property, uh, given that we had only previously looked at uh, Plain Ridge Park, and we expected to see uh, quite a bit uh, different scenario here. Uh, another thing that we were curious about, um, I think the more extent to uh, analyzing the operations of MGM Springfield is that it's an urban casino in the middle of a downtown. And not only is it in the middle of a downtown, it is integrated into that downtown. And that differs from uh, even MGM's other urban casinos. Uh, MGM Detroit um, is a, a, mono, yeah, a monolithic building um, in the middle of downtown. It doesn't feel integrated into the city, um, whereas this is, as we all know, uh, very kind of open and integrated. So we are curious to see how that pans out uh, in the operation, and uh, we were curious to see what it would look like in the construction as well. The last thing I wanted to point out on the background is we are looking specifically at construction that is different than investment. So the property's total investment far exceeds their construction budget. Uh, the, in addition to construction, they have furniture, fixtures, and equipment. They have contingency. They have design costs. They have permitting fees. They have the cage cash and operating capital and working capital. All that's part of their total investment. We are just looking at the construction. So the, I wanted to clarify. Um, once we get to the total numbers, uh, you'll see why I wanted to clarify that. So let's talk about the data. We've uh, talked quite a bit. Um, on our team about how we have worked with the licensees to access their primary data. Uh, this report and this project wouldn't have been possible without that relationship with MGM to get their construction data. Uh, they're the only ones who know what they're spending money on, so we have to you know, get it from them. Um, and they're very help helpful in the process. Um, in the interest of time uh, to get this report out as soon as possible, um, we at the Donahue Institute, along with the folks at MGM, along with the research team at uh, the MGC, we had a call all together in, I think it was January or February, that um, we would get draft data um, so we could get the data quicker and we could get this report out quicker. Uh, and I say that because in some cases, you'll see the data that we're going to present here differs from some of the numbers that have subsequently come out or may subsequently come out from MGM. Uh, and that's because we took a snapshot in time as of about March in order to get this data ready for today. And they have obviously had plenty of time to um, do final audits on some of those things or do the, uh, final versions. And so there is some difference on the data. That being said, in preparation for this presentation, we went through with the MGM construction folks and we reconciled all of our data differences. So where there are differences, we know why there are differences. It all reconciles to the final versions. Uh, so. Um, there isn't, uh, we've resolved any uh, errors or misclassifications of things, so anything that differs between us and them is merely different snapshots in time. Um, that process actually went on until just this Tuesday, um, <laughs> and so there's actually a data point here that, that's in your packets um, and in the executive summaries that you have that will differ in our final report that comes out. We found a million more dollars for Springfield, so. <laughs> I didn't think anybody would be upset about that, but uh, there it is. <laughs> uh, the data that came to us, uh, Indian Orchard messed us up. Uh, there was a, uh, a contractor whose address was Indian Orchard, and when we summed for Springfield, that obviously didn't make it into our Springfield sum, so no. and, and we found it later. Um, 
<laughs> so uh, the data that came to us was the closeout statement. So every contract that MGM had with their contractors, when that contract was finished, when that contractor had finished doing all the things that they were obligated to do, a closeout statement was issued uh, that had within it the zip code of the company, the total contract value, any subcontractors that that company had, the payment schedule, uh, that company's diversity metrics, whether a woman, minority, or veteran-owned business, and then the workers that that company employed, where those workers lived, uh, at least their zip code, uh, the workers' diversity metrics, and total hours and total wages. So we had all of this data, and using all this data, we were able to create the uh, kind of cross-tabulations and the impacts that uh, uh, we will see here today. To give you a sense of the scale, we had well over 200 closeout, individual closeout statements that came to us from MGM that we uh, combined for this purpose. Obviously, a project of this uh, scale and complexity uh, is going to have a bunch of components to it, sort of mini projects within the larger project. And because these same names appear here uh, again and again throughout this presentation in our final report, I want to just take a brief moment to tell you what they mean. The hotel slash podium slash armory that's essentially everything that went into the building that people would consider MGM Springfield. Uh, that was the foundations, putting up the walls, everything that went into that building, and then the renovations on the armory. I'm going to skip over enabling for a second. Garage is pretty self-explanatory. It's the garage. The daycare and the church, again, pretty self-explanatory. MGM Springfield built a daycare. Uh, that's the activity related to that. And the church is moving and renovating the church that was on the, the site. Off-site improvements are almost all essentially roadway improvements that happened uh, around the property to get everything ready. Signage, all interior and exterior signage. Uh, and then the two State Street projects and the Union project, those were existing buildings that were renovated and integrated, retained and, uh, and integrated into the overall property. Lastly, enabling, that is all of the activities that are required to enable all this other stuff to happen. So that included Sur site surveying, uh, site prep, uh, demolition, underground utility work, uh, site security, all of that stuff is rolled up uh, under enabling. So here's a timeline of uh, the project. Total construction budget, or total construction spending rather, was $573 million and some change. Um, that was divided across these categories and it was spent sort of across this pattern. You can see the bulk of the activity uh, happened in kind of 2017. That's when really the work began on putting up the hotel and associated things. You can see that on the left, we begin with enabling, then the garage comes in, then we start foundation work and so on on the hotel, then we do some of the existing buildings, and then towards the end is the all else, daycare, church, offsite improvement, signage, uh, et cetera. Oh, and sorry, the monthly average you saw there was uh, 12.7 million. So here's the spending by component. Not surprisingly, the hotel podium armory component was the bulk of the project budget, 70% of the total, followed by the garage. Uh, and then enabling was a surprisingly large chunk. You know, it was the piece that was uh, required for everything else, and so it was a, a prominent part of the spending. Together, the hotel, the, so the building, the main building, the garage and enabling were well over 90% uh, of the total budget. Let me know if I'm going too fast. I just, you know, they just wanted to do this. Slow down. Slow down. I don't think I'm going too fast. <laughs> uh, so let's talk about some of the finer numbers now. Uh, and here I will slow down. Um, so this was spending by county in Massachusetts. Uh, given that we had the, the spending by contract, we were able to allocate them uh, accordingly. First things, that, there's two things I want to point out on either extreme. The, the most of the contracts in Massachusetts um, went to companies based in Hamden County. On the flip side of that, there were no contracts awarded to companies on the Cape and Islands. Not entirely surprising, they're kind of far away. Um, and in between that, it actually has kind of a long tail. So if you look at $194 million in Hamden County contracts, the next largest recipient of contracts um, was, I think, Worcester County, or Suffolk County at 63 million, it's not on the graph. Suffolk County at roughly 64 million, followed by Worcester County at 54 million. So that drop off is pretty steep. Uh, so there's this big bulk uh, here at, uh, at Hamden and then kind of er and everybody else. Overall, uh, roughly $374 million of the total construction budget remained in Massachusetts. So that's two thirds. Um, and so two thirds 
was a total construction budget was in Massachusetts, and uh, I had that number here somewhere. Uh, then basically the bulk, about two thirds of the Massachusetts spending was in Hamden County. I wanted to point out the Suffolk County one just for a minute. Um, Suffolk County tends to, uh, tends to be high on the list, one because it's sort of the hub of commerce and a lot of stuff transits through there. Um, but uh, one, of the, one of the primary general contractors um, was based in Suffolk County, and so um, given that that's where their corporate office is, that's where the address of, the, of those payments were. In terms of the Hamden County contracts, uh, I looked at some of them by their category, and some of the, the prominent items for Hamden County were electrical, infrastructure, plumbing, HVAC, masonry, and site security. Those are some of the, the prominent, uh, sort of by dollar figure items uh, that, were, that were Hamden County contracts. We can zoom in here to uh, the zip codes of the host and surrounding communities. The value that I wanted to mention that will change, you see Springfield there is 83.96 million. Um, the new value for that is 84.9. So that was that Indian Orchard contract that uh, we, uh, we rolled in there. So in the final version of this report that we will, we will be coming out shortly, we will, this will all be updated. When, when you do the final, can you supply the Suffolk County number too, please? Yes, the, uh, I will. Um, the report uh, has below this a table of all this broken I out. See. The labels wouldn't fit on the map. I can try Thanks. to fix them, but uh, I thought the table compromise would be would be I good. It's in the report. It is in the report. Yeah, yeah, there's a table 60, below this. There's a way to do a line even yeah. if it enough. I will look at that for sure. Yeah, six, but it was 63? 63.9 million. Oh, yeah. so 64. Uh, as we have the same problem here with the uh, host and surrounding community zip codes. We don't have room to label all the individual zip codes, so we have a table below it in the final report that, that um, articulates all of this. Thank you. Um, so if there's a specific zip code that you have a question about, I actually have all of those here in front of me. Um, but the, I think the big takeaway here is that we have, um, again, that total for the host and surrounding community should be about a million higher, so 176.4 million is a total for the host and surrounding communities and then roughly 85 million for Springfield. So the host and surrounding communities are about 91% of the Hamden County contracts. They're about half, almost a little bit under half of the total for Massachusetts and about a third of the, of the total uh, construction budget. So what we found was that there was this interesting um, effect with proximity, that the closer you got to the site, um, you had these higher proportions. So bulk of the construction spending was in Massachusetts, the bulk of Massachusetts spending was in Hamden County, and the bulk of Hamden County spending was in the host and surrounding communities, and even within that, the bulk was in Springfield. Uh, so as you, you know, within, uh, within every layer, the closer you got to the casino, you had the higher proportional share. So the other side of that story is that outside of uh, Massachusetts, um, there isn't a whole lot of uh, stuff going on in the other states. So Roughly 34, uh, sorry, 374 million was in Massachusetts. The next biggest was Connecticut. At, I'm going to round these up. So 94 million. Um, and most of what happened, uh, most of the contracts for Connecticut were for precast concrete and structural steel. And then there was a pretty uh, steep drop off thereafter. You'll look there on the legend. The lowest value is $20,000. So one of those states, I don't remember which one. I received total contracts with only $20,000, so a specialized item that happened to come from somewhere else. And again, a very long tail. If, you know, um, well into 400 million of the 500 million was from just Connecticut and Massachusetts, the rest of that stuff is, is pretty small. There was $12 million <laughs> that's not shown on this graph uh, that uh, went to Canada. One of the things I did want to point out is that our data only allowed us to look at the first order effects of the suppliers. So, uh, MGM Springfield could tell us who their electrical contractor was, but we don't know who the electrical contractor bought their wiring from or who the drywall installer uh -huh. bought the drywall from. That's not a, a layer that we have access to, um, which is one of the benefits that we got from the economic modeling, which we'll get to. Uh, the economic modeling um, has these supply chains built into it so we can get a better sense of um, what leaks out of the state due to these supply chain effects. Shifting gears from the location of the spending, uh, we get to the spending um, by the company diversity criteria. So here, about one-third of contracts by value 
um, were awarded to companies that met one of the diversity criteria. Uh, leading that was uh, women-owned companies, followed by minority and then uh, veteran-owned businesses. So shifting gears entirely from spending, uh, we get to the workers and wages. Um, I struggled mightily with how to present this stuff, and so I thought, you know, I'll just write it, and then we'll, we'll, we'll go with it that way. Um, so we, uh, in the closeout statements that we had, if you counted each individual worker line, uh, we had 5,686 workers. However, we uh, figured out very early in the process that there's a lot of duplicates in there, in the sense that the same contract, the same company, uh, was on multiple contracts. So there would have been multiple contracts for, you know, Rod Motamity Construction, and they would have hired pretty much the same crew. Rod Motamity. Right, Rod Motamity over and over again to, to work on those contracts. So we went through and we deduped um, the workers, uh, assuming that if your name, your race, ethnicity, and your veteran status was the same, you were the same person. Um, so we specifically excluded the zip code because we thought, what if you had moved during this process or something? Um, but we figured if you had the same name, race, uh, and veteran status, you, you were the same. So and you gender. and gender, right? And, and so using <laughs> and gender, um, and so using that logic, um, we uh, found that roughly 1,400 people um, worked on multiple contracts uh, were duplicated, and so that leaves the 4,250 uh, that you see there. So that's our best estimate of the non-duplicative uh, number of workers. Um, we, we found about 2.6 million total hours of work, and these workers were compensated $173 million for that. Looking at this in a couple different ways, if you take the total hours and you divide them by the number of hours in a full-time year, you get the full-time equivalents, uh, it's about 1,250. If you take uh, the total uh, number of hours and divide them by the workers, you get the average hours per worker, which works out to about 15 full-time weeks on average. Uh, which is actually, um, that seems, I don't know if to some people that might seem a little, but that's not that unusual for construction. Uh, the trades come in and out of the site as needed, so no one's going to be there for, um, well, very few people are going to be there for the entire three years or, or something. The electricians come in when they need the electricians, and then they go when the electricians are done. Um, and then the average hourly compensation per worker was pretty close to 66 and a half cents um, per hour, or sorry, $66.50 per hour. Uh, I want to take one moment and just focus on the word compensation. That is different than income. Um, we're pretty sure this includes the value of benefits, too, um, because you, as a, uh, if you're bidding on a project, you would bid the total cost of your workers, not just what you pay them. So, um, we th we're, so that's, uh, that is total compensation, not merely the wage uh, that was uh, given to the workers. We looked at the host and surrounding community hours, and sorry for the, the misspelling, that should be compensation. Um, Something that we had a, a hunch about in the PPC project was that um, the folks who lived closest to the construction site earned more. We saw that in the PPC project, but we didn't have hours um, worked uh, for that project. We had here. So our, our supposition for, for PPC was that it, the, you, you earned more by living closer because you worked more hours, not necessarily because you had a higher average uh, hourly wage. Um, and that's basically what we had, did end up finding here. Um, so we did, we found that if you take the data from the previous slide and you take that hourly wage and turn it into a, uh, an average per worker, it works out to $40,700 in uh, compensation uh, for your average worker. So you see here that both for Springfield and surrounding communities, their average uh, was considerably higher than that. Um, but you'll see that their average hours worked were also considerably higher than the 612 from the previous slide. Um, we uh, think this logic actually makes sense uh, in the sense that the construction workforce, the occupational skills of this workforce, is pretty similar across the state. You're not going to import someone from Eastern Mass to come, you know, help you build the foundation or do your wiring or plumbing in Springfield when the construction trades in this area will know how to do that work just fine. But the only re the reason you'd bring someone from far away on a construction site is because they have some kind of specialized skill, and then you would anticipate that they would get paid more. So that was the logic that we went into this with, and, and that's basically what we seem to have found. Rod, how's, uh, do you remember how is that different from PPC, given that it's a very different community? Or was that uh, mitigated because it was more of a region down there? 
and so the pat this pattern of earnings was the same. The closer yeah. you were to the construction site, the higher earnings. Um, but we think it's because it was more hours, but we didn't have hours in the data set. Oh, for that's PPC. right. You said so um, it was a supposition that we had that we were glad that we could finally test. Mm -hmm. um, and so we don't have any reason to think that would be otherwise mm -hmm. uh, for PPC, um, especially because they had not only access to the Southeast Mass um, labor market, but the construction labor market of uh, Rhode Island, which right. at that time still hadn't come back up to its pre-recession levels of employment. So there was plenty of idle construction labor 20 minutes away in Rhode Island that would have been um, perfectly available to, to work on PPC. Uh, so here are the number of construction workers by county. Uh, the same general pattern here holds that the closer you get to the site, the, the higher the, the, the percentage. So of the 4,250 uh, 4, workers that we found, um, 2,960 or so um, were Massachusetts residents, or 70%. Excuse me. Of the Massachusetts total, just about half were Hamden County residents. Uh, and you can see the same kind of long tail here. You go from 5,400 workers to 300 and some odd for your next highest. So again, that, that proximity uh, drop off is pretty, uh, pretty steep. Just having trouble with the graphic of the state. Oh, because the Cape and the Islands aren't there? Oh, yeah. Well, they sorry. are, though, but that's not really the Cape and the Islands. So I'm just curious, what is the bottom part of that graph? Oh, that's the islands. Sorry, that's the confusing part. The, the, or, the, the two is uh, Barnstable, yeah. and then the gray on the bottom are like the shape outlines of Dukes and Nantucket. Okay. But, so, but you were, were you just trying to get it on the slide, which is why they don't look? Yeah, that's, it's like, the, like it, they would. Excuse me. It doesn't look like Massachusetts. It doesn't look like Massachusetts yeah. the Cape. And so what I'm saying yes. is it, it, the reality is with some of these, there should be nothing on the Cape, and it's Correct. Just not reflected. Yeah, so gray, gray is nothing. Image. Yeah, gray is nothing, and that weird shape at the bottom uh, those two grays. I don't know if there's are, a way to clarify that in the final version in terms of um, I will making it more visually obvious, I guess. Yeah, um, I will. Both in the one where they have nothing and then both in the one where they have two. Yeah, I will look into that. This is the shape file that we had, so I'll look into a different, either a different shape file or better labeling or something like yeah. that. Yeah, I think what's I'm running right interference, to. though, is that some of the shape files, uh, <clears throat> some of the census tracts actually are in the water uh, for the ones that are that border. Um, uh, the border of the ocean. So I think that that's probably some of the, what we're seeing there. So we, we can look into that. Yeah, so Dukes County includes like the, what is it, the Elizabeth, the Elizabeth the, the Islands. And so that you have that, that's where you have that weird tail at the bottom. And then, um, and so Grosnold and those things are all in Dukes County. But yeah, well, I'll, yes. Yeah, no, so the rest <laughs> of it is proportionally accurate. Yes. So when it shifts, it just looks a little yeah. odd. We'll try to find a way to make that look better. I agree. Um, any other questions on this, or should I move move on? Okay, so here are the workers by host and surrounding communities. Um, so recall that there were uh, 1,524 workers who reside in Hamden County. Of that, uh, 1,120 are host and surrounding communities. So again, about 70, almost 75 percent of the total uh, Hamden County uh, workers. So here again, the, the majority within the host and surrounding communities uh, are Springfield-based. These worker numbers aren't going to change. Uh, we had a, we were able to deal with these better, the, different than the, the company, so these, these should be right. Um, well, I, wanted, I want to point out here. Oh, one of the things I want to point out was the workers were more widely distributed than the, than the contracts were. So 91% of the Hamden County contracts were awarded to companies based in the host and surrounding communities. But 73% of the Hamden County workers were in the host and surrounding communities. And so that's not entirely surprising. The companies are gonna be a single point and their workers are gonna come from all over the place, not necessarily from the same city or town that the, the company is in. So we expected to see a, a wider dispersal um, of workers versus the company. So you'll see that even on the previous slide, uh, we actually had two workers who lived in Barnstable County, right. whereas there were no contracts uh, awarded to anything on the Cape and Islands. So now I want to get to a race and ethnicity of workers. Our general finding here um, for the various geographies that we looked at, whether we looked at uh, Massachusetts workers, uh, surrounding, com surrounding community workers, or in this case, we see on the slide, the host community workers, is that the 
race, racial and ethnic mix of the construction workers essentially reflected the population that they were drawn from. So statewide, 73% um, or so, roughly three quarters of all the workers were white. That's not terribly different from the, the composition of the state as a whole. If you look here for Springfield, you'll see that 38% uh, of the construction workers um, self-selected uh, self white or other for their race ethnicity. And you'll see the population as a whole, 35%. That's pretty much the same. Uh, so the share of minority workers and the share of minority population was also essentially the same. What we found uh, was the, that was a major difference was that um, the black population was overrepresented in the construction, struck construction uh, relative to their share of the population, and Hispanic workers were underrepresented in construction workers versus or compared to their share of the population. I think that attributed we, to language issues? Or? One of the things that we tried to attribute it to, and unfortunately couldn't, was let's look at a different representative population. What if the population we looked mm -hmm. at were people who claim their occupation as construction? Because maybe that population is in fact more black and less Hispanic. Unfortunately, the margins of errors on that in the census data were so large that we didn't think it was it, terribly yeah. reasonable to use. Uh, so um, we haven't been able to investigate uh, other areas, whether it might be language barriers, whether it might be um, just training through the trades, Skill. if these are mainly union, have they come, you know, have they come up through the trades, or, or whether this is just reflective of whatever the, the, the um, construction population is. I think part of that is this next slide, this is very much reflective of what the occupation, the construction occupations are like. Um, we found a, a pretty small share of female workers, um, and we know that Springfield is not 87% male, um, but we know obviously that's more representative of what the construction trades look like. Nevertheless, uh, you're actually twice as likely to be female if you were from um, Springfield as if, uh, than if an average Massachusetts worker. Unfortunately, twice as likely means you went from 7 to 13%, um, but it's still a big improvement. One of the things I did want to point out was this, um, give you some context, Boston has had a 10% target for uh, female representation on uh, construction projects uh, for a long time now. I think Mark can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they've rarely, if ever, uh, projects rarely, if ever, meet that target. So. Um, the MGC has had a program of uh, increasing female representation in the trades. I know the trades themselves have. So I think this is far more representative of um, a goal that has not yet been achieved uh, in terms of increasing the number of females in the trades rather than um, preferential hiring of men. It took a lot of effort, right, Jill? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> more about that later. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, uh, last year we have uh, veterans. So again, the share of, of, of uh, workers who um, identified as veterans, uh, pretty small, but again, uh, you are basically twice as likely to be a veteran if you're a Springfield resident uh, than if you were uh, an, the average Massachusetts worker. Okay, so now we'll get into the economic impact stuff. I wanna take just a brief moment to talk about economic models uh, and sort of what they are. They come off as kind of technical, esoteric, and black boxy to most people. Um, so I wanted to open a small window on that before we get into what we use them for. They work on the basic premise that at a very fundamental level, one person spending is another person's income. So MGM Corporation spent $573 million building MGM Springfield. That means their suppliers had $573 million worth of income. The suppliers then spent $173 million on, to compensate their employees, who then had $173 million worth of income, who then spent it on other things. A big chunk of that remainder between the 573 and the 173 uh, went to the suppliers of the vendors. They had to buy all of that physical st structure from somewhere, the concrete, the asphalt, the plumbing, the wires, the carpeting, it all had to come from somewhere. So those suppliers then have their own suppliers and their own employees who then have their own suppliers and their own employees. So what the economic models do is essentially try to capture all of that, these, this business to business chain of events and then the consumer chain of events. I have now got some money, I go spend it on rent and food services and uh, clothing and whatever. Um, and 
how do those businesses then benefit, and how do the how do they then benefit other businesses? So that's what the economic model tries to do. It is essentially a mathematical representation of all of these of all of these linkages. And the way it works is you introduce some kind of shock, some kind of change, which in this case is what if we built a casino in Springfield, uh, and then you see how that ripples through. So the key concepts that we're going to be talking about, the first is employment. Economic models consider employment to be kind of a roster count or a head count. It's not a count of employed individuals. Uh, company say, I have this many jobs. Company B says, I have this many jobs. Uh, and that's how many jobs there are, even, this, even though the same person might occupy one job here and one job here. It's really a, a count of jobs. Full-time, part-time, self-employed are all counted as one. Output is business revenue or business activity. Um, and value added is essentially output less the cost of all the things you had to buy to make your output. So if you think of a car, if GM sells a Corvette, the price of the Corvette is their output. Their value added is the price of the Corvette minus everything that they had to buy to make the Corvette, minus the steel, minus the wiring, minus the whatever. And pay. And pay. Uh, well, no, pay isn't uh, value added. Oh, okay. Yeah, pay because the, the workers oh, add value. But uh, so all of the stuff they bought from somebody else that came pre-made um, gets subtracted to get you value added. And the reason value added is important is that it actually represents uh, net new economic activity. So it's also called gross product. So if you hear gross state product, gross domestic product, that's value added, it's not output. Economic models have to be built around regions. In this case, we built six regions. You can see it's still the same shape file, so the weird Cape region persists. Um, but uh, we, so we have six regions uh, built around the existing economic and uh, sort of commuting uh, relationships uh, of the state. I think this is pretty self-explanatory for, for folks who are familiar with uh, the state. So employment impacts. Um, direct is MGM Springfield. Induced, or sorry, indirect is that business-to-business -business chain of events that I discussed, and induced is primarily that consumption-based um, chain of events. And so what you see here is if you look at the averages, 593 um, workers are the average number of workers uh, in a particular year, and that led to about 1,050 uh, total workers elsewhere in the state. So the difference between those uh, are workers who had nothing to do, people who have jobs and had nothing to do with building MGM Springfield. They weren't, uh, uh, they weren't on the site, they weren't employed by one of the companies working on the site. So they could have been suppliers of suppliers, they could have been Red Rose, you know, an increase in hiring of you know, wait staff at Red Rose or, or whatever it might have been. Uh, these are uh, all kind of new. Obviously these workers come with a paycheck, uh, so um, the state as a whole gained $397 million of net new, of, of new income versus the 173 that MGM directly paid. So again, that's a pretty big increase. What we found was that essentially for every dollar of compensation paid to construction workers, uh, there was an additional $1.30 of compensation, of, of income created in Massachusetts. So that was a, a, pretty, a pretty decent size impact. And if you look at the jobs, uh, it's basically, uh, I think it's 0.8. So 0.8 jobs for every one construction job. Rod, in these, uh, these numbers, the uh, employment um, totals, um, are these um, full-time equi equivalency? Uh, no, these would be a job. So it would be whether it's full-time, part-time, or self-employed. The, okay. the model looks at the, sorry, I'm moving away from um, my microphone. Um, no. the, mo the model looks at the, or considers <coughs> the average structure of a particular industry. So an industry like food services, where the majority of workers are part-time, you'll end up seeing a very low productivity. So the average labor productivity might only be 30,000 a year per worker um, or 50,000 per year per worker because that worker might only work 20, 25 hours a week. Uh, and so that structure, the average employment structure of each industry is built into the model. So you just put in a job as a job and don't have to worry about whether it's full-time, part-time uh, or self-employed. Uh, and so I have one final slide, uh, which is this. Uh, so we'll look at the economic uh, activity, the, again, the knock-on effects of that. So if you look at output first, cumulative output, you'll see in Massachusetts, 849 million. Recall that direct cons construction was 573 million. So that's 
a pretty substantial uh, bump there as well. I think it was 48, we found 48 cents of additional Massachusetts economic activity for every dollar of construction. So think about that in a way that's easier to understand. For every $2 that was spent on construction, $1 of additional economic activity was created in Massachusetts after accounting for leakage out of the state through importation of inputs, leakage out of the state through commuting, and leakage out of the economy through taxation and so forth. So even after accounting for all of that, uh, you're still getting a dollar of additional economic activity for every $2 uh, of construction spending. I think you lost me on that. Can sure. You just walk me through the chart a little bit, please. Okay. We'll look at the third column from the left, cumulative output. If you look at the Massachusetts row, we have $849 million of total output. Mm -hmm. So that is the total amount of business revenues uh, that were created in the economy as a result of building MGM Springfield. Of that 849, it's not shown on this chart, is the $573 million of total the total construction budget that MGM spent. So the difference between those, between 849 and 573, is the additional economic activity that was um, created uh, in, uh, in the state through, through these ripple effects and through these knock-on effects. And that 849 accounts for all the, the losses in the state's economy through importing goods and services from out of, out of Massachusetts, because when you import goods, you export money, so that money then leaves the state economy. Right. Um, commuting, if you import a worker, you export their wages to their home community. Uh, and then taxation. So taxation is also a, a, a leakage from current period economic activity. So uh, every time you pay a sales tax or a corporate income tax or, a, or so on, that is also uh, a leakage out of here. So even after accounting for all of that, uh, we still get 849 million from an input of 573 million. Was that, sometimes I get, uh, sometimes it's my version of simple is not simple. So if that, <laughs> when I've. I'm just wondering if maybe it needs to be on that page. First. Yeah, it seems that the, five, the yeah, 573 the, is. The 573 I will, it's right. it's yeah, I will split up. I'll have to split it up um, for every county because every county obviously has a portion. So I think I will do that. Um, perhaps just could, put yeah, that, Metro that Boston, construction vendors, you know, then additional Southeast construction vendors, then additional. I think it looks something like that. We'll, we'll play with different ways of demonstrating. This is the executive summary table. Sure, um, it was just me trying I, to follow. Yeah, no, no, I agree. Started high. Yeah, thank we you. Had, <laughs> we had to do an entire. Um, I think it was like an educational session where Rod came in and spoke with um, several of the commissioners to explain these concepts sort of behind closed doors. Um, they're not sort of intuitive, intuitively <laughs> graspable. Um, so it's certainly understandable that you would wonder what, what it actually is saying. I'm catching up. Yeah, e you. economists did a good job. Actually, we might have done that after the last time you were talking about these. For <laughs> yeah, I, I believe it was after. I yeah. believe it was after Rob Rod presented Rod, on yeah. um, EPC construction. And um, either Commissioner McDonald or McHugh. Commissioner McHugh. McHugh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, economists have done a good job of coming up with like a clubby language that uh, is, does not, that no one else understands, isn't terribly welcoming, and unfortunately I get caught up in it, so. But, uh, but the critically important part of it is, that is, is the spinoff effect, is that it's more than just the direct impact in the economy, that even with money you know, spinning out of state, there's this broader economic impact that has a broader benefit to people uh, than just the simple, hey, we had a bunch of construction workers who were here and built a building. Yeah, so in every region that we have here, the total, the total economic activity exceeds the value of construction contracts. So look, let's look at Cape and Islands, for example. They had cumulative $6 million of total economic activity as a result of the economic ripple flex. Recall they have $0 of direct construction contracts. So no contracts were awarded to any companies in the Cape and Islands, and yet the Cape and Islands saw $6 million of benefit cumulatively over this process, so an mm -hmm. annual average of a million dollars a year. Um, and that's why in your report you said that every county benefited. Or I think I read that. that was um, right, right. right. Through, but it was over out to them. Right, and it's through that spin. Yeah. You know, and which is, again, what the really important element of doing, in our opinion, the econometric modeling within a project like this. This isn't the only project where we do this kind of econometric modeling, but it is one of the bigger ones. 
and it's, you know, to talk about what is the economic benefit. It's, you know, hey, it's the construction worker, it's the business to business, it, it, it's, the, it's the building the building, it's the business to business, and then it's the person having money in their pocket and they go to the bar business after, and, and, and what that all does in the economy uh, to, uh, you know, again, to the benefit of, of folks in the community. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, at the end of the day, if all licenses envisioned in the legislation, enabling a legislation, are awarded, that's still four out of 351 cities and towns that would have a casino. So the question, you know, we, we look at is how are casinos creating economic opportunity for all residents of the Commonwealth, not just the people who reside in these four cities and towns. And so part of that is looking at where do the workers live and where are the companies, but the after that is, okay, then what happens? Even, even the places where the workers live and the co places where the companies are could still end up being a minority of cities and towns in the state. So we'd like to look at uh, how this sort of spreads er everywhere. Um, Thank you. Mm. I think that's good. So. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so then what's next? Um, so th this next slide is just to talk, just highlight some of the things that are coming. The real estate and the construction reports are will be released soon. This was an executive summary of what Rod had been working on. Uh, that'll be released uh, in, the, in, the, in the near term. Coming up in December, we'll be releasing the MGM lottery report, uh, which will look at lottery sales uh, locally uh, and how that's trended over time. Uh, we work closely with a professor at uh, Nevada, Reno, uh, Mark Nichols, uh, and, uh, and he's been doing that work with us for the last several years. Uh, so that comes out. Uh, in December, we're also going to do the latest operating report for PPC. Uh, in the operating report, what we look at is the uh, different than the construction report where we're looking at the impacts as they relate to the building the building, the operating reports are the operation of the casino. So in this case, what we're talking about is the dollars spent by the licensee, but then we're also taking into account um, uh, inter uh, activities by the patrons. So picking off patrons and, and asking again, as I joked earlier, how much money did you win or lose? Uh, did you spend money outside of the casino? Um, would you have gone somewhere else? And those are really important questions on impact because uh, a dollar spent at a Red Sox game or Encore, from the economy's perspective, we don't care, right? It's, it's money in the economy. The bigger question is, I wouldn't have spent money. I came here special. I would have gone to Mohegan Sun. Those are the kinds of things we want to kind of get at within there. And then in the spring of 2020, we'll be doing the MGM new employee survey. Uh, and, and in that, getting a sense, again, of who's been hired, where they're coming from. Uh, just as a highlight of a piece of information from PBC, we found that 50% of workers at, at PBC, when we did the first uh, new employee survey, were folks who were either unemployed or underemployed uh, at the time of, of being hired. Right, so those are the kinds of questions that we'll be able to answer this spring as we come out with the MGM. Um, and I know you're in discussions, you may be having these discussions as we speak, but um, when uh, uh, could we um, see the MGM operating, first operating report? Is there any, any timeline for that? Spring. Yeah, late spring okay. 2020. Yeah, we just started the data collection conversations uh, recently, so we're pretty early in the data collection process. Right. Okay, and this is, this is something that uh, we started to talk about with, Ma uh, with Mark relative to um, some of the priorities, some of the interest in the community, for example. Uh, even though you have a cadence to all of these reports, uh, MGM, in my opinion, the operations report is a more, more of a priority than, than, say, the PPC what is this, the second or the third year of the right. operations report? Right. The fourth. No, that's so, fair. Yeah. Yeah, I understood about the, the, the importance and sensitivity of it, but as Becky's saying, you know, this is, this is where you guys are very helpful in this situation for us, too, because, I mean, one is there's a lot of pressure points on the, uh, on the licensees, you know, because they're running a business, but then separate from that, we need them to give data to us. So there is a lot, and there's different ways in which data are provided. So there is that dance that's already built into it, but understood about the importance of getting those things out there quickly. But to the extent that we can always work closely with uh, others at the MGC and then uh, and with the licensees, uh, the quicker we get data, the quicker we can turn things around, so. And, and I think to pick up on that point, that translates, I think, 
Mark, where you've been focused is how can this research kind of translate for other stakeholders? So right. doing patron survey, what can that mean to the local tourism bureau of the city? You know, kind of who are the shareholders that are interested in what the actual results are? As right. Well? Right. No, that's an excellent point. And uh, mm -hmm. I think one that we should continue to discuss about, you know, one is the leverageability of different elements of the data and how that could be helpful to uh, different parts of the community. I think the other thing that we've been really sensitive to is trying to think more about um, the, the broadest reach possible out mm -hmm. of the information and, and, and that we are able to cre uh, create out of this project. Um, that includes you know, dashboards and infographics, but also trying to maintain that accessibility while having that, that, that academic and policy lens within the work and, and being sure that stakeholders of a wide variety, whether it be uh, you know, the, the um, Tim Sheehan's of the world or, you know, person who lives in Springfield and mm -hmm. is, just, like, is just worried about their community and wants to know. Uh, so I think that's something as this project continues to evolve, uh, particularly as we are, uh, as the industry matures within the marketplace, that there's a lot of opportunities for different ways of, of using this information and, and, and I think really at cutting edge in interesting ways. Excellent. Do we have any more questions for this panel? This has been, we, we're very, very happy to be able to have these presentations Great. today and, and how fortunate to be here in Springfield. So thank you. Thank you, I mean, thanks for, thank you for your patience on our timing today. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Great work. And now we are a quick break. No, we're, oh, really? Oh, okay. Are we just about done? Hmm? We only have one more. Oh, you're really uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> on a scale. Uh, we're going to uh, proceed with um, workforce, supplier, and diversity development. Uh, Director Griffin, please. Do we need, do you guys need to I'm good. <laughs> He's okay. He told me on a, on a scale to one to ten. Okay. You can turn evil. Okay. Thank you, Director Griffin, for your patience today. Uh, but very interesting report, so thank you. And it was very Crystal? interesting and, and very pertinent to this next topic. So, right. right. Um, You're looking at workforce supplier and de uh, development, diversity development, excuse me, and so, a special guest. Um, so commissioners, um, the next topic is our vendor spotlight. And I'm going to introduce um, to you, some of you know, um, Mr. Lamont Clemens, who's um, seated to my right. And um, Lamont is here rep representing Escello um, Painting Company. Um, and Escello is an MBE union painting company that um, um, had quite a bit of work on the MGM project. Um, they were a subcontractor working on the parking garage, 95 State Street. They also worked on the podium and the hotel. So I just wanted to really turn it over um, so you could see you know, firsthand, you heard about the research, but you could see firsthand some of the benefits. And so I'm gonna turn it right over to Lamont. Thank you, appreciate it. Uh, good afternoon, how you guys doing? Good. I just wanted to uh, thank you guys for, uh, for inviting me in and having me in. Uh, for First and foremost, I'll be thanking you guys for a few other things a little later on in, in my conversation. But I just wanted to start off with just like a background about uh, just ourselves, our company. Um, we are a family-owned company that's, been in, that's born and raised here in Springfield, Massachusetts. We've been here for about 34 years. Um, up until this point, we're doing, you know, small and medium-sized jobs. I would say we've had... Um, some, I would say one of our larger projects was probably about the size of the 95 State Street job alone for us here. So um, just to tell the magnitude of what the growth has been just predicated on, uh, on what has happened already um, here. So I'm, I'm one of uh, eight children, so it was a race to the cereal in the morning. <laughs> and uh, for, and uh, fortunately, uh, we had some parents that really instilled some incredible work ethic in us. And literally, our motto was the only place the success comes before work is in the dictionary. So we, uh, we were definitely had the, uh, 
had some great work ethic, which was great. Um, our only uh, our, our vehicle within that work ethic was obviously the painting company that my father had uh, had started. So that was the direction that I decided to go in with him, and it's been a very very incredible journey. Um, I would say up to uh, up to uh, getting the MGM job, we were like I said cruising pretty well. But this has absolutely changed the financial fabric of our family tree. I can also pretty much thank you guys, uh, the Gaming Commission in particular, for really putting putting. I consider you guys kind of pioneers, to be honest with you, because we've been in the construction realm for a long time, and I've never seen a site with this amount of diversity inclusion, with this amount of females on it. With um, and and you can pretty much talk to anyone on site that says the same thing. I think you know, honestly, this is a pioneering type of thing that you guys did, and hopefully, um, hopefully you guys have set a precedent that will be carried on throughout this state, continuous on multiple jobs, because I think it's going to really, really even out the playing field for a lot of people and really put a lot of families in a lot of in a completely different and unique uh, situation. So I want to thank you on behalf of my kids to, you know, when I have kids and my grandkids <laughs> and my great camp grandkids, because this has absolutely uh, been incredible. And also, I think you guys had an incredible partner um, with MGM in particular um, with respect to this, because they followed you guys' lead and really, really delivered on so many different angles. I, I can't, can't explain it, you know. And uh, my father is more so old school, so he, he would think that this type of thing would be a smoke and mirror type of scenario where nothing really came to fruition, but it absolutely did here, 150%. So I want to thank you guys for that in particular. Um, also wanted to, uh, to uh, discuss a little bit about um, what we've been able to do. So we've employed dozens and dozens of painters on this job. Obviously, just like Jill said, we did the 11th floor, 95 State Street. We were blessed to do the podium. We also expanded our business model because when we were looking at the podium, we went out outside of just painting. We also sealed the concrete of the 125,000 square feet, which is now something that, that we do uh, permanently, which is, uh, which is a great thing. And we also um, were able to really secure some more work just based off of the fact of getting a job of this magnitude. Um, as I, I've mentioned uh, previously, we did some work down with Encore. So this piggybacked and, and went directly down to Encore, worked with them on the hotel project over there. That was excellent. Um, had, a, you know, had a good experience down there with Encore. We, again, we were able to expand over to the eastern part of the state, which is, if you guys know, uh, you know, Springfield's kind of uh, like the redhead stepchild of the, uh, the state. We kind of, some of the people feel, so I feel like being able to expand over there really helped, helped us in, uh, in leaps and bounds, and now we're able, we're actually still, we're actually doing some contracts with uh, soap painting, which is another painting contractor over in the eastern part of the state as well, which has been absolutely amazing. And then now MGM is actually, we've done now six projects for them even afterwards. So they, not only did they, they do their commitment in front, but even afterwards when they really didn't have to work with us, they came back and worked with us directly. And now we've done multiple of their projects that you guys probably heard about earlier. We're doing the VIP lounge currently, the uh, plaza bar outside, the island bar, the um, sports book when it comes, and in the uh, hotel, they're making some changes in there, changing 24 rooms into 12 suites. So we got all of those projects as well. Uh, hoping for Wahlburgers and then you know some of the other stuff that's upcoming. And I'm firmly and confidently strong that we're going to get those, you know, really because of you know you guys and and what uh, you guys and the leadership that MGM has been able to uh, really really put together here. So I'm absolutely ecstatic. Um, Truly, truly appreciate everything that, that you guys have done for us. Um, just wanted to talk a little bit more about who we've, who we've been able to employ. So obviously we've had dozens and dozens of painters, but because we are from here, Springfield, we, you know, we, I know I went to middle school and you know, I went to school with a lot of people and the families and their kids that are around here. So we're able to engage with them and now put them into the workforce of, uh, of the painting workforce where we were able to, I literally had a conversation with a kid that, he was 24 years old, you know, he was painting with his dad for uh, quite some time, had came to me before we got this job and eagerly was saying, I want to be on the MGM job. And I was like, you're going to have to come on as an apprentice. That's going to involve you working all week. And then on Saturday, going to class about an hour and a half away and then, you know, enjoying your Sunday and coming back and doing the same thing all over again. And, 
you know, I'm happy to say that he, he definitely uh, did do that. And uh, obviously, because he, his hours uh, increased, he was able to move from a 50% to a 55 to a 60% and is continuing to, uh, to work within the, uh, the union model, which is something that a lot of the inner city kids here in, in, in Springfield were completely unfamiliar with that even being a possibility, to be honest with you. So we've been able to walk them through it in the same fashion that MGM really walked us through this type of job. Um, you know, obviously with us doing those, you know, smaller and medium, medium sized job, this job involved a lot more paperwork. MGM was extremely, extremely uh, great with walking us through that process, which I thought was incredible. I really wish uh, that this could be ran, you know, this exactly what happened here could happen across the nation. I think it would make the nation a really better place and uh, definitely has already made uh, Springfield and Western Mass a better pace, just based, just predicated off of what you guys have done. So I guess that's, that'll be it for me for today. So it's been great. We're also able to, I'm sorry, employ um, multiple women, females, which we still are employing, which is also a good thing. I think it's great to, to you know, get it for that one shot deal. But when you, when you have people continuously working for you, it really, really speaks, you know, speaks some volumes, and you're continuing to hold to those same diversity uh, goals that you guys have, just naturally as a business, without having to have an actual mandate or, or, uh, or anything of that that type of goal. So I think it's uh, it's incredible. Looking forward to it, and hoping to continuously build and get more work, and honestly develop and continuously help other companies that that are that were in the situation that we were prior to. I think is really our goal. So I can't wait. Thank you so much, Lamont, and thanks for being patient. Um, do you have any questions, commissioners? Sure. So, so I think you, what you're saying is you were given an opportunity, but you had, to, you had to do the work. You had to do really good work or they wouldn't have hired you back. Yeah, Would you agree with that? It's fair to say. Fair yeah, to say. And, and, and the other point is, so now you're giving opportunities to others. You realize the value, including women, and maybe you wouldn't have realized, you know, until you saw it working, the model working, you looked around and saw people who look like you, who look different than other job sites, right? Yeah, exactly. So yeah. um, I don't, th you just didn't give yourself enough credit, frankly. Oh. You were thanking <laughs> us, but you know what, they, they seriously wouldn't have continued to hire you back if you didn't do really good work. So Thank that's, that's a, a credit a to team. you and your company, and your enthusiasm is, is, uh, Hey, I, I'd like to work for you. You, you. you know, you have that kind of enthusiasm, which is great for people to be around. Thank so I, I thank you for the work you do. I, I appreciate it, truly. Yeah. Well, I'm having my house painted right now, and they're, they're lucky they already have the contract. <laughs> I'd be, be, I'd be meeting thoughts. with you right now. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say something along those lines uh, that Commissioner Cameron is saying. Um, you give us a lot of credit, and a lot of other people deserve the credit, uh, not just uh, you and the work and the, and the, the people that you employ uh, in, in their ability to perform, um, but a lot of people around, um, not just MGM, the city, Jill, perhaps, uh, here especially. Um, there was really this sense of this would be a missed opportunity if... A, a, a casino project that comes, you know, so infrequent uh, to an area like Springfield would be would go without, uh, you know, the promises that they make, especially when it comes to the local and the minority. Uh, it's something perhaps you alluded to uh, very in a very subtle way, but has happened in other, perhaps through through the thinking of your father when you mentioned him, has happened in the past and has been a real missed opportunity um, and a real tragedy, in my opinion. So the story this, uh, that, that, that you tell, I encourage you to continue to telling it to others, um, like the, the ones you mentioned, the kids who may not consider a career in the trades or uh, who may not see because it's a short-term commitment that can be grueling in terms of working and going to school at the same time. Uh, just seeing what could be at the at the end of that uh, road, if you will, uh, I encourage you to do that because uh, you speak to it uh, very well, and there, that that's the paid forward, if you will, uh, that make them absolutely, absolutely. And I uh, I wouldn't be remiss, and if I if I do name uh, my. Uh, my kids are at least middle name Bruce or Jill, or, or <laughs> but um, even during the process, even even now again, like uh, you know, having us come and me, you know, come and speak here is you know great. I I welcome uh, doing this because I feel like the message needs to be delivered. I do the same thing 
in the local barbershop and our, the soul food restaurant my sister mm -hmm. owns pretty much everywhere that I go around here because I think that message uh, is important for people to know and really see. And uh, so I appreciate mm -hmm. that. And now, again, okay. we'll be, I'll be any opportunity, I get the opportunity to really speak on this. I think I'm going to definitely do that. And then ultimately, um, the goal is because the construction trade skill set is dying as a whole. I ultimately want to want to be able to put uh, put together a program where uh, these kids can really understand how they can transition into their trades a little stronger. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll stay tuned. I uh, I am um, talking to uh, some of the some of the assistant superintendent of Springfield Public Schools about a little bit of things as well, just regarding uh, regarding that because there's, you know, we might you know, there's a lot of talent that's retiring, <laughs> and uh, and I think that uh, we need to make sure that the kids understand that you can make an incredible living um, in construction, and also it's a really valuable trade, and you know, also you know, keeping people working with their hands <laughs> as well. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I just want to add, you know, I think Lamont and his company's story is a, a great story within the story of what casino gaming has meant to Massachusetts and, and your your line about, you know, these opportunities changing the financial fabric of your family's future is, you know, a, a message that just will stay with me. Um, but kudos to you because you're also involved in the community with Rotary and everything else. So it's not only running a business, it's being engaged in what going, what's going on in your community, and that's you know uh, a great asset for the city of Springfield to have, and for the region, and for your company to have too. So congrats. Thank well, thank you, thank Lamont. You. You've been very patient. So, if um, I know you have other things to get to, so <laughs> thanks. it's really a, you're you're really demonstrating such great leadership. You know, in addition to the contribution you're making through your trade and to others, but you know, leverage that for I, life. I had amazing parents and, uh, that's and a family uh, that was very supportive. So I think that's important. I think it's important that a lot of these kids have get the opportunity to have that mm -hmm. as well. So I think employing their parents ultimately is uh, is how we'll, uh, we'll, we'll continue to pay it forward. And that's so we'll excellent. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye -bye. Uh, thanks Bye -bye. again. So... To my right is um, Lisa Clausen, and of course you know Crystal Howard, program manager. Um, it, Lisa is with the Carpenters Labor Management Program. I think she has spoken before the commission. Mm -hmm. um, maybe not in a while though. So I'd like to welcome her back. And we're here to update you on an upcoming event that we're putting together, um, a Diversity Summit. And Jill, can you speak right into your microphone? Oh, sorry. Thanks. Um, and I'll just say that um, it, uh, Lisa, in addition to being um, a partner in the planning of this summit, um, w was really the visionary behind the concept, so I have to give her kudos. Uh, but Tuesday, October 8th, 1230 to 330 at Smith College, um, we are focusing on the practical applications and proven strategies to increase diversity in construction. And this summit is really intended to um, focus on the central and western mass regions, um, which are under accessed by especially women, but also certain um, people of color. Um, and we're gonna feature the best practices in construction diversity that um, uh, were evidenced by both of our category one licensees. Um, including we have um, Vice President of uh, Development and Construction for MGM Springfield, um, Brian Packer coming back into town. Um, and we'll also showcase the Build a Life recruitment campaign um, and the strategy that um, the commission launched with our partners NCTE back in uh, 2017. Um, designed to increase women in the building trades. Um, so we really want to ensure that uh, the robust group of new recruits to the trades that came on um, really for the MGM project are kept employed um, in addition to encouraging um, new opportunities and new projects. I'm actually going to turn it over to Lisa to talk a little bit more about the program. All right, sure. Thank you, Jill. And um, 
you know, I just have to say it's, um, I had the concept of doing something coming off of the successful completion of MGM and, and Encore at the time was still finishing up. Um, um, and I just appreciate how quickly the Gaming Commission, uh, Commissioner Stebbins, the staff, kind of embraced the idea of doing something to highlight what was done with the casinos. And it's extremely useful to be modeling it for what other institutions could do and how they could also similarly achieve their construction needs and at the same time create opportunity um, both for MBEs like Lamont's company and also on the workforce side for women and, and people of color in the, in the trades. Um, and it's, um, it's been really terrific, both the Gaming Commission and then the UMass Building Authority has also at the same time been doing strong um, uh, enforcement and encouraging their contractors to um, meet goals that the state has on diversity and construction. Um, and having those two examples and those two models have been, has been what we constantly are touting when we're talking with both municipalities that are considering it as well as private um, institutions. Um, and so coming off of since uh, um, the MGM build, we have been starting to find inroads on both of those fronts in Central and Western Mass. Um, so right before MGM was built, as we knew and were working to recruit more women and people of color in, um, we, got Mass, uh, we got Mount Holyoke College. They were having a construction of a new student center to put uh, goals on that project. And so it enabled us to start training some people who then ended up furthering their career in the casino. But then since then, um, Smith College has um, been doing it with a, a big construction of a new library that they have going on, uh, over a $100 million job that's, that's happening there. Um, in um, Worcester, WPI has just decided to start putting diversity goals on some of their construction projects. So there's a academic building that they have coming up where they're gonna do it for the first time. Um, Holy Cross has told me that they're gonna start, they've been in conversations internally on how to do it and are gonna start looking to apply some diversity goals to their construction projects. Um, the YWCA in Worcester is expanding their um, their facility doing a renovation expansion, and they decided to adopt diversity goals for that project. Um, and then on the public side, um, the city of Springfield has revamped um, kind of the enforcement of diversity requirements they already had on city contracts. I'll talk more about that in a minute, but the city of Worcester also has just announced um, very strong diversity goals for all of their public construction work. And Ed Augustus, the city manager, is gonna come to the event on the 8th and he's gonna be on the panel and speak about that work. Um, and, um, and then in this region, East Hampton is currently has an ordinance where they're considering putting um, a diversity goals um, on their construction work. And, and we've had some good conversations in the town of Amherst as well about doing it. Um, in each place, it's kind of where we can show them this model of how the Gaming Commission has done it and the two casinos did it. Um, has been terrific to then hold up of here's, a, here's different practices, here's different tools on how you can do it, of tracking, of, you know, it takes some effort, um, but it doesn't necessarily have to add much to what, what you're doing already um, in terms of work or, or costs to it. Um, and um, uh, the, this event on the 8th has been a place where as we've been going out and talking about to the WPIs of the world and the Smith Colleges of the world about taking this approach. It's, it's great having this event that we can say, come here and come learn more about it and hear from you know, institutions and state officials who, who have been doing it already. Um, and it gives them some more confidence in, in then taking a look and taking it on and not just that they're hearing from a union about it, but they're, they're hearing from other institutions that have done it. Um, so in the city of Springfield, um, working with Mayor Sarno um, and his um, staff team and working with some city councilors, um, the city did a disparity study um, a little over a year ago, and then the city of Worcester did a similar one as well, where they took a look at, they had um, some uh, researchers at UMass Boston who did analysis of the workforce and, um, and made the argument for how there's... Um, women and people of color are not proportionately in the industry as they could be and are often in uh, 
similar jobs, high physicality, um, where they're earning less money. Um, and so if given the opportunity, you know, would then be, you know, the opportunity and the training could make the switch over. Um, and so based on that study, the city of Springfield has then, we've been working over the past year and have kind of revamped how their enforcement process and we've, they've gone to some AOC meetings of yours and also of the UMass Building Authority the city staff who are gonna be doing the compliance work and some of the city councilors have gone as well um, and have um, adopted more of an AOC model um, on how they're gonna start doing tracking and having the general contractor come in and, and monthly reports on their numbers and are very much kind of taking a page out of the model that, that got developed here um, through your work. Uh, they just, um, in September, we had the first meeting where um, there are some new projects going on right now in the city of Springfield, a big school in particular that's being built in the North End, um, where they're now starting to do that tracking. Um, and, um, and we're really excited for what it will bring. They're, they um, already had diversity uh, requirements on city contracts and um, but again they hadn't really been enforced for a while and their numbers are 30% are uh, local hire Springfield residents of Massachusetts employees that are hired by a company 20% people of color 6.9% uh, women and 5% veterans um, and um, the city of Worcester meanwhile did their own disparity study and that came out with recommendations that their, um, uh, the women um, numbers could be as high as 10% um, with what's currently out there available to easily recruit into the construction market and 38% for people of color. And the city manager, we were kind of counseling maybe going a little more conservative initially, but decided that he wanted to set really high numbers and then figure out a process that can slowly kind of bring companies to, um, to meeting those. Um, so it's, um, Again, it's kind of really set, uh, the work you've done has really set the stage for other places to take it on. Um, and I think given other places the confidence that it can be done, especially when it was done in such big projects, um, that it can be done more easily than on smaller projects. And I'm really excited about the um, October 8th event as an opportunity to kind of showcase that and for you know um, institutions to come and learn more. And so we've heard already from a variety of different some colleges, some universities, some nonprofit developers, some for-profit developers, some hospitals that they've RSVP'd and that they're looking forward to coming and, and learning more in that afternoon. And I would be remiss if I didn't um, ask uh, Commissioner Stebbins if um, you have any more to add since you've been um, really involved in the planning as well. Um, no, thankfully I haven't, which is probably why it's gonna be a success, but, um, <laughs> Lisa has done great work in working with our team, with Jill and Crystal, and I, I, I think back to the MGM project and the diversity requirements in trying to recruit minorities and women into the construction trades and the challenge that they face as opposed to Boston, where it's like, okay, we'll work in this project, we'll jump to another project. There was a big concern in Western Mass as to, after MGM, then what? Um, so, you know, kudos and credit to you to starting to talk to these other institutions to get them thinking about diversity, help them kind of, you know, refill this construction workforce that, you know, as Lamont said, is starting to age out. And how do you give new opportunities that folks that, to folks that may not have considered the construction trade? So, you know, uh, Jill and Crystal have been right at the forefront of this, and it's been great to work with our building trade partners because they're helping to get the message and kind of carry on this legacy. I think the, uh, the gaming bill is created of there are opportunities there and how do we keep it going, you know, yeah. central and western mass. So thank you. Sure. I mean, and I just, again, uh, same though, I really appreciate the staff time that's been given to, to help plan this event. And I know that there's lots of other things going on and it's, you know, uh, not something that, you know, any of us could just drop and organize. And so it's been kind of a variety of hands on deck and that's been very helpful. And I know that that's resources that, that it takes to do that. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. It's great Thank that you. you're uh, encouraging others, and I think the key thing that you said was, um, you know, other places have had diversity goals, but they weren't enforced. That really is critical that, um, you know, 
Jill, from just talking to you and, and Bruce over month by month meetings every month. Where, you know, unless you stay on it, it's not going to happen. Yeah, and I mean, I think it's it's been interesting too. The UMass Building Authority has just goals on theirs. They don't have requirements. You guys through putting it as part of the licensing, um, mm -hmm. you know, some of the points that could be gotten through licensing got the casinos to do it as requirements, which was really great. But even with goals, they've been at UMass uh, Amherst, the projects are all exceeding their goals, and it's through, again, these best practices that, that you guys have put in place, and that contractors are now feeling, okay, if, you know, we should do this, we need to do it to, to get that next job. And what we've been finding is more of our contractors are saying, okay, let me put someone, uh, some more diversity on my core crews. Um, so it's not just for where there's a job that has that requirement, let me fill that quota or that need, but oh, this person was a good contract, a good carpenter, a good electrician, or a good operator, and you know, it's, it's more important in this day and age, and so let me then start reflecting that and continue to employ that person. Um, and that's what we love, getting those calls saying, we're looking for the right fit for our, you know, X type of company, who have you got? And we say, well, we've got lots of people you can consider, let me talk to you about them. Um, so. yeah, that's great. Yeah, great efforts. Great. Thank you. Thank you, And we're looking forward to the forum very much. Thank you. Thank you. And you're all set. Crystal, all set? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So <clears throat> we'll move on to item number nine, commissioner's updates. So I, I think the only update I have is that we, several of us did go to New Jersey earlier in the week to really immerse ourselves in their sports betting operation. Um, I think a lot of lessons learned, a lot of really positive information. Um, if, if at some point we are asked to regulate sports betting, I think that was a good base of information um, to, start, to start with. So um, we'll go from there. And we'll be following up uh, with the uh, feedback that we received. It was very very dense, and so we'll be following up uh, for next steps to make sure we relay what we learned, uh, probably with Justin's lead. So, any other update? Item number 10, nothing reserved that I know of, so do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. moved. I second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 5-0, thank you.